Introduction to Tales of My Landlord, The Black Dwarf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Tom Bragg The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott Introduction to Tales of My Landlord Collected and reported by Jedediah Kleischbottom, Schoolmaster and Parish Clerk of Ganderclou Introduction As I may without vanity presume that the name and official description prefixed to this proem will secure it, from the sedate and reflecting part of mankind to whom only I would be understood to address myself, such attention as is due to the sedulous instructor of youth, and the careful performer of my Sabbath duties, I will forbear to hold up a candle to the daylight, or to point out to the judicious those recommendations of my labours, which they must necessarily anticipate from the perusal of the title page. Nevertheless, I am not aware that, as envy always dogs merit at the heels, there may be those who will whisper that, albeit my learning and good principles cannot, lauded be the heavens, be denied by any one, yet that my situation at Ganderclou hath been more favourable to my acquisitions and learning than to the enlargement of my views of the ways and works of the present generation. To the which objection, if peradventure any such be started, my answer shall be threefold. First, Ganderclou is, as it were, the central part, the naval, Sifa Sitichere, of this our native realm of Scotland, so that men from every corner thereof, when travelling on their concernments of business, either towards our metropolis of law, by which I mean Edinburgh, or towards our metropolis and mart of gain, whereby I insinuate Glasgow, are frequently led to make Ganderclou their abiding stage and place of rest for the night. And it must be acknowledged by the most sceptical that I, who have sat in the leathern armchair, on the left side of the fire, in the common room of the Wallace Inn, winter and summer, for every evening in my life, during forty years by past, the Christian Sabbaths only excepted, must have seen more of the manners and customs of various tribes and people, than if I had sought them out by my own painful travel and bodily labour. Even so doth the tollman, at the well-frequented turnpike, on the well bray head, sitting at his ease in his own dwelling, gather more receipt of custom than if moving forth upon the road, he were to require a contribution from each person whom he chanced to meet in his journey, when, according to the vulgar adage, he might possibly be greeted with more kicks than halfpence. But secondly, supposing it again urged that Ithacus, the most wise of the Greeks, acquired his renown, as the Roman poet hath assured us, by visiting states and men, I reply to the Zoilus, who shall adhere to this objection, that de facto I have seen states and men also, for I have visited the famous cities of Edinburgh and Glasgow, the former twice, and the latter three times, in the course of my earthly pilgrimage. And moreover, I had the honour to sit in the General Assembly, meaning as an auditor, in the galleries thereof. And I have heard as much goodly speaking on the law of patronage as, with the fructification thereof in mine own understanding, hath made me be considered as an oracle upon that doctrine, ever since my safe and happy return to Ganderclou. Again, and thirdly, if it be nevertheless pretended that my information and knowledge of mankind, however extensive and however painfully acquired, by constant domestic inquiry and by foreign travel, is nevertheless incompetent to the task of recording the pleasant narratives of my landlord, I will let these critics know to their own eternal shame and confusion, as well as to the abashment and discomfiture of all who shall rashly take up a song against me, that I am not the writer, redactor, or compiler of the tales of my landlord, nor am I in one single iota answerable for their contents, more or less. And now, ye generation of critics, who raise yourself up as if it were brazen serpents, to hiss with your tongues and to smite with your stings, Bow yourselves to your native dust, and acknowledge that yours have been the thoughts of ignorance, and the words of vain foolishness. Lo, ye are caught in your own snare, and your own pit hath yawned for you. 
turn then aside from the task that is too heavy for you. Destroy not your teeth by gnawing a file. Waste not your strength by spurning against a castle wall. Nor spend your breath in contending in swiftness with a fleet steed. And let those weigh the tales of my landlord, who shall bring with them the scales of candor, cleansed from the rust of prejudice by the hands of intelligent modesty. For these alone they were compiled, as will appear from a brief narrative which my zeal for truth compelled me to make supplementary to the present proem. It is well known that my landlord was a pleasing and facetious man, acceptable unto all the parish of Ganderclou, excepting only the laird, the excise men, and those for whom he refused to draw liquor upon trust. Their causes of dislike I will touch separately, adding my own refutation thereof. His honour the laird accused our landlord, deceased, of having encouraged, in various times and places, the destruction of hares, rabbits, fowls, black and grey, partridges, moorpouts, roe-deer, and other birds and quadrupeds, at unlawful seasons, and contrary to the laws of this realm, which have secured in their wisdom the slaughter of such animals for the great of the earth, whom I have remarked to take an uncommon, though to me, an unintelligible pleasure therein. Now, in humble deference to his honour, and in justifiable defence of my friend, deceased, I reply to this charge, that, howsoever the form of such animals might appear to be similar to those so protected by the law, yet it was a mere deceptio visis, for what resembled hares were, in fact, hill-kids, and those partaking of the appearance of moorfowl were truly wood-pigeons, and consumed and eaten eo nomine, and not otherwise. Again, the excise man pretended that my deceased landlord did encourage that species of manufacture called distillation, without having an especial permission from the great, technically called a license, for doing so. Now I stand up to confront this falsehood, and in defiance of him, his gauging stick and pen and inkhorn, I tell him that I never saw or tasted a glass of unlawful aqua vitae in the house of my landlord, nay, that on the contrary we needed not such devices, in respect of a pleasing and somewhat seductive liquor, which was tended and consumed at the Wallace Inn under the name of Mountain Dew. If there is a penalty against manufacturing such a liquor, let him show me the statute, and when he does, I'll tell him if I will obey it or no. Concerning those who came to my landlord for liquor and went thirsty away, for lack of present coin or future credit, I cannot but say it has grieved my bowels, as if the case had been mine own. Nevertheless, my landlord considered the necessities of a thirsty soul, and would permit them in extreme need, and when their soul was impoverished for lack of moisture, to drink to the full value of their watches and wearing apparel, exclusively of their inferior habiliments, which he was uniformly inexorable in obliging them to retain for the credit of the house. As to mine own part, I may well say that he never refused me the modicum of refreshment with which I am wont to recruit nature after the fatigues of my school. It is true, I taught his five sons English and Latin, writing, bookkeeping, with a tincture of mathematics, and that I instructed his daughter in psalmody, nor do I remember of me any fee or honorarium received from him on account of these my labours, except the computations aforesaid. Nevertheless, this compensation suited my humour well, since it is a hard sentence to bid a dry throat wait till quarter day. But truly, were I to speak my simple conceit and belief, I think my landlord was chiefly moved to waive in my behalf the usual requisition of a symbol or reckoning, from the pleasure he was wont to take in my conversation, which, though solid and edifying in the main, was like a well-built palace, decorated with facetious narratives and devices, tending much to the enhancement and ornament thereof. And so pleased was my landlord of the Wallace in his replies during such colloquies, that there was no district in Scotland, yea, and no peculiar, and as it were a distinctive custom therein practised, but was discussed betwixt us, insomuch that those who stood by were wont to say it was worth a bottle of ale to hear us communicate with each other. And not a few travellers from distant parts 
as well as from the remote districts of our kingdom, were wont to mingle in the conversation, and to tell news that had been gathered in foreign lands, or preserved from oblivion in this our own. Now I chanced to have contracted for teaching the lower classes with a young person called Peter, or Patrick Pattison, who had been educated for our holy kirk, yea, had by the license of presbytery, his voice opened therein as a preacher, who delighted in the collection of olden tales and legends, and in garnishing them with the flowers of poesy, whereof he was a vain and frivolous professor. For he followed not the example of those strong poets, whom I proposed to him as a pattern, but formed a versification of a flimsy and modern texture, to the compounding whereof was necessary small pains and less thought. And hence I have chid him as being one of those who bring forward the fatal revolution prophesied by Mr. Carey and his vaccination on the death of the celebrated Dr. John Dunn. Now thou art gone, and thy strict laws will be too hard for libertines and poetry, till verse by thee refined in this last age turn ballad rhyme. I had also disputations with him touching his indulging rather a flowing and redundant than a concise and stately diction in his prose exercitations. But notwithstanding these symptoms of inferior taste, and a humour of contradicting his betters upon passages of dubious construction in Latin authors, I did grievously lament when Peter Pattison was removed from me by death, even as if he had been the offspring of mine own loins, and in respect his papers had been left in my care to answer funeral and death expenses. I conceive myself entitled to dispose of one parcel thereof, entitled Tales of My Landlord, to one cunning in the trade, as it is called, of bookselling. He was a mirthful man, of small stature, cunning in counterfeiting of voices, and in making facetious tales and responses, and whom I have to laud for the truth of his dealings toward me. Now, therefore, the world may see the injustice that charges me with incapacity to write these narratives, seeing that though I have proved that I could have written them if I would, yet not having done so, the censure will deservedly fall, if at all, upon the memory of Mr. Peter Pattison, whereas I must be justly entitled to the praise, when any is due, seeing that, as the Dean of St. Patrick's wittily and logically expresseth it, that without which a thing is not, is causa sine qua non. The work, therefore, is unto me as a child is to a parent, in which the child, if it proveth worthy, the parent hath honour and praise, but if otherwise, the disgrace will deservedly attach to itself alone. I have only further to intimate that Mr. Peter Pattison, in arranging these tales for the press, hath more consulted his own fancy than the accuracy of the narrative. Nay, that he hath sometimes blended two or three stories together for the mere grace of his plots, of which infidelity, although I disapprove and enter my testimony against it, yet I have not taken upon me to correct the same, in respect it was the will of the deceased, that his manuscript should be submitted to the press without diminution or alteration. A fanciful nicety it was on the part of my deceased friend who, if thinking wisely, ought rather to have conjured me, by all the tender ties of our friendship and common pursuits, to have carefully revised, altered, and augmented, at my judgment and discretion. But the will of the dead must be scrupulously obeyed, even when we weep over their pertinacity and self-delusion. So, gentle reader, I bid you farewell, recommending you to such fare as the mountains of your own country produce, and I will only farther premise that each tale is preceded by a short introduction, mentioning the persons by whom, and the circumstances under which, the materials thereof were collected. Jedediah Kleischbotham End of Introduction to Tales of My Landlord, The Black Dwarf Scott's Introduction to The Black Dwarf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Tom Bragg. Scott's Introduction to The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. 
The ideal being who is here presented as residing in solitude, and haunted by a consciousness of his own deformity, and a suspicion of his being generally subjected to the scorn of his fellow men, is not altogether imaginary. An individual existed many years since, under the author's observation, which suggested such a character. This poor unfortunate man's name was David Ritchie, a native of Tweeddale. He was the son of a labourer in the slate quarries of Stobo, and must have been born in the misshapen form which he exhibited, though he sometimes imputed it to ill usage when in infancy. He was bred a brush-maker at Edinburgh, and had wandered to several places working at his trade, from all which he was chased by the disagreeable attention which his hideous singularity of form and face attracted wherever he came. The author understood him to say he had even been in Dublin. Tired at length of being the object of shouts, laughter, and derision, David Ritchie resolved, like a deer hunted from the herd, to retreat to some wilderness, where he might have the least possible communication with the world which scoffed at him. He settled himself with this view upon a patch of wild moorland, at the bottom of a bank on the farm of Woodhouse, in the sequestered vale of the small river manor in Peeblesshire. The few people who had occasion to pass that way were much surprised and some superstitious persons a little alarmed, to see so strange a figure as Bode Davy, i.e. Crooked David, employed in a task for which he seemed so totally unfit as that of erecting a house. The cottage which he built was extremely small, but the walls, as well as those of a little garden that surrounded it, were constructed with an ambitious degree of solidity, being composed of layers of large stones and turf and some of the corner stones were so weighty as to puzzle the spectators how such a person as the architect could possibly have raised them. In fact, David received from passengers, or those who came attracted by curiosity, a good deal of assistance. And as no one knew how much aid had been given by others, the wonder of each individual remained undiminished. The proprietor of the ground, the late Sir James Naismith, baronet, chanced to pass this singular dwelling, which, having been placed there without right or leave asked or given, formed an exact parallel with Falstaff's simile of a fair house built on another's ground, so that poor David might have lost his edifice by mistaking the property where he had erected it. Of course, the proprietor entertained no idea of exacting such a forfeiture, but readily sanctioned the harmless encroachment. The personal description of Elshender of Mucklestane Moor has been generally allowed to be a tolerably exact and unexaggerated portrait of David of Manor Water. He was not quite three feet and a half high, since he could stand upright in the door of his mansion, which was just that height. The following particulars concerning his figure and temper occur in the Scots Magazine for 1817, and are now understood to have been communicated by the ingenious Mr. Robert Chambers of Edinburgh, who has recorded with much spirit the traditions of the good town, and in other publications, largely and agreeably added to the stock of our popular antiquities. He is the countryman of David Ritchie, and had the best access to collect anecdotes of him. His skull, says this authority, which was of an oblong and rather unusual shape, was said to be of such strength that he could strike it with ease through the panel of a door, or the end of a barrel. His laugh is said to have been quite horrible, and his screech-owl voice, shrill, uncouth, and dissonant, corresponded well with his other peculiarities. There was nothing very uncommon about his dress. He usually wore an old slouched hat when he went abroad, and when at home a sort of cowl or nightcap. He never wore shoes, being unable to adapt them to his misshapen, fin-like feet, but always had both feet and legs quite concealed, and wrapped up with pieces of cloth. He always walked with a sort of pole or pike staff, considerably taller than himself. His habits were, in many respects, singular, and indicated a mind congenial to its uncouth tabernacle. A jealous, misanthropical, and irritable temper was his prominent characteristic. The sense of his deformity haunted him like a phantom. 
and the insults and scorn to which this exposed him had poisoned his heart with fierce and bitter feelings, which from other points in his character do not appear to have been more largely infused into his original temperament than that of his fellow men. He detested children on account of their propensity to insult and persecute him. To strangers, he was generally reserved, crabbed, and surly, and though he by no means refused assistance or charity, he seldom either expressed or exhibited much gratitude. Even towards persons who had been his greatest benefactors, and who possessed the greatest share of his good will, he frequently displayed much caprice and jealousy. A lady who had known him from his infancy, and who has furnished us in the most obliging manner with some particulars respecting him, says that although Davy showed as much respect and attachment to her father's family as it was in his nature to show to any, yet they were always obliged to be very cautious in their deportment towards him. One day, having gone to visit him with another lady, he took them through his garden and was showing them with much pride and good humor all his rich and tastefully assorted borders, when they happened to stop near a plot of cabbages which had been somewhat injured by the caterpillars. Davy, observing one of the ladies smile, instantly assumed his savage, scowling aspect, rushed among the cabbages, and dashed them to pieces with his kent, exclaiming, I hate the worms, for they mock me. Another lady, likewise a friend and old acquaintance of his, very unintentionally gave David mortal offence on a similar occasion. Throwing back his jealous glance as he was ushering her into his garden, he fancied he observed her spit, and exclaimed with great ferocity, Am I a toad, woman, that you spit at me? That you spit at me? And without listening to any answer or excuse, drove her out of his garden with imprecations and insult. When irritated by persons for whom he entertained little respect, his misanthropy displayed itself in words, and sometimes in actions, of still greater rudeness, and he used on such occasions the most unusual and singularly savage imprecations and threats. Scott's Magazine, Volume 80, page 207. Nature maintains a certain balance of good and evil in all her works, and there is no state, perhaps so utterly desolate, which does not possess some source of gratification peculiar to itself. This poor man, whose misanthropy was founded, in a sense, on his own preternatural deformity, had yet his own particular enjoyments. Driven into solitude, he became an admirer of the beauties of nature. His garden, which he sedulously cultivated, and from a piece of wild moorland made a very productive spot, was his pride and his delight, but he was also an admirer of more natural beauty, the soft sweep of the green hill, the bubbling of a clear fountain, or the complexities of a wild thicket, were scenes on which he had often gazed for hours, and as he said, with inexpressible delight. It was perhaps for this reason that he was fond of Shenstone's pastorals and some parts of Paradise Lost. The author has heard his most unmusical voice repeat the celebrated description of Paradise, which he seemed fully to appreciate. His other studies were of a different cast, chiefly polemical. He never went to the parish church, and was therefore suspected of entertaining heterodox opinions though his objection was probably to the concourse of spectators to whom he must have exposed his unseemly deformity. He spoke of a future state with intense feeling, and even with tears. He expressed disgust at the idea of his remains being mixed with the common rubbish, as he called it, of the churchyard, and selected with his usual taste a beautiful and wild spot in the glen, where he had had his hermitage, in which to take his last repose. He changed his mind, however, and was finally interred in the common burial ground of Manor Parish. The author has invested wise Elshie with some qualities 
which made him appear in the eyes of the vulgar a man possessed of supernatural power. Common fame paid David Ritchie a similar compliment, for some of the poor and ignorant, as well as all the children in the neighborhood, held him to be what is called uncanny. He himself did not altogether discourage the idea. It enlarged his very limited circle of power, and in so far gratified his conceit, and it soothed his misanthropy by increasing his means of giving terror or pain. But even in a rude Scottish glen thirty years back, the fear of sorcery was very much out of date. David Ritchie affected to frequent solitary scenes, especially such as were supposed to be haunted, and valued himself upon his courage in doing so. To be sure, he had little chance of meeting anything more ugly than himself. At heart, he was superstitious and planted many rowans, mountain ashes, around his hut as a certain defense against necromancy. For the same reason, doubtless, he desired to have rowan trees set above his grave. We have stated that David Ritchie loved objects of natural beauty. His only living favorites were a dog and a cat to which he was particularly attached, and his bees, which he treated with great care. He took a sister, latterly, to live in a hut adjacent to his own, but he did not permit her to enter it. She was weak in intellect, but not deformed in person. Simple, or rather silly, but not, like her brother, sullen or bizarre. David was never affectionate to her, it was not in his nature, but he endured her. He maintained himself and her by the sale of the product of their garden and beehives, and latterly they had a small allowance from the parish. Indeed, in the simple and patriarchal state in which the country then was, persons in the situation of David and his sister were sure to be supported. They had only to apply to the next gentleman or respectable farmer, and were sure to find them equally ready and willing to supply their very moderate wants. David often received gratuities from strangers, which he never asked, never refused, and never seemed to consider as an obligation. He had a right, indeed, to regard himself as one of nature's paupers, to whom she gave a title to be maintained by his kind, even by that deformity which closed against him all ordinary ways of supporting himself by his own labor. Besides, a bag was suspended in the mill for David Ritchie's benefit, and those who were carrying home a melder of meal seldom failed to add a galpin, a handful, to the alms bag of the deformed cripple. In short, David had no occasion for money save to purchase snuff, his only luxury, in which he indulged himself liberally. When he died in the beginning of the present century, he was found to have hoarded about twenty pounds, a habit very consistent with his disposition, for wealth is power and power was what David Ritchie desired to possess, as a compensation for his exclusion from human society. His sister survived till the publication of the tale to which this brief notice forms the introduction, and the author is sorry to learn that a sort of local sympathy, and the curiosity then expressed concerning the author of Waverley and the subjects of his novels, exposed the poor woman to inquiries which gave her pain. When pressed about her brother's peculiarities, she asked in her turn why they would not permit the dead to rest. To others, who pressed for some account of her parents, she answered in the same tone of feeling. The author saw this poor, and it may be said unhappy man, in autumn 1797, being then, as he has the happiness still to remain, connected by ties of intimate friendship with the family of the venerable Dr. Adam Ferguson, the philosopher and historian, who then resided at the mansion house of Halyards in the Vale of Manor, about a mile from Ritchie's Hermitage. The author was upon a visit at Halyards which lasted for several days, and was made acquainted with this singular anchorite, whom Dr. Ferguson considered as an extraordinary character, and whom he assisted in various ways, particularly by the occasional loan of books. Though the taste of the philosopher and the poor peasant did not, it may be supposed, always correspond, 
I remember David was particularly anxious to see a book which he called, I think, Letters to Elect Ladies, and which he said was the best composition he had ever read, but Dr. Ferguson's library did not supply the volume. Dr. Ferguson considered him as a man of powerful capacity and original ideas, but whose mind was thrown off its just bias by a predominant degree of self-love and self-opinion, galled by the sense of ridicule and contempt, and avenging itself upon society, in idea at least, by a gloomy misanthropy. David Ritchie, besides the utter obscurity of his life while in existence, had been dead for many years, when it occurred to the author that such a character might be made a powerful agent in fictitious narrative. He accordingly sketched that of Elshie of the Mucklestane Moor. The story was intended to be longer, and the catastrophe more artificially brought out, but a friendly critic to whose opinion I subjected the work and its progress was of opinion that the idea of the solitary was of a kind too revolting and more likely to disgust than to interest the reader. As I had good right to consider my adviser as an excellent judge of public opinion, I got off my subject by hastening the story to an end as fast as it was possible, and by huddling into one volume a tale which was designed to occupy two, I have perhaps produced a narrative as much disproportioned and distorted as the black dwarf who is its subject. End of Scott's Introduction to the Black Dwarf Chapter One of The Black Dwarf This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Tom Bragg The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott Chapter One Preliminary Hast any philosophy in thee, Shepherd? As you like it. It was a fine April morning, excepting that it snowed hard the night before, and the ground remained covered with a dazzling mantle of six inches in depth, when two horsemen rode up to the Wallace Inn. The first was a strong, tall, powerful man, in a grey riding coat, having a hat covered with wax cloth, a huge silver-mounted horsewhip, boots, and dreadnought overalls. He was mounted on a large, strong brown mare, rough in coat, but well in condition, with a saddle of the yeomanry cut, and a double-bitted military bridle. The man who accompanied him was apparently his servant. He rode a shaggy little grey pony, had a blue bonnet on his head, and a large check napkin folded about his neck, wore a pair of long blue worsted hose instead of boots, had his gloveless hands much stained with tar, and observed an air of deference and respect towards his companion, but without any of those indications of precedence and punctilio which are preserved between the gentry and their domestics. On the contrary, the two travellers entered the courtyard abreast, and the concluding sentence of the conversation which had been carrying on betwixt them was a joint ejaculation. Lord, guide us on this weather last. What will come of the lambs? The hint was sufficient for my landlord, who, advancing to take the horse of the principal person, and holding him by the reins as he dismounted, while his ostler rendered the same service to the attendant, welcomed the stranger to Ganderclou, and in the same breath inquired, what news from the South Highlands? News, said the farmer, bad enough news, I think, and we carry through the yews, it would be all we can do, we maun e'en leave the lambs to the black dwarf's care. Ay, ay, subjoined the old shepherd, for such he was, shaking his head, he'll be on call busy among the morts this season. The black dwarf, said my learned friend and patron, Mr. Jedediah Clashbotham. And what sort of a personage may he be? Footnote. We have, in this and other instances, printed in italics, 
some few words which the worthy editor, Mr. Jedediah Kleischbotham, seems to have interpolated upon the text of his deceased friend, Mr. Pattison. We must observe, once for all, that such liberties seem only to have been taken by this learned gentleman where his own character and conduct are concerned, and surely he must be the best judge of the style in which his own character and conduct should be treated of. Who's a why, man? answered the farmer. You'll have heard a canny Elshi, the black dwarf, or I'm muckle mistaken. All the world tells tales about him, but it's but daft nonsense after all. I didn't believe a word of it from beginning to end. Your father believed it unco stevely, though, said the old man, to whom the scepticism of his master gave obvious displeasure. Ay, very true, Baldy. But that was in the time of the black faces. They believe a hantel queer things in they days, that nobody heeds since the lang sheep came in. The mare's the pity, the mare's the pity, said the old man. Your father, and say I've often tell ye, master, would have been sair vexed to have seen the old peel house was pulled down to make park dykes, and the bonny broomy no what he likes so well to sit at e'en with his plaid about him, and look at the cry as they come down the loaming. Eel would he have liked it, to have seen that bra sunny no a riven out with the plue in the fashion it is at this day. Hoot, Baldy, replied the principal, take ye that dram the landlord's offering ye, and never fash your head about the changes of the world, so long as you're blithe and bin yourself. What's in your health, sirs? said the shepherd, and having taken off his glass and observed the whisky was the right thing, he continued, It's no for the like o' us to be judging, to be sure. But it was a bonny no, that broomy no, and an unco bra shelter for the lambs on a severe morning like this. Aye, said his patron, but ye ken we mu have turnips for the lang sheep, Billy and muckle hard work to get them, both with the plough and the hoe. And that would sort ill with sitting on the broomy know and cracking about black dwarfs and sicken clavers, as was the gate lang syne when the short sheep were in the fashion. A weel, a weel, master, said the attendant. Short sheep has short rents, I'm thinking. Here my worthy and learned patron again interposed, and observed, that he could never perceive any material difference in point of longitude between one sheep and another. This occasioned a loud, hoarse laugh on the part of the farmer, and an astonished stare on the part of the shepherd. It's the woo, man, it's the woo, and no the beast themselves that makes them be called long or short. I believe if you were to measure their backs, the short sheep would be rather the longer bodied of the twa. But it's the woo that pays the rent in they days, and it had muckle need. Odd, Baldy says very true. Short sheep did make short rents. My father paid for our steading just three score pounds, and it stands me in three hundred plack and bobby, and that's very true. I had no time to be stand here clever and landlord. Get us our breakfast, and see and get the oats fed. I'm for doing the Christy Wilsons, to see if him and me can agree about the look penny I'm to give him for his year olds. We had drank sax much coons to the making of the bargain at St. Boswell's Fair. As some gate we can agree upon the particulars precisely, for as muckle time as we took about it. I doubt we draw to a plea, but hear ye, neighbour, addressing my worthy and learned patron. If you want to hear anything about lang or short sheep, I will be back here to my kale against eight o'clock. Or, if you want any old world stories about the black dwarf and sick like, if you'll wear a half mutchkin upon Baldy there, he'll crack to you like a pen gun. And I's gie you a mutchkin myself, man, if I can sell wheel with Christy Wilson. The farmer returned at the hour appointed, and with him came Christy Wilson. Their difference having been fortunately settled, 
without an appeal to the gentleman of the long robe. My learned and worthy patron failed not to attend, both on account of the refreshment promised to the mind and to the body, although he is known to partake of the latter in a very moderate degree, and the party with which my landlord was associated continued to sit late in the evening, seasoning their liquor with many choice tales and songs. The last incident which I recollect was my learned and worthy patron falling from his chair, just as he concluded a long lecture upon temperance by reciting from the gentle shepherd a couplet which he right happily transferred from the vice of avarice to that of ebriety. He that has just enough may soundly sleep. The o'ercome only fashes folk to keep. In the course of the evening, the black dwarf had not been forgotten, and the old shepherd Baldy told so many stories of him that they excited a good deal of interest. It also appeared, though not till the third punch bowl was emptied, that much of the farmer's skepticism on the subject was affected, as evincing a liberality of thinking and a freedom from ancient prejudices, becoming a man who paid three hundred pounds a year of rent while, in fact, he had a lurking belief in the traditions of his forefathers. After my usual manner, I made farther inquiries of other persons connected with the wild and pastoral district in which the scene of the following narrative is placed, and I was fortunate enough to recover many links of the story not generally known, and which account, at least in some degree, for the circumstances of exaggerated marvel with which superstition has attired it, in the more vulgar traditions. Footnote. The black dwarf, now almost forgotten, was once held a formidable personage by the dalesmen of the border, where he got the blame of whatever mischief befell the sheep or cattle. He was, says Dr. Layden, who makes considerable use of him in the ballad called Count of Kildar, a fairy of the most malignant order, the genuine northern Durger. The best and most authentic account of this dangerous and mysterious being occurs in a tale communicated to the author by that eminent antiquary Richard Surtees, Esquire of Mainsforth, author of the history of the Bishop Rick of Durham. According to this well-attested legend, two young Northumbrians were out on a shooting party and had plunged deep among the mountainous moorlands which border on Cumberland. They stopped for refreshment in a little secluded dell by the side of a rivulet. There, after they had partaken of such food as they brought with them, one of the party fell asleep. The other, unwilling to disturb his friend's repose, stole silently out of the dell with the purpose of looking around him. When he was astonished to find himself close to a being, who seemed not to belong to this world, as he was the most hideous dwarf that the sun had ever shone on. His head was of full human size, forming a frightful contrast with his height, which was considerably under four feet. It was thatched with no other covering than long, matted red hair, like that of the felt of a badger in consistence, and in color a reddish-brown, like the hue of the heather blossom. His limbs seemed of great strength, nor was he otherwise deformed than from their undue proportion and thickness to his diminutive height. The terrified sportsman stood gazing on this horrible apparition until, with an angry countenance, the being demanded by what right he intruded himself on those hills and destroyed their harmless inhabitants. The perplexed stranger endeavored to propitiate the incensed dwarf by offering to surrender his game as he would to an earthly lord of the manor. The proposal only redoubled the offence already taken by the dwarf, who alleged that he was the lord of those mountains, and the protector of the wild creatures who found a retreat in their solitary recesses, and that all spoils derived from their death or misery were abhorrent to him. The hunter humbled himself before the angry goblin, and by protestations of his ignorance, and of his resolution to abstain from such intrusion in future, at last succeeded in pacifying him. The gnome now became more communicative, and spoke of himself as belonging to a species of beings, something between the angelic race and humanity. He added, moreover, which could hardly have been anticipated, 
that he had hopes of sharing in the redemption of the race of Adam. He pressed the sportsman to visit his dwelling, which he said was hard by, and plighted his faith for his safe return. But at this moment the shout of the sportsman's companion was heard calling for his friend, and the dwarf, as if unwilling that more than one person should be cognizant of his presence, disappeared as the young man emerged from the dell to join his comrade. It was the universal opinion of those most experienced in such matters that if the shooter had accompanied the spirit, he would, notwithstanding the dwarf's fair pretenses, have been either torn to pieces or immured for years in the recesses of some fairy hill. Such is the last and most authentic account of the apparition of the black dwarf. End of chapter 1「The Black Dwarf » by Sir Walter Scott « Chapter 2 » Will none but Hearn the Hunter serve your turn? » Merry Wives of Windsor In one of the most remote districts of the south of Scotland, where an ideal line drawn along the tops of lofty and bleak mountains separates that land from her sister kingdom. A young man called Halbert or Hobby Elliot, a substantial farmer, who boasted his descent from old Martin Elliot of the Preakin Tower, noted in border story and song, was on his return from deer stalking. The deer, once so numerous among these solitary wastes, were now reduced to a very few herds, which, sheltering themselves in the most remote and inaccessible recesses, rendered the task of pursuing them equally toilsome and precarious. There were, however, found many youth of the country ardently attached to this sport with all its dangers and fatigues. The sword had been sheathed upon the borders for more than a hundred years by the peaceful union of the crowns in the reign of James I of Great Britain. Still, the country retained traces of what it had been in former days. The inhabitants, their more peaceful avocations having been repeatedly interrupted by the civil wars of the preceding century, were scarce yet broken into the habits of regular industry. Sheep farming had not been introduced upon any considerable scale and the feeding of black cattle was the chief purpose to which the hills and valleys were applied. Near to the farmer's house, the tenant usually contrived to raise such a crop of oats or barley as afforded meal for his family, and the whole of this slovenly and imperfect mode of cultivation left much time upon his own hands and those of his domestics. This was usually employed by the young men in hunting and fishing, and the spirit of adventure which formerly led to raids and forays in the same districts was still to be discovered in the eagerness with which they pursued those rural sports. The more high-spirited among the youth were, about the time that our narrative begins, expecting rather with hope than apprehension an opportunity of emulating their fathers in their military achievements, the recital of which formed the chief part of their amusement within doors. The passing of the Scottish Act of Security had given the alarm of England, as it seemed to point at a separation of the two British kingdoms after the decease of Queen Anne, the reigning sovereign. Godolphin, then at the head of the English administration, foresaw that there was no other mode of avoiding the probable extremity of a civil war but by carrying through and incorporating union. How that treaty was managed and how little it seemed for some time to promise the beneficial results which have since taken place to such extent may be learned from the history of the period. It is enough for our purpose to say that all Scotland was indignant at the terms on which their legislature had surrendered their national independence. The general resentment led to the strangest leagues and to the wildest plans. The Cameronians were about to take arms for the restoration of the House of Stuart, whom they regarded with justice as their oppressors and the intrigues of the period presented the strange picture of papists, prelatists, and presbyterians cabaling among themselves against the English government. 
out of a common feeling that their country had been treated with injustice. The fermentation was universal, and as the population of Scotland had been generally trained to arms, under the act of security, they were not indifferently prepared for war, and waited but the declaration of some of the nobility to break out into open hostility. It was at this period of public confusion that our story now opens. The clue, or wild ravine, into which Hobby Elliot had followed the game, was already far behind him, and he was considerably advanced on his return homeward when the night began to close upon him. This would have been a circumstance of great indifference to the experienced sportsman, who could have walked blindfold over every inch of his native heaths, had it not happened near a spot which, according to the traditions of the country, was in extremely bad fame, as haunted by supernatural appearances. To tales of this kind, Hobby had from his childhood lent an attentive ear, and as no part of the country afforded such a variety of legends, so no man was more deeply read in their fearful lore than Hobby of the Hughfoot, for so our gallant was called, to distinguish him from a round dozen of Elliots who bore the same Christian name. It cost him no efforts, therefore, to call to memory the terrific incidents connected with the extensive waste upon which he was now entering. In fact, they presented themselves with a readiness which he felt to be somewhat dismaying. This dreary common was called Mucklestane Moor, from a huge column of unhewn granite which raised its massy head on a knell near the centre of the heath, perhaps to tell of the mighty dead who slept beneath, or to preserve the memory of some bloody skirmish. The real cause of its existence had, however, passed away, and tradition, which is as frequently an inventor of fiction as a preserver of truth, had supplied its place with a supplementary legend of her own, which now came full upon Hobby's memory. The ground about the pillar was strode, or rather encumbered, with many large fragments of stone, of the same consistence with the column, which, from their appearance as they lay scattered on the waste, were popularly called the Grey Geese of Mucklestane Moor. The legend accounted for this name and appearance by the catastrophe of a noted and most formidable witch who frequented these hills in former days, causing ewes to keb and the kine to cast their calves, and performing all the feats of mischief ascribed to these evil beings. On this moor she used to hold her revels with her sister hags, and rings were still pointed out on which no grass nor heath ever grew the turf being, as it were, calcined by the scorching hooves of their diabolical partners. Once upon a time this old hag is said to have crossed the moor, driving before her a flock of geese, which she proposed to sell to advantage at a neighboring fair. For it is well known that the fiend, however liberal in imparting his powers of doing mischief, ungenerously leaves his allies under the necessity of performing the meanest rustic labors for subsistence. The day was far advanced, and her chance of obtaining a good price depended on her being first at the market. But the geese, which had hitherto preceded her in a pretty orderly manner, when they came to this wide common interspersed with marshes and pools of water, scattered in every direction, to plunge into the element in which they delighted. Incensed at the obstinacy, with which they defied all her efforts to collect them, and not remembering the precise terms of the contract by which the fiend was bound to obey her commands for a certain space, the sorceress exclaimed, Devil, that neither I nor they ever stir from this spot more. The words were hardly uttered when, by a metamorphosis as sudden as any in Ovid, the hag and her refractory flock were converted into stone. The angel, whom she served, being a strict formalist, grasping eagerly at an opportunity of completing the ruin of her body and soul by a literal obedience to her orders. It is said that when she perceived and felt the transformation which was about to take place, she exclaimed to the treacherous fiend, Ah, thou false thief! Lang hast thou promised me a grey gown! and now I am getting in that will last forever. 
the dimensions of the pillar and of the stones, were often appealed to as a proof of the superior stature and size of old women and geese in the days of other years, by those praisers of the past who held the comfortable opinion of the gradual degeneracy of mankind. All particulars of this legend Hobby called to mind as he passed along the moor. He also remembered that since the catastrophe had taken place, the scene of it had been avoided, at least after nightfall, by all human beings, as being the ordinary resort of Kelpies, Spunkies, and other demons, once the companions of the witch's diabolical revels, and now continuing to rendezvous upon the same spot as if still in attendance on their transformed mistress. Well, that's kindly said. We are old neighbours, and we were nae kin. And my good dame's fain to see you. She clavers about your father that was killed lang syne. Hush, hush, Hobby. Not a word about that. It's a story better forgotten. I dinna ken. If it had chanced among our folk, we would a keep it in mind money a day till we got some amends for it. But ye ken your own ways best, ye lairds. I have heard it say that Ellislaw's friend stick at your sire after the laird himself had mastered his sword. Fie, fie, Hobby. It was a foolish brawl, occasioned by wine and politics. Many swords were drawn. It is impossible to say who struck the blow. Mm, at any rate, old Ellislaw was aiding and abetting. And I am sure, if you were so disposed as to make amends on him, nobody could say it was wrong. For your father's blood is beneath his nails, and besides, there is nobody else left that was concerned to take amends upon. And he's a prelatist and a Jacobite into the bargain. I can tell you the country folk look for something atween ye. Oh, for shame, Hobby, replied the young laird. You that profess religion to stir your friend up to break the law and take vengeance at his own hand, and in such a bogley bit, too, where we know not what beings may be listening to us. Hush, hush, said Hobby, drawing nearer to his companion. I was near thinking of the like of them, but I can guess a wee bit what keeps your hand up, Mr. Patrick. We are ken it's no lack of courage, but the twa grain of a bonny lass, Miss Isabel Veer, that keeps you say sober. I assure you, Hobby, said his companion rather angrily, I assure you, you are mistaken, and it is extremely wrong of you either to think of or to utter such an idea. I have no idea of permitting freedoms to be carried so far as to connect my name with that of any young lady. Why, there now, there now, retorted Elliot. Did I not say it was nae want a spunk that made you so mim? Well, well. I admit nae offence, but there's just a thing ye may notice for a friend. The old laird of Ellislaw has the old riding blood far hetter at his heart than ye ha. Troth, he kens nothing about the new-fangled notions of peace and quietness. He's all for the old world doings of lifting and laying on, and he has a wheen stout lads at his back, too, and keeps them well up in heart, and is full of mischief as young colts, but he gets the gear to do it, none can say. He lives high and far aboon his rents here. However, he pays his way. Say, if there is any outbreak in the country, he's like to break out with the first. And we'll does he mind the old quarrels between ye. I'm surmising he'll be for a touch at the old tower at Earnscliff. Well, Hobby, answered the young gentleman, if he should be so ill-advised, I shall try to make the old tower good against him, as it has been made good by my betters against his betters many a day ago. Very right, very right. That's speaking like a man now, said the stout yeoman. And if so should be that this be so, if you'll just gar your servant jow out the great bell in the tower, there's me and my twa brothers, and little Davy of the Stenhouse will be with you with all the power we can make in the snapping of a flint. Many thanks, Hobby, answered Earnscliff. 
but I hope we shall have no war of so unnatural and unchristian a kind in our time. Hoot, sir, hoot, replied Elliot. It would be but a wee bit neighbor war, and heaven and earth would make allowances for it in this uncultivated place. It's just the nature of folk in the land. We cannot live quiet like loodin' folk. We hanna say muckle to do. It's impossible. Well, Hobby, said the laird, for one who believes so deeply as you do in supernatural appearances, I must own you take heaven in your own hand rather audaciously, considering where we are walking. What needs I care for the Mucklestain Moor? Any mair than you do yourself, Ernscliff, said Hobby, something offended. To be sure, they do say there's a sort of worry cows and lang nibbit things about the land. But what need I care for them? I have good conscience, and little to answer for. Unless it be about a rant among the lasses or a splure at the fair. And that's no muckle to speak of. Though I say it myself, I'm as quiet a lad, and as peaceable, and Dick Turnbull's head that you broke, and Willie of Winton, whom you shot at, said his travelling companion. Ah, hoot, Arnscliff, you keep a record of all men's misdoings. Dick's head healed again, and we're to fight out the quarrel at Gerrit on the rude day, so that's like a thing settled in a peaceable way. And then I am friends with Willie again, poor child. It was but twa or three heel drops after all. I would let anybody do the like at me for a pint of brandy. But Willie's low bred, poor fellow, and soon frighted for himself, and for the worry cows, where are we to meet ain on this very bit? As is not unlikely, said young Earnscliff, for there stands your old witch, Hobby. I say, continued Elliot, as if indignant at this hint, I say, if the old Caroline herself was to get up out of the groon just before us here, I would think nay more. But good preserve us, Earnscliff, what can yon be? End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of The Black Dwarf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Tom Bragg. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 3. Brown dwarf that o'er the moorland strays, thy name to Kildar tell. The brown man of the moor that stays beneath the heather bell. John Layden. The object which alarmed the young farmer in the middle of his valorous protestations startled for a moment even his less prejudiced companion. The moon, which had arisen during the conversation, was in the phrase of that country waiting or struggling with clouds, and shed only a doubtful and occasional light. By one of her beams, which streamed upon the great granite column to which they now approached, they discovered a form, apparently human, but of a size much less than ordinary, which moved slowly among the large grey stones, not like a person intending to journey onward, but with the slow, irregular, flitting movement of a being who hovers around some spot of melancholy recollection, uttering also from time to time a sort of indistinct muttering sound. This so much resembled his idea of the motions of an apparition, that Hobby Elliot, making a dead pause while his hair erected itself upon his scalp, whispered to his companion, It's old Ailey herself. Shall I gear her a shot in the name of God? For heaven's sake, no, said his companion, holding down the weapon which he was about to raise to the aim. For heaven's sake, no, it's some poor distracted creature. You're distracted yourself for thinking of going so near to her? said Elliot, holding his companion in his turn, as he prepared to advance. Will I have time to pit o'er a bit of prayer, and I could but mind one? Afore she comes this length, God, she's in nae hurry, continued he, growing bolder from his companion's confidence, and the little notice the apparition seemed to take of them, 
she herbles like a hen on a hat girdle a red ye earnscliff this he added in a gentle whisper let us take a cast about as if to draw the wind on a book the bog is no aboon knee deep and better a saft road as bad company footnote the scots use the epithet soft in malum partem in two cases at least a soft road is a road through quagmire and bogs and soft weather signifies that which is very rainy Earnscliff, however in spite of his companion's resistance and remonstrances continued to advance on the path they had originally pursued and soon confronted the object of their investigation the height of the figure which appeared even to decrease as they approached it seemed to be under four feet and its form as far as the imperfect light afforded them the means of discerning was very nearly as broad as long or rather of a spherical shape which could only be occasioned by some strange personal deformity the young sportsman hailed this extraordinary appearance twice without receiving any answer or attending to the pinches by which his companion endeavoured to intimate that their best course was to walk on without giving farther disturbance to a being of such singular and preternatural exterior to the third repeated demand of who are you what do you do here at this hour of night a voice replied whose shrill uncouth and dissonant tones made elliot step two paces back and startled even his companion pass not on your way and ask not at them that ask not at you what do you do here so far from shelter are you benighted on your journey will you follow us home god forbid ejaculated hobby elliot involuntarily and i will give you a lodging i would sooner lodge by myself in the deepest of the terrace flow again whispered hobby pass on your way rejoined the figure the harsh tones of his voice still more exalted by passion i want not your guidance i want not your lodging it is five years since my head was under human roof and i trust it was for the last time he is mad said earnscliff he has a look of old humphrey ethercap the tinkler that perished in this very moss about five years syne answered his superstitious companion but humphrey was not that awful big in the book pass on your way reiterated the object of their curiosity the breath of your human bodies poisons the air around me the sound of poor human voices goes through my ears like sharp bodkins lord save us whispered hobby that the dead should bear see fearful ill will to the living his soul mon be in the poor way i'm jealous come my friend said earnscliff you seem to suffer from some strong affliction common humanity will not allow us to leave you here common humanity exclaimed the being with a scornful laugh that sounded like a shriek where got ye that catchword that noose for woodcocks that common disguise for man traps that bait which the wretched idiot who swallows will soon find covers a hook with barbs ten times sharper than those you lay for the animals which you murder for your luxury i tell you my friend again replied earnscliff you are incapable of judging of your own situation you will perish in this wilderness and we must in compassion force you along with us i'll hand neither hand nor foot in it said hobby let the ghost take his ain away for god's sake my blood be on my own head if i perish here said the figure and observing earnscliff meditating to lay hold on him he added and your blood be upon yours if you touch but the skirt of my garments to infect me with the taint of mortality the moon shone more brightly as he spoke thus and earnscliff observed that he held out his right hand armed with some weapon of offence which glittered in the cold ray like the blade of a long knife or the barrel of a pistol it would have been madness to persevere in his attempt upon a being thus armed and holding such desperate language 
especially as it was plain he would have little aid from his companion, who had fairly left him to settle matters with the apparition as he could, and had proceeded a few paces on his way homeward. Earnscliff, however, turned and followed Hobby, after looking back towards the supposed maniac, who, as if raised to frenzy by the interview, roamed wildly around the great stone, exhausting his voice in shrieks and imprecations that thrilled wildly along the waste heath. The two sportsmen moved on some time in silence until they were out of hearing of these uncouth sounds, which was not ere they had gained a considerable distance from the pillar that gave name to the moor. Each made his private comments on the scene they had witnessed, until Hobby Elliot suddenly exclaimed, "'Weel, I'll uphold that yon ghaist, if it be a ghaist, has baith done and suffered muckle evil in the flesh that gars him rampage in that way after he's dead and gain. It seems to me the very madness of misanthropy, said Earnscliff, following his own current of thought. And ye didna think it was a spiritual creature, then? asked Hobby at his companion. Who, I? No, surely. Well, I am partly of a mind myself that it may be a live thing, and yet a dinner can. I wouldna wish to see anything look like a bogle. At any rate, said Earnscliff, I will ride over to-morrow and see what has become of the unhappy being. In fair daylight, queried the yeoman, then grace a god, eyes be wiggy, but here we are, nearer to Hugh Foot than to your own house by twa mile. Hadna ye better e'en ge home with me, and we'll send the callant on the pony to tell them that you're wi' us, though I believe there's nobody at home to wait for you but the servants and the cat. Have with you, then, friend Hobby, said the young hunter, and as I would not willingly have either the servants be anxious or Puss forfeit her supper in my absence, I'll be obliged to you to send the boy as you propose. Oh, ye'll, that is kind, I must say, and you'll gae home to Hewfoot. They'll be right blithe to see you, that will they. This affair settled, they walked briskly on a little farther, when, coming to the ridge of a pretty steep hill, Hobby Elliot exclaimed, Now, Ernscliff, I am aye glad when I come to this very bit. You see the light below, that's in the ha meadow, where Granny, the gash old carline, is sitting burling at her wheel. And you see yon other light, that's gone hidden back and forth it through among the windows. That's my cousin Grace Armstrong. She's twice as clever about the house as my sisters, and say they say themselves, for their good-natured lasses as ever trod on heather. But they confess themselves and say there's Granny, that she has far maced action, and is the best goer about the town, now that Granny is off the foot herself. My brothers, ain't of them's away to wait upon the Chamberlain, and ain't at Moss for Drag. That's our lead farm. He can see after the stock just as well as I can do. You are lucky, my good friend, in having so many valuable relations. Troth am I. Grace makes me thankful, as never deny it. But will you tell me now, Erncliffe, you that have been at college, and the high school of Edinburgh, and got a sort of lair where it was the best to be gotten? Will you tell me, no, that it's only concern of mine in particular, but I heard the priest of St. John's and our minister bargaining about it at the winter fair, and troth they both spack very weel. Now the priest says it's unlawful to marry his cousin, but I cannot say I thought he brought out the gospel authorities half so well as our minister. Our minister is thought the best divine, and the best preacher atween this and Edinburgh. Didn't you think he was likely to be right? Certainly marriage by all Protestant Christians is held to be as free as God made it by the Levitical law. So, Hobby, there can be no bar, legal or religious, betwixt you and Miss Armstrong. With the way we are joking, Earnscliff, replied his companion. You are angry enough yourself if ain't touches you a bit, man, on the sooth side of the jest. Know that I was asking the question about Grace. For you mun ken she's no my cousin Dermain out and out, but the daughter of my uncle's wife by her first marriage. 
so she's nae kith nor kin to me, only a connection like. But now we're at the Sheeling Hill. I'll fire off my gun to let them ken I'm coming. That's I my way. And if I hae a deer, I give them twa shots, ain for the deer and ain for myself. He fired off his piece accordingly, and the number of lights were seen to traverse the house and even to gleam before it. Abby Elliot pointed out one of these to Earnscliff, which seemed to glide from the house towards some of the outhouses. That's Grace herself, said Hobby. She'll no meet me at the door, I was warn her, but she'll be away for all that, to see if my hound's supper be ready, poor beasts. Love me, love my dog, answered Earnscliff. Ah, Hobby, you are a lucky young fellow. This observation was uttered with something like a sigh, which apparently did not escape the ear of his companion. Hoot! Other folk may be as lucky as I am. Oh, how I have seen Miss Isabel Vere's head turn after somebody when they passed in another at the Carlisle races. Who oh, kens, but things may come around in this world. Earnscliff muttered something like an answer, but whether in assent of the proposition, or rebuking the application of it, could not easily be discovered, and it seems probable that the speaker himself was willing his meaning should rest in doubt and obscurity. They had now descended the broad loaning, which, winding down the foot of the steep bank or hue, brought them in front of the thatched but comfortable farmhouse, which was the dwelling of Hobby Elliot and his family. The doorway was thronged with joyful faces, but the appearance of a stranger blunted many a jibe, which had been prepared on Hobby's lack of success in the deer-stalking. There was a little bustle among three handsome young women, each endeavouring to devolve upon another the task of ushering the stranger into the apartment, while probably all were anxious to escape for the purpose of making some little personal arrangements before presenting themselves to a young gentleman in a dishabille only intended for their brother. Hobby, in the meantime, bestowing some hearty and general abuse upon them all, for Grace was not of the party, snatched the candle from the hand of one of the rustic coquettes, as she stood playing pretty with it in her hand, and ushered his guest into the family parlour, or rather hall, for the place having been a house of defence in former times, the sitting apartment was a vaulted and paved room, damp and dismal enough compared with the lodgings of the yeomanry of our days, but which, when well lighted up with a large sparkling fire of turf and bogwood, seemed to Earnscliff a most comfortable exchange for the darkness and bleak blast of the hill. Kindly and repeatedly was he welcomed by the venerable old dame, the mistress of the family, who, dressed in her coif and pinners, her close and decent gown of homespun wool, but with a large gold necklace and earrings, looked what she really was, the lady as well as the farmer's wife, while seated in her chair of wicker, by the corner of the great chimney, she directed the evening occupations of the young women, and of two or three stout serving wenches, who sat plying their distaffs behind the backs of their young mistresses. As soon as Earnscliff had been duly welcomed, and hasty orders issued for some addition to the evening meal, his grand dame and sisters opened their battery upon Hobby Elliot, for his lack of success against the deer. "'Jenny need not have kept up her kitchen fire for all that Hobby has brought home,' said one sister. "'Troth no, lass,' said another. "'The gathering peat, if it was well blown, would dress all our Hobby's venison.' Footnote. The gathering peat is the piece of turf left to treasure up the secret seeds of fire without any generous consumption of fuel, in a word, to keep the fire alive. Ay, or the low of the candle, if the wind would let it hide steady, said a third. If I were him, I would bring him a black craw rather than come back three times without a book's horn to blow on. Hobby turned from the one to the other, regarding them alternately with a frown on his brow, the augury of which was confuted by the good-humoured laugh on the lower part of his countenance. He then strove to propitiate them by mentioning the intended present of his companion. "'In my young days,' said the old lady, "'a man would have been ashamed to come back for the hill "'without a buck hanging on each side of his horse "'like a cadger carrying calves.' "'I wish they had left some for us then, Granny,' retorted Hobby. "'They've cleared the country of them. "'The old friends of yours, I'm thinking.' 
we see other folk can find game, though you cannot, Hobby, said the eldest sister, glancing a look at young Earnscliff. Weel, weel, woman, hasna every dog his day, begging Earnscliff's pardon for the old saying. May na I ha his luck, and he mine another time. It's a braw thing for a man to be out all day and frighted. Na, I wouldn't say that neither, but mistrusted with bogles on the homecoming. And then, to have to flight with a wheen woman that had been doing nothing all the live lang day but whirling the bit stick, with a thread trailing at it, or boring at a clout. Frighted with bogles, exclaimed the females one and all, for great was the regard then paid, and perhaps still paid, in these glens, to all such fantasies. I did not say frighted now. I only said misset with the thing. And there was but a bogle neither. Earnscliff, he saw it as well as I did. And he proceeded, without very much exaggeration, to detail in his own way the meeting they had with the mysterious being at Mucklestane Moor. Concluding, he could not conjecture what on earth it could be, unless it was either the enemy himself, or some of the old pates that held the country lang syne. Old pate! exclaimed the grand dame. Na, na, bless thee for a scathe, my bairn. It's been nae paid to that. It's been the brown man of the moors, a weary for they evil days. What can evil beings be coming for to distract a poor country now it's peacefully settled and living in love and law? Oh, weary on him. He ne'er brought good to these lands or the indwellers. My father often told me he was seen in the year of the bloody fight at Marston Moor, and then again in Montrose's troubles, and again before the rout of Dunbar, and in my own time. He was seen about the time of Bothwell Brigg, and they said the second-sighted Laird of Bennerbuck had the communion with him some time before Argyle's landing, but that I cannot speak to so precisely. It was far in the west. Oh, Burns, he's never permitted, but in an ill time. Say mind, Ilkaenia, to draw to him that can help in the day of trouble. Earnscliff now interposed, and expressed his firm conviction that the person they had seen was some poor maniac, and had no commission from the invisible world to announce either war or evil, but his opinion found a very cold audience and all joined to deprecate his purpose of returning to the spot the next day. "'Oh, my bonny bairn,' said the old dame, for in the kindness of her heart she extended her parental style to all in whom she was interested. "'You should be well mair than other folk. There has been a heavy breach made in your house with your father's bloodshed, and with law pleas and losses since thine.' and you are the flower of the flock, and the lad that will build up the old bigging again if it be his will, to be an honour to the country, and a safeguard to those that dwell in it. You, before others, are called upon to put yourself no rash adventures, for yours was I o'er venturesome a race, and muckle harm they have got by it. But I am sure my good friend, you would not have me be afraid of going to an open moor in broad daylight. I dinna ken, said the good old dame. I would never bid son or friend of mine hold their hand back in a good cause, whether it were friends or their ain, that should be by nay bidden of mine, or of anybody that's come of a gentle kindred. But it win a gang out of a grey head like mine that to gang to seek for evil that's no fashion with you is clean against law and scripture. Earnscliff resigned an argument which he saw no prospect of maintaining with good effect, and the entrance of supper broke off the conversation. Miss Grace had by this time made her appearance, and Hobby, not without a conscious glance at Earnscliff, placed himself by her side. Mirth and lively conversation, in which the old lady of the house took the good-humoured share which so well becomes old age, 
restored to the cheeks of the damsels the roses which their brother's tale of the apparition had chased away, and they danced and sung for an hour after supper, as if there were no such things as goblins in the world. End of chapter 3「Four of the Black Dwarf " This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Tom Bragg. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott, Chapter Four. I am misanthropos and hate mankind. For thy part, I do wish thou wert a dog, that I might love thee something. Timon of Athens. On the following morning after breakfast, Earnscliff took leave of his hospitable friends, promising to return in time to partake of the venison which had arrived from his house. Hobbie, who apparently took leave of him at the door of his habitation, slunk out, however, and joined him at the top of the hill. "'Ye'll be gone yonder, Mr. Patrick. Fiend me will mistrust you for all, my mother says.' I thought it best to slip out quietly, though, in case she should miss slipping something of what we're going to do. We munna vex her at nay rate. It was amos the last word my father said to me on his deathbed. By no means, Hobby, said Earnscliff. She well merits all of your attention. Troth, for that matter, she would be as sair vexed almost for you as for me. But do you really think that there is no presumption in venturing back yonder. We had no special commission, ye can. If I thought as you do, Hobby, said the young gentleman, I would not perhaps inquire farther into this business. But, as I am of opinion that preternatural visitations are either ceased altogether or become very rare in our days, I am unwilling to leave a matter uninvestigated which may concern the life of a poor distracted being. A wheel, a wheel, if you really think that, answered Harvey doubtfully. And it's for certain the very fairies, I mean the very good neighbours themselves, for they say folks shouldn't call them fairies, that used to be seen on every green knoll at Ean, are in the half say often visible in our days. I cannot depend to having ever seen any myself, but I ain't heard on whistle a hint me in the moss. It's like a hope, as anything that could be like another. And money ain't my father saw when he used to come home for the fairs at Ean, with a drap drink in his head, honest man. Earnscliff was somewhat entertained with the gradual declension of superstition from one generation to another, which was inferred in this last observation, and they continued to reason on such subjects until they came in sight of the upright stone which gave name to the moor. "'As I shall answer,' says Hobby, "'yonder is the creature, creeping about yet. "'But it's daylight, and you have your gun. "'And I brought out my bit-winger. "'I think we may venture on him.' "'By all manner of means,' said Earnscliff, "'but in the name of wonder, what can he be doing there?' "'Bigging a dry-stained dyke, I think, with the grey geese.' as they call their great loose stains. Odd, that past is all thing I ever heard tell of. As they approached nearer, Earnscliff could not help agreeing with his companion. The figure they had seen the night before seemed, slowly and toilsomely, laboring to pile the large stones one upon another, as if to form a small enclosure. Materials lay around him in great plenty, but the labor of carrying on the work was immense from the size of most of the stones, and it seemed astonishing that he should have succeeded in moving several which he had already arranged for the foundation of his edifice. He was struggling to move a fragment of great size when the two young men came up, and was so intent upon executing his purpose that he did not perceive them till they were close upon him. In straining and heaving at the stone, in order to place it according to his wish, he displayed a degree of strength which seemed utterly inconsistent with his size and apparent deformity. 
Indeed, to judge from the difficulties he had already surmounted, he must have been of Herculean powers. For some of the stones he had succeeded in raising apparently required two men's strength to have moved them. Abi's suspicions began to revive on seeing the preternatural strength he exerted. I am amazed persuaded it's the ghost of a stain mason. See sick and ban stains as he's laid in. And it be a man after all. I wonder what he would take by the road to build a march dyke. There's ain sair wanted between Kringlehope and the Shaws. Honest man, raising his voice, you make good firm work there. The being whom he addressed raised his eyes with a ghastly stare, and, getting up from his stooping posture, stood before them in all his native and hideous deformity. His head was of uncommon size, covered with a fell of shaggy hair, partly grizzled with age. His eyebrows, shaggy and prominent, overhung a pair of small, dark, piercing eyes set far back in their sockets, that rolled with a portentous wildness indicative of a partial insanity. The rest of his features were of the coarse, rough-hewn stamp, with which a painter would equip a giant in romance, to which was added the wild, irregular, and peculiar expression so often seen in the countenance of those whose persons are deformed. His body, thick and square, like that of a man of middle size, was mounted upon two large feet, but nature seemed to have forgotten the legs and the thighs or they were so very short as to be hidden by the dress which he wore. His arms were long and brawny, furnished with two muscular hands, and where uncovered in the eagerness of his labor, were shagged with coarse black hair. It seemed as if nature had originally intended the separate parts of his body to be members of a giant, but had afterwards capriciously assigned them to the person of a dwarf, so ill did the length of his arms and the iron strength of his frame correspond with the shortness of his stature. His clothing was a sort of coarse brown tunic, like a monk's frock, girt round him with a belt of seal skin. On his head he had a cap made of badger's skin or some other rough fur, which added considerably to the grotesque effect of his whole appearance and overshadowed features, whose habitual expression seemed that of sullen, malignant misanthropy. This remarkable dwarf gazed on the two youths in silence with a dogged and irritated look, until Ernscliff, willing to soothe him into better temper, observed, You are hard tasked, my friend. Allow us to assist you. Elliot and he accordingly placed the stone by their joint efforts upon the rising wall. The dwarf watched them with the eye of a taskmaster, and testified by peevish gestures his impatience at the time which they took in adjusting the stone. He pointed to another, they raised it also, to a third, to a fourth. They continued to humour him, though with some trouble, for he assigned them, as if intentionally, the heaviest fragments which lay near. "'And now, friend,' said Elliot, as the unreasonable dwarf indicated another stone, larger than any they had moved. Ernscliff may do as he likes, but be ye man or be ye war, tail be in my fingers if I break my back with heaven they stains any longer, like a better man, without getting say muckle as thanks for my pains. Thanks? exclaimed the dwarf with a motion expressive of the utmost contempt. There, take them and fatten upon them. Take them and may they thrive with you as they have done with me, as they have done with every mortal worm that ever heard the word spoken by his fellow reptile. Hence, either labor or be gone. This is a fine reward we have, Erinscliff, for building a tabernacle for the devil, and prejudicing our ain souls into the bargain for what we can. Our presence, answered Ernscliff, seems only to irritate his frenzy. We had better leave him and send someone to provide him with food and necessaries. They did so. The servant dispatched for this purpose found the dwarf still laboring at his wall, but could not extract a word from him. The lad, infected with the superstitions of the country, did not long persist in an attempt to intrude questions or advice on so singular a figure 
but having placed the articles which he had brought for his use on a stone at some distance, he left them at the misanthrope's disposal. The dwarf proceeded in his labours day after day, with an assiduity so incredible as to almost appear supernatural, and one day he often seemed to have done the work of two men, and his building soon assumed the appearance of the walls of a hut which, though very small, and constructed only of stones and turf without any mortar, exhibited from the unusual size of the stones employed an appearance of solidity very uncommon for a cottage of such narrow dimensions and rude construction. Ernscliff, attentive to his motions, no sooner perceived to what they tended than he sent down a number of spars of wood suitable for forming the roof, which he caused to be left in the neighborhood of the spot, resolving next day to send workmen to put them up. But his purpose was anticipated, for in the evening, during the night, and early in the morning, the dwarf had labored so hard and with such ingenuity that he had nearly completed the adjustment of the rafters. His next labor was to cut rushes and thatches dwelling, a task which he performed with singular dexterity. As he seemed averse to receive any aid beyond the occasional assistance of a passenger, materials suitable to his purpose and tools were supplied to him, in the use of which he proved to be skillful. He constructed the door and window of his cot, he adjusted a rude bedstead and a few shelves, and appeared to become somewhat soothed in his temper as his accommodations increased. His next task was to form a strong enclosure, and to cultivate the land within it to the best of his power, until by transporting mold and working up what was upon the spot, he formed a patch of garden ground. It must be naturally supposed that, as above hinted, this solitary being received assistance occasionally from such travellers as crossed the moor by chance, as well as from several who went from curiosity to visit his works. It was indeed impossible to see a human creature so unfitted at first sight for hard labour, toiling with such unremitting assiduity, without stopping a few minutes to aid him in his task, and as no one of his occasional assistants was acquainted with the degree of help which the dwarf had received from others, the celerity of his progress lost none of its marvels in their eyes. The strong and compact appearance of the cottage formed in so very a short space and by such a being, and the superior skill which he displayed in mechanics and in other arts, gave suspicion to the surrounding neighbors. They insisted that if he was not a phantom, an opinion which was now abandoned, since he plainly appeared a being of blood and bone with themselves, yet he must be in close league with the invisible world, and have chosen that sequestered spot to carry on his communication with them, undisturbed. They insisted, though in a different sense from the philosopher's application of the phrase, that he was never less alone than when alone, and that from the heights which commanded the moor at a distance, passengers often discovered a person at work along with this dweller of the desert, who regularly disappeared as soon as they approached closer to the cottage. Such a figure was also occasionally seen sitting beside him at the door, walking with him in the moor, or assisting him in fetching water from his fountain. Ernstcliff explained this phenomenon by supposing it to be the dwarf's shadow. Deal a shadow has he, replied Hobby Elliot, who was a strenuous defender of the general opinion. He's o'er far in with the old aim to have a shadow. Besides, he argued more logically, why have a heard of a shadow that came between a body and the sun? And this thing, be it what it will, is thinner and taller than the body himself, and has been seen to come between him and the sun mere than answer twice either. These suspicions, which in any other part of the country might have been attended with investigations a little inconvenient to the supposed wizard, were here only productive of respect and awe. The recluse being seemed somewhat gratified by the marks of timid veneration, with which an occasional passenger approached his dwelling. The look of startled surprise with which he surveyed his person and his premises, and the hurried step with which he pressed his retreat as he passed the awful spot. The boldest only stopped to gratify their curiosity by a hasty glance at the walls of his cottage and garden, and to apologize for it by a courteous salutation, which the inmates sometimes deigned to return by a word or a nod. 
Earnscliff often passed that way, and seldom without inquiring after the solitary inmate, who seemed now to have arranged his establishment for life. It was impossible to engage him in any conversation on his own personal affairs, nor was he communicative or accessible in talking on any other subject whatsoever, although he seemed to have considerably relented in the extreme ferocity of his misanthropy, or rather to be less frequently visited with the fits of derangement of which this was a symptom. No argument could prevail upon him to accept anything beyond the simplest necessaries, although much more was offered by Earnscliffe out of charity and by his more superstitious neighbors from other motives. The benefits of these last he repaid by advice when consulted, as at length he slowly was, on their diseases or those of their cattle. He often furnished them with medicines also, and seemed possessed not only of such as were the produce of the country, but of foreign drugs. He gave these persons to understand that his name was Elshender the Recluse, but his popular epithet soon came to be Canny Elshie, or the Wise White of Mucklestane Moor. Some extended their queries beyond their bodily complaints and requested advice upon other matters, which he delivered with an oracular shrewdness that greatly confirmed the opinion of his possessing preternatural skill. The querists usually left some offering upon a stone at a distance from his dwelling. If it was money or any article which did not suit him to accept, he either threw it away or suffered it to remain where it was without making use of it. On all occasions his manners were rude and unsocial, and his words and number just sufficient to express his meaning as briefly as possible, and he shunned all communication that went a syllable beyond the matter in hand. When winter had passed away and his garden began to afford him herbs and vegetables, he confined himself almost entirely to those articles of food. He accepted, notwithstanding, a pair of she-goats from Earnscliffe, which fed on the moor and supplied him with milk. When Earnscliffe found his gift had been received, he soon afterwards paid the hermit a visit. The old man was seated on a broad, flat stone near his garden door, which was the seat of science he usually occupied when disposed to receive his patients or clients. The inside of his hut and that of his garden he kept as sacred from human intrusion as the natives of Otaheite do their morai. Apparently he would have deemed it polluted by the step of any human being. When he shut himself up in his habitation, no entreaty could prevail upon him to make himself visible or to give audience to any one whomsoever. Earnscliff had been fishing in a small river at some distance. He had his rod in his hand and his basket, filled with trout, at his shoulder. He sat down upon a stone nearly opposite to the dwarf, who, familiarized with his presence, took no farther notice of him than by elevating his huge misshapen head for the purpose of staring at him, and then, again, sinking it upon his bosom, as if in profound meditation. Earnscliff looked around him and observed that the hermit had increased his accommodations by the construction of a shed for the reception of his goats. "'You labor hard, Elshie,' he said, willing to lead this singular being into conversation. "'Labor,' re-echoed the dwarf, "'is the mildest evil of a lot so miserable as that of mankind.' Better to labor like me than sport like you. I cannot defend the humanity of our ordinary rural sports, Elshie, and yet— And yet, interrupted the dwarf, they are better than your ordinary business. Better to exercise idle and wanton cruelty on mute fishes than on your fellow creatures. Yet why should I say no? Why should not the whole human herd butt gore and gorge upon each other? till all are extirpated by one huge and overfed behemoth, and he, when he had throttled and gnawed the bones of all his fellows, he, when his prey failed him, to be roaring whole days for lack of food, and finally to die inch by inch of famine. It were a consummation worthy of the race. Your deeds are better, Elshie, than your words, answered Earnscliff. You labor to preserve the race whom your misanthropy slanders. I do, but why? Hearken. You are one on whom I look with the least loathing, and I care not if, contrary to my want, I waste a few words in compassion to your infatuated blindness. 
If I cannot send disease into families and murrain among the herds, can I attend the same end so well as by prolonging the lives of those who can serve the purpose of destruction as effectually? If Alice of Bower had died in winter, would young Ruthwen have been slain for her love the last spring? Who thought of pinning their cattle beneath the tower when the Red Reaver of Westburn Flat was deemed to be on his deathbed? My draughts, my skill, recovered him, and now who dare leave his herd upon the lee without a watch, or go to bed without unchaining the sleuth-hound? I own, answered Earnscliff, you did little good to society by the last of these cures. But, to balance the evil, there is my friend Hobby, honest Hobby of the Hughfoot. Your skill relieved him last winter, and a fever that might have cost him his life. Thus think the children of clay in their ignorance, said the dwarf, smiling maliciously, and thus they speak in their folly. Have you marked the young cub of a wild cat that has been domesticated? How sportive, how playful, how gentle. But trust him with your game, your lambs, your poultry. His inbred ferocity breaks forth. He gripes, tears, ravages, and devours. Such is the animal's instinct, answered Earnscliff. But what has that to do with hobby? It is his emblem, it is his picture, retorted the recluse. He is at present tame, quiet, and domesticated for lack of opportunity to exercise his inborn propensities. But let the trumpet of war sound. Let the young bloodhound snuff blood. He'll be as ferocious as the wildest of his border ancestors that ever fired a helpless peasant's abode. Can you deny that even at present he often urges you to take bloody revenge for an injury received when you were a boy? Earnscliff started. The recluse appeared not to observe his surprise, and proceeded. The trumpet will blow. The young bloodhound will lap blood. And I will laugh, and say, for this I have preserved thee. He paused, and continued, Such are my cures. Their object, their purpose, perpetuating the mass of misery, and playing, even in this desert, my part in the general tragedy. Were you on your sick bed, I might in compassion send you a cup of poison. I am much obliged to you, Elshie, and certainly shall not fail to consult you, with so comfortable a hope from your assistance. Do not flatter yourself too far, replied the hermit with the hope that I will positively yield to the frailty of pity. Why should I snatch a dupe, so well fitted to endure the miseries of life as you are, from the wretchedness which his own visions and the villainy of the world are preparing for him? Why should I play the compassionate Indian, and, knocking out the brains of the captive with my tomahawk, at once spoil the three days' amusement of my kindred tribe, at the very moment when the brands were lighted, the pincers heated, the cauldrons boiling, the knives sharpened to tear, scorch, seethe, and scarify the intended victim. A dreadful picture you present to me of life, Elshie, but I am not daunted by it, returned Earnscliff. We are sent here in one sense to bear and to suffer, but in another to do and to enjoy. The active day has its evening of repose. Even patient sufferance has its alleviations, where there is a consolatory sense of duty discharged. I spurn at the slavish and bestial doctrine, said the dwarf, his eyes kindling with insane fury. I spurn at it, as worthy only of the beasts that perish. But I will waste no more words with you. He rose hastily, but ere he withdrew into the hut, he added, with great vehemence, Yet! Lest you still think my apparent benefits to mankind flow from the stupid and servile source called love of our fellow creatures, know that were there a man who had annihilated my soul's dearest hope, who had torn my heart to mammox, and seared my brain till it glowed like a volcano, and were that man's fortune and life in my power, as completely as this frail potsherd, 
he snatched up an earthen cup which stood beside him. I would not dash him into atoms thus. He flung the vessel with fury against the wall. No! He spoke more composedly, but with the utmost bitterness. I would pamper him with wealth and power to inflame his evil passions, and to fulfill his evil designs. He should lack no means of vice and villainy. He should be the centre of a whirlpool that itself should know neither rest nor peace, but boil with unceasing fury, while it wrecked every good ship that approached its limits. He should be an earthquake, capable of shaking the very land in which he dwelt, and rendering all its inhabitants friendless, outcast, and miserable, as I am. The wretched being rushed into his hut as he uttered these last words, shutting the door with furious violence and rapidly drawing two bolts one after another, as if to exclude the intrusion of any one of that hated race who had thus lashed his soul to frenzy. Earnscliff left the moor with mingled sensations of pity and horror, pondering what strange and melancholy cause could have reduced to so miserable a state of mind a man whose language argued him to be of rank and education, much superior to the vulgar. He was also surprised to see how much particular information a person who had lived in that country so short a time, and in so recluse a manner, had been able to collect respecting the dispositions and private affairs of the inhabitants. It is no wonder, he said to himself, that with such extent of information, such a mode of life, so uncouth a figure, and sentiments so virulently misanthropic, this unfortunate should be regarded by the vulgar as in league with the enemy of mankind. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Black Dwarf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 5 The bleakest rock upon the loneliest heath feels in its barrenness some touch of spring, and in the April dew or beam of May its moss and lichen freshen and revive, and thus the heart, most seared to human pleasure, melts at the tear, joys in the smile of women beaumont as the season advanced the weather became more genial and the recluse was more frequently found occupying the broad flat stone in the front of his mansion as he sat there one day about the hour of noon a party of gentlemen and ladies well mounted and numerously attended swept across the heath at some distance from his dwelling dogs hawks and led horses swelled the retinue and the air resounded at intervals with the cheer of the hunters and the sound of horns blown by the attendants. The recluse was about to retire into his mansion at the sight of a train so joyous, when three young ladies, with their attendants, who had made a circuit and detached themselves from their party, in order to gratify their curiosity by a sight of the wise white of Muckelstane Moor, came suddenly up ere he could effect his purpose. The first shrieked, and put her hands before her eyes, at sight of an object so unusually deformed. The second, with a hysterical giggle, which she intended should disguise her terrors, asked the recluse whether he could tell their fortune. The third, who was best mounted, best dressed, and incomparably the best looking of the three, advanced, as if to cover the incivility of her companions. "'We have lost the right path!' that leads through these morasses, and our party have gone forward without us, said the young lady. Seeing you, father, at the door of your house, we have turned this way to— Hush! interrupted the dwarf. So young, and already so artful. You came, you know you came, to exult in the consciousness of your own youth, wealth, and beauty, by contrasting them with age, poverty, and deformity. 
it is a fit employment for the daughter of your father, but, oh, how unlike the child of your mother. Did you, then, know my parents? And do you know me? Yes. This is the first time you have crossed my waking eyes, but I have seen you in my dreams. Your dreams? Aye, Isabel Vere. What hast thou, or thine, to do with my waking thoughts? Your waking thoughts, sir, said the second of Miss Vere's companions, with a sort of mock gravity, are fixed doubtless upon wisdom. Folly can only intrude on your sleeping moments. Over thine, retorted the dwarf, more splenetically than became a philosopher or hermit. Folly exercises an unlimited empire, asleep or awake. Lord bless us, said the lady, he's a prophet sure enough. As surely, continued the recluse, as thou art a woman, a woman, I should have said a lady, a fine lady. You asked me to tell your fortune. It is a simple one, an endless chase through life after follies not worth catching, and when caught, successively thrown away. A chase pursued from the days of tottering infancy to those of old age upon his crutches, toys and merry-makings in childhood, love and its absurdities in youth, spadil and basto in age shall succeed each other as objects of pursuit, flowers and butterflies in spring, butterflies and thistledowns in summer, withered leaves in autumn and winter, all pursued, all caught, all flung aside. Stand apart, your fortune is said. All caught, however, retorted the laughing fair one, who was a cousin of Miss Mears. That's something, Nancy, she continued, turning to the timid damsel who had first approached the dwarf. Will you ask your fortune? Not for worlds, said she, drawing back. I have heard enough of yours. Well then, said Miss Ilderton, offering money to the dwarf, I'll pay for mine, as if it were spoken by an oracle to a princess. Truth, said the soothsayer, can neither be bought nor sold. And he pushed back her proffered offering with morose disdain. Well then, said the lady, I'll keep my money, Mr. Elshender, to assist me in the chase I am to pursue. You will need it, replied the cynic. Without it, few pursue successfully, and fewer are themselves pursued. Stop, he said to Miss Vere, as her companions moved off. With you, I have more to say. You have what your companions would wish to have or be thought to have. Beauty, wealth, station, accomplishments. Forgive my following my companions, father. I am proof both to flattery and fortune-telling. Stay, continued the dwarf, with his hand on her horse's rein. I am no common soothsayer, and I am no flatterer. All the advantages I have detailed, all and each of them have their corresponding evils unsuccessful love, crossed affections, the gloom of a convent, or an odious alliance. I, who wish ill to all mankind, cannot wish more evil to you, so much is your course of life crossed by it. And if it be, father, let me enjoy the readiest solace of adversity while prosperity is in my power. You are old, you are poor, your habitation is far from human aid, were you ill, or in want. Your situation, in many respects, exposes you to the suspicions of the vulgar, which are too apt to break out into actions of brutality. Let me think I have mended the lot of one human being. Accept of such assistance as I have power to offer. Do this for my sake, if not for your own, that when these evils arise, which you prophesy perhaps too truly, I may not have to reflect that the hours of my happier time have been passed altogether in vain. The old man answered with a broken voice, and almost without addressing himself to the young lady. Yes, tis thus thou shouldst think, tis thus thou shouldst speak, if ever human speech and thought kept touch with each other. They do not, they do not, alas, they cannot. 
and yet wait here an instant stir not till my return he went to his little garden and returned with a half-blown rose thou hast made me shed a tear the first which has wet my eyelids for many a year for that good deed receive this token of gratitude it is but a common rose preserve it however and do not part with it come to me in your hour of adversity show me that rose or but one leaf of it where it withered as my heart is if it should be in my fiercest and wildest movements of rage against a hateful world still it will recall gentler thoughts to my bosom and perhaps afford happier prospects to thine but no message he exclaimed rising into his usual mood of misanthropy no message no go-between come thyself and the heart and the doors that are shut against every other earthly being shall open to thee and to thy sorrows and now pass on he let go the bridle rein and the young lady rode on after expressing her thanks to this singular being as well as her surprise at the extraordinary nature of his address would permit often turning back to look at the dwarf who still remained at the door of his habitation and watched her progress over the moor towards her father's castle of ellislaw until the brow of the hill hid the party from his sight the ladies meantime jested with miss vere on the strange interview they had just had with the far-famed wizard of the moor isabella has all the luck at home and abroad her hawk strikes down the black cock her eyes wound the gallant no chance for her poor companions and kinswomen even the conjurer cannot escape the force of her charms you should in compassion cease to be such an engrosser my dear isabel or at least set up shop and sell off all the goods you do not mean to keep for your own use you shall have them all replied miss vere and the conjurer to boot at a very easy rate no nancy shall have the conjurer replied miss ilderton to supply deficiencies she's not quite a witch herself you know lord sister answered the younger miss ilderton what could i do with so frightful a monster i kept my eyes shut after once glancing at him and i protest i thought i saw him still though i winked as close as ever i could that's a pity said her sister ever while you live nancy choose an admirer whose faults can be hid by winking at them well then i must take him myself i suppose and put him into mamma's japan cabinet in order to show that scotland can produce a specimen of mortal clay moulded into form ten thousand times uglier than the imaginations of canton and peking fertile as they are in monsters have immortalised in porcelain there is something said miss vere so melancholy in the situation of this poor man that i cannot enter into your mirth lucy so readily as usual if he has no resources how is he to exist in this waste country living as he does at such a distance from mankind and if he has the means of securing occasional assistance will not the very suspicion that he is possessed of them expose him to plunder and assassination by some of our unsettled neighbours but you forget that they say he is a warlock said nancy ilderton and if his magic diabolical should fail him rejoined her sister i would have him trust to his magic natural and thrust his enormous head and most preternatural visage out at his door or window full in view of the assailants the boldest robber that ever rode would hardly bide a second glance of him well i wish i had the use of that gorgon head of his for only one half hour for what purpose lucy said miss vere oh i would frighten out of the castle that dark stiff and stately sir frederick langley that is so great a favourite with your father and so little a favourite of yours i protest i shall be obliged to the wizard as long as i live if it were only for the half hour's relief from that man's company which we have gained by deviating from the party to visit elshie what would you say then said miss vere in a low tone so as not to be heard by the younger sister who rode before them the narrow path not admitting of their moving all three abreast what would you say my dearest lucy 
if it were proposed to you to endure his company for life. Say? I would say no, 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 three times, each louder than another, till they should hear me at Carlisle. And Sir Frederick would say then, nineteen naysays are half a grant. That, replied Miss Lucy, depends entirely on the manner in which the naysays are said. Mine should have not one grain of concession in them, I promise you. But if your father, said Miss Vere, were to say, thus do, or... I would stand to the consequences of his or, were he the most cruel father that ever was recorded in romance, to fill up the alternative. And what if he threatened you with a Catholic aunt, an abbess, and a cloister? Then, said Miss Ilderton, I would threaten him with a Protestant son-in-law, and be glad of an opportunity to disobey him for conscience' sake. And now that Nancy is out of hearing, let me really say, I think you would be excusable before God and man for resisting this preposterous match by every means in your power. A proud, dark, ambitious man, a caballer against the state, infamous for his avarice and severity, a bad son, a bad brother, unkind and ungenerous to all his relatives. Isabel, I would die rather than have him. Don't let my father hear you give me such advice, said Miss Vere, or adieu, my dear Lucy, to Ellislaw Castle. And adieu to Ellislaw Castle with all my heart, said her friend, if I once saw you fairly out of it, and settled under some kinder protector than he whom nature has given you. Oh, if my poor father had been in his former health, how gladly would he have received and sheltered you, till this ridiculous and cruel persecution were blown over. Would to God it had been so, my dear Lucy, answered Isabella, but I fear that, in your father's weak state of health, he would be altogether unable to protect me against the means which would be immediately used for reclaiming the poor fugitive. I fear so indeed, replied Miss Ilderton, but we will consider and devise something. Now that your father and his guests seem so deeply engaged in some mysterious plot, to judge from the passing and returning of messages, from the strange faces which appear and disappear without being announced by their names, from the collecting and cleaning of arms, and the anxious gloom and bustle which seem to agitate every male in the castle, it may not be impossible for us, always in case matters be driven to extremity, to shape out some little supplemental conspiracy of our own. I hope the gentlemen have not kept all the policy to themselves, and there is one associate that I would gladly admit to our council. Not Nancy? Oh, no, said Miss Ilderton. Nancy, though an excellent good girl, and fondly attached to you, would make a dull conspirator, as dull as Reno and all the other subordinate plotters in Venice preserved. No, this is a Jaffier, or Pierre, if you like the character better. And yet, though I know I shall please you, I am afraid to mention his name to you, lest I vex you at the same time. Can you not guess? Something about an eagle and a rock. It does not begin with eagle in English, but something very like it in Scotch. You cannot mean young Earnscliff, Lucy, said Miss Vere, blushing deeply. And whom else should I mean, said Lucy. Javier's and Pierre's are very scarce in this country, I take it, though one could find Reynolds and Bedamars enow. How call you talk so wildly, Lucy? Your plays and romances have positively turned your brain. You know that, independent of my father's consent, without which I never will marry any one, and which, in the case you point at, would never be granted, independent, too, of our knowing nothing of young Earnscliff's inclinations, but by your own vivid conjectures and fancies. Besides all this, there is a fatal brawl. When his father was killed, said Lucy, but that was very long ago, and I hope we have outlived the time of bloody feud, when a quarrel was carried down between two families from father to son, like a Spanish game at chess, and a murder or two committed in every generation, just to keep the matter from going to sleep. We do with our quarrels nowadays, as with our clothes, cut them out for ourselves, and wear them out in our own day, and should no more think of resenting our father's feuds, than of wearing their slashed doublets and trunk hose. You treat this far too lightly, Lucy, answered Miss Vere. Not a bit, my dear Isabella, said Lucy. 
consider your father, though present in the unhappy affray, is never supposed to have struck the fatal blow. Besides, in former times, in case of mutual slaughter between clans, subsequent alliances were so far from being excluded that the hand of a daughter or a sister was the most frequent gauge of reconciliation. You laugh at my skill in romance, but I assure you, should your history be written like that of many a less distressed and less deserving heroine, the well-judging reader would set you down for the lady and the love of Ernscliff. From the very obstacle which you suppose so insurmountable. But these are not the days of romance, but of sad reality, for there stands the castle of Elslaw, and there stands Sir Frederick Langley at the gate, waiting to assist the ladies from their palfreys. I would as lief touch a toad. I will disappoint him, and take old Horsington the groom for my master of the horse. So saying, the lively young lady switched her palfrey forward, and passing Sir Frederick with a familiar nod, as he stood ready to take her horse's rein, she cantered on, and jumped into the arms of the old groom. Fain would Isabella have done the same had she dared, but her father stood near, displeasure already darkening on a countenance peculiarly qualified to express the harsher passions, and she was compelled to receive the unwelcome assiduities of her detested suitor. End of chapter 5《ハッシュタグクロニクル》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 6 Let not us that are squires of the knight's body be called thieves of the day's booty. Let us be Diana's foresters, gentlemen of the shade, minions of the moon. Henry the Fourth, Part One. The solitary had consumed the remainder of that day in which he had the interview with the young ladies within the precincts of his garden. Evening again found him seated on his favourite stone, the sun setting red, and among seas of rolling clouds, threw a gloomy lustre over the moor and gave a deeper purple to the broad outline of heathy mountains which surrounded this desolate spot. The dwarf sat watching the clouds as they lowered above each other in masses of conglomerated vapours, and as a strong lurid beam of the sinking luminary darted full on his solitary and uncouth figure, he might well have seemed the demon of the storm which was gathering, or some gnome summoned forth from the recesses of the earth by the subterranean signals of its approach. As he sat thus, with his dark eye turned towards the scowling and blackening heaven, a horseman rode rapidly up to him, and stopping, as if to let his horse breathe for an instant, made a sort of obeisance to the anchoret, with an air betwixt effrontery and embarrassment. The figure of the rider was thin, tall and slender, but remarkably athletic, bony and sinewy like one who had all his life followed those violent exercises which prevent the human form from increasing in bulk, while they harden and confirm by habit its muscular powers. His face, sharp-featured, sunburnt, and freckled, had a sinister expression of violence, impudence, and cunning, each of which seemed alternately to predominate over the others. Sandy-coloured hair and reddish eyebrows, from under which looked forth his sharp grey eyes, completed the inauspicious outline of the horseman's physiognomy. He had pistols in his holsters, and another pair peeped from his belt, though he had taken some pains to conceal them by buttoning his doublet. He wore a rusted steel headpiece, a buff jacket of rather an antique cast, gloves of which that for the right hand was covered with small scales of iron, like an ancient gauntlet, and a long broadsword completed his equipage. So, said the dwarf, rapine and murder once more on horseback. On horseback, said the bandit. Aye, aye, Elshie, your leechcraft has set me on the bonny bay again. And all those promises of amendment which you made during your illness forgotten, continued Elshinder. All clear away with the water saps and panada, 
returned the unabashed convalescent. "'You can, Elshie, for they say you are weel acquaint with a gentleman. "'When the devil was sick, the devil a monk would be. "'When the devil was well, the devil a monk was he.' "'Thou say's true,' said the solitary. "'As well divide a wolf from his appetite for carnage, "'or a raven from her scent of slaughter, "'as thee from thy accursed propensities.' Why, what would you have me to do? It's born with me, lies in my very blood and bane. Why, man, the lads of Westburn Flat, for ten lang descents, have been reavers and lifters. They have all drunk hard, lived high, taking deep revenge for light offence, and never wanted gear for the winning. Right, and thou art as thoroughbred a wolf, said the dwarf, as ever leapt a lambfold at night. On what hell's errand art thou bound now? Can your skill not guess? Thus far I know, said the dwarf, that thy purpose is bad, thy deed will be worse, and the issue worst of all. And you like me the better for it, Father Elshie, eh? said Westburnflat. You always said you did. I have cause to like all, answered the solitary that are scourges to their fellow creatures, and thou art a bloody one. No, I say not guilty to that. Never bloody, unless there's resistance, and that sets a man's bristles up, you ken. And this is no great matter, after all, just to cut the comb of a young cock that has been crawing a little hour crossly. Not young Ernscliff, said the solitary, with some emotion. No, not young Ernscliff, not young Ernscliff yet, but his time may come, if he will not take warning, and get him back to the borough town that he's fit for, and no keep scalping about here, destroying the few deer that are left in the country, and pretending to act as a magistrate, and writing letters to the great folk at Old Reeky about the disturbed state of the land. Let him take care of himself." Then it must be hobby of the Hewfoot, said Elshie. What harm has the lad done ye? Harm? No great harm. But I hear he says I stayed away from the Baspiel and Fastern Eam for fear of him, and it was only for fear of the country keeper, for there was a warrant against me. I'll stand Hobby's feud, and all his clans, but it's not so much for that as to gie him a lesson not to let his tongue gallop our freely about his betters. I trow he will have lost the best pen feather of his wing before tomorrow morning. Farewell, Elshie. There's some canny boys waiting for me down among the shaws hour by. I'll see you as I come back and bring you a blithe tale in return for your leech craft. Ere the dwarf could collect himself to reply, the reaver of Westburn Flat set spurs to his horse. The animal, starting at one of the stones which lay scattered about, flew from the path. The rider exercised his spurs without moderation or mercy. The horse became furious, reared, kicked, plunged, and bolted like a deer, with all his four feet off the ground at once. It was in vain. The unrelenting rider sat as if he had been a part of the horse which he bestrode, and after a short but furious contest, compelled the subdued animal to proceed upon the path at a rate which soon carried him out of sight of the solitary. "'That villain!' exclaimed the dwarf. "'That cool-blooded, hardened, unrelenting ruffian! "'That wretch whose every thought is infected with crimes! "'Has thews and sinews, limbs and strength and activity enough "'to compel a nobler animal than himself "'to carry him to the place where he is to perpetrate his wickedness! "'While I, had I the weakness to wish to put his wretched victim on his guard, and to save the helpless family, I would see my good intentions frustrated by the decrepitude which chains me to the spot. Why should I wish it were otherwise? What have my screech owl voice, my hideous form, and my misshapen features to do with the fairer workmanship of nature? Do not men receive even my benefits with shrinking horror and ill-suppressed disgust? And why should I interest myself in a race which accounts me a prodigy and an outcast, and which has treated me as such? No, 
by all the ingratitude which I have wreaked, by all the wrongs which I have sustained, by my imprisonment, my stripes, my chains, I will wrestle down my feelings of rebellious humanity. I will not be the fool I have been to swear from my principles whenever there was an appeal for sooth to my feelings, as if I, towards whom none show sympathy, ought to have sympathy with any one. Let destiny drive forth her side car through the overwhelmed and trembling mass of humanity. Shall I be the idiot to throw this decrepit form, this misshapen lump of mortality, under her wheels? That the dwarf, the wizard, the hunchback, may save from destruction some fair form or some active frame, and all the world clap their hands at the exchange? No, never. And yet this Elliot, this hobby, so young and gallant, so frank, so... I will think of it no longer. I cannot aid him if I would, and I am resolved, firmly resolved, that I would not aid him, if a wish were the pledge of his safety. Having thus ended his soliloquy, he retreated into his hut for shelter from the storm which was fast approaching, and now began to burst in large and heavy drops of rain. The last rays of the sun now disappeared entirely, and two or three claps of distant thunder followed each other at brief intervals, echoing and re-echoing among the range of healthy fells like the sound of a distant engagement. End of chapter 6《ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ハッチェル・ For the blackness of ashes shall mark where it stood, and a wild mother scream o'er her famishing brood. Campbell. The night continued sullen and stormy, but morning rose as if refreshed by the rains. Even the Mucklestane Moor, with its broad bleak swells of barren grounds interspersed with marshy pools of water, seemed to smile under the serene influence of the sky just as good humour can spread a certain inexpressible charm over the plainest human countenance. The heath was in its thickest and deepest bloom. The bees, which the solitary had added to his rural establishment, were abroad and on the wing, and filled the air with the murmurs of their industry. As the old man crept out of his little hut, the two she-goats came to meet him, and licked his hands in gratitude for the vegetables with which he supplied them from his garden. You, at least, he said, you at least see no differences in form which can alter your feelings to a benefactor. To you, the finest shape that ever statuary moulded would be an object of indifference or of alarm, should it present itself instead of the misshapen trunk to whose services you are accustomed. While I was in the world, did I ever meet with such a return of gratitude? No. The domestic whom I had bred from infancy made mouths at me as he stood behind my chair. The friend whom I had supported with my fortune, and for whose sake I had even stained, he stopped with a strong convulsive shudder. Even he thought me more fit for the society of lunatics, for their disgraceful restraints, for their cruel privations, than for communication with the rest of humanity. Hubert alone and Hubert, too, will one day abandon me. All are of a piece, one mass of wickedness, selfishness, and ingratitude, wretches who sin even in their devotions, and of such hardness of heart that they do not, without hypocrisy, even thank the deity himself for his warm sun and pure air. As he was plunged in these gloomy soliloquies, he heard the tramp of a horse on the other side of his enclosure, and a strong, clear bass voice, singing with the liveliness inspired by a light heart. Can he hobby Elliot? Can he hobby now? Can he hobby Elliot? I scang along with you. 
At the same moment, a large deer greyhound sprung over the hermit's fence. It is well known to the sportsmen in these wilds that the appearance and scent of the goat so much resemble those of their usual objects of chase that the best broke greyhounds will sometimes fly upon them. The dog in question instantly pulled down and throttled one of the hermit's she-goats, while Hobby Elliot, who came up and jumped from his horse for the purpose, was unable to extricate the harmless animal from the fangs of his attendant until it was expiring. The dwarf eyed, for a few moments, the convulsive starts of his dying favourite, until the poor goat stretched out her limbs with the twitches and shivering fit of the last agony. He then started into an access of frenzy, and unsheathing a long, sharp knife or dagger which he wore under his coat, he was about to launch it at the dog, when Hobby, perceiving his purpose, interposed and caught hold of his hand, exclaiming, "'Let a be the hound, man! Let a be the hound! Na, na! Kilbuck munna be guided that gate neither!' The dwarf turned his rage on the young farmer, and by a sudden effort, far more powerful than Hobby expected from such a person, freed his wrist from his grasp, and offered the dagger at his heart. All this was done in the twinkling of an eye, and the incensed recluse might have completed his vengeance by plunging the weapon in Elliot's bosom, had he not been checked by an internal impulse which made him hurl the knife to a distance. No, he exclaimed, as he thus voluntarily deprived himself of the means of gratifying his rage. Not again! Not again! Hobby retreated a step or two in great surprise, discomposure, and disdain at having been placed in such danger by an object apparently so contemptible. "'The deal's in the body for strength and bitterness!' were the first words that escaped him, which he followed up with an apology for the accident that had given rise to their disagreement. "'I am no justifying Kilbuck or the gither neither, and I am sure it is as vexing to me as to you, Elshie, that the mischance should have happened, but I'll send you twa goats and twa fat gimmers, man, to make all straight again.' A wise man like you shouldn't a bear malice against a poor dumb thing. Ye see that a goat's like first cousin to a deer. Say so he acted but according to his nature, after all. Had it been a pet lamb, there would have been mare to be said. You should keep sheep, Elshie, and no goats, where there's so many deer hounds about. But I'll send you baith. Wretch! cried the hermit. Your cruelty has destroyed one of the only creatures in existence that would look on me with kindness. Dear Elshie, answered Hobby, and way ye should have cause to say so. I'm sure it was nae wi' my will, and yet, it's true, I should have minded your goats and coupled up the dogs. I'm sure I would rather they had worried the primest weather in my faults. Come, man, forget and forgee. I mean as vexed as you can be. But I am a bridegroom, you see, and that puts all things out of my head, I think. There's the marriage dinner, or good part of it, but my twa brothers are bringing on a sled round by the rider's slack. Three goodly bucks as ever ran on Dullam Lee, as the sang says. They couldna come the straight road for the saft grund. I would send you a bit of venison, but you wouldna take it weel, maybe, for Kilbuck catched it. During this long speech, in which the good-natured borderer endeavoured to propitiate the offended dwarf by every argument he could think of, he heard him with his eyes bent on the ground, as if in the deepest meditation, and at length broke forth. Nature? Yes, it is indeed in the usual beaten path of nature. The strong gripe and throttle the weak, the rich depress and despoil the needy. The happy, those who are idiots enough to think themselves happy, insult the misery and diminish the consolation of the wretched. Go hence! thou who hast contrived to give an additional pang to the most miserable of human beings, thou who hast deprived me of what I have considered as a source of comfort, go hence and enjoy the happiness prepared for thee at home. Never stir, said Hobby, if I wouldna take ye wi me, man, if ye would but say it would divert ye to be at the bridal on Monday. There will be a hundred strapping Elliots to ride the bruise, the like's no been seen since the days of old Martin of the Preakin Tower. I would send the sled for ye wi' a carry pony. Is it to me you propose once more to mix in the society of the common herd? said the recluse with an air of deep disgust. Commons, 
retorted Hobby. Nay, sicken commons neither. The Elliots have been lang kenned a gentle race. Hence, begone, reiterated the dwarf. May the same evil luck attend thee that thou hast left behind with me. If I go not with you myself, see if you can escape what my attendants, wrath and misery, have brought to thy threshold before thee. I wish you wouldna speak that gate, said Hobby. You ken yoursel, Elshie. Nobody judges you to be our canny. Now, I'll tell you just a word for all. Ye hae spoken as muckle as was an ill to me and mine. Now, if only mischance happened to Grace, which God forbid, or to myself, or to the poor dumb tyke, or if I be scathed and injured in body, goods, or gear, I'll no forget what it is that it's owned to. Out, hind! exclaimed the dwarf. Home, home to your dwelling, and think on me when you find what has befallen there. Aweel, aweel, said Hobby, mounting his horse. It serves naething to strive with cripples. They are I cankered. But I'll just tell you a thing, neighbour, that if things be otherwise, then we'll with Grace Armstrong, as gie a scither if there be a tar barrel in the five parishes. So saying, he rode off, and Elshie, after looking at him with a scornful and indignant laugh, took spade and mattock, and occupied himself in digging a grave for his deceased favourite. A low whistle, and the words, Hisht! Elshie! Hisht! disturbed him in this melancholy occupation. He looked up, and the Red Reaver of Westburn Flat was before him. Like Banquo's murderer, there was blood on his face as well as upon the rowels of his spurs and the sides of his overridden horse. "'How now, ruffian?' demanded the dwarf. "'Is thy job chaired? "'Aye, aye, doubt not that, Elshie,' answered the freebooter. "'When I ride, my foes may moan. "'They have had mair light than comfort at the hewfoot this morning. "'There's a tomb by and a wide and a wail and a cry for the bonny bride.' "'The bride?' "'Aye.' Charlie Cheat the Woody, as we call him, that's Charlie Foster of Tin and Beck, has promised to keep her in Cumberland till the blast blow by. She saw me and kenned me in the splore, for the mask fell through my face for a blink. I'm thinking it would concern my safety if she were to come back here, for there's mony the Elliots, and they band wheel together for right or wrong. Now, what I chiefly come to ask your reading is how you make her sure. Wouldst thou murder her, then? <laughs> no, no, that I would not do, if I could help it. But they say they can whiles get folk cannily away to the plantations from some of the outports, and something to boot for them that brings a bonny wench. They're wanted beyond seas, they female cattle, and they're no that scarce here. But I think you're doing better for this lassie. There's a lady that, unless she be o' the better bairn, is to be sent to foreign parts, whether she will or no. Now I think o' sending Grace to wait on her. She's a bonny lassie. Hobby will hae a merry morning when he comes home, and Mrs. Baith bride and gear. Aye, and do you not pity him? said the recluse. Would he pity me were I gying up the castle hill at Jeddup? Note, the place of execution at that ancient borough where many of Westburn Flat's profession have made their final exit. End note. And yet I rue something for the bit lassie. But he'll get another, and little scathe done. Yin is as good as another. And now, you that like to hear his splores, heard ye ever e a better yin than I he had this morning? Air, ocean, and fire, said the dwarf, speaking to himself. The earthquake, the tempest, the volcano are all mild and moderate compared to the wrath of man. And what is this fellow? but one more skilled than others in executing the end of his existence. Hear me, felon, go again where I before sent thee. To the steward? Aye, and tell him Elshinder the recluse commands him to give thee gold. But, hear me, let the maiden be discharged, free and uninjured. Return her to her friends, and let her swear not to discover thy villainy. Swear? said Westburn Flat. But what if she break her eighth? Women are not famous for keeping their plight. A wise man like you should ken that. And uninjured, 
Why kens what may happen worse to be left lag at Tinnenbeck? Charlie Cheat the Woody is a rough customer, but if the gold could be made up to twenty pieces, I think I could ensure her being with her friends within the twenty-four hours. The dwarf took his tablets from his pocket, marked a line on them, and tore out the leaf. There, he said, giving the robber the leaf. But mark me, thou knowest I am not to be fooled by thy treachery. If thou darest to disobey my directions, thy wretched life, be sure, shall answer it. I know, said the fellow, looking down, that you have power on earth, however you came by it. You can do what no other man can do, both by physic and foresight, and the gold is shelled down when you command, as fast as I have seen the ash keys fall in a frosty morning in October. I will not disobey you. Be gone, then, and relieve me of thy hateful presence. The robber set spurs to his horse and rode off without reply. Hobby Elliot had, in the meanwhile, pursued his journey rapidly, harassed by those oppressive and indistinct fears that all was not right, which men usually term a presentiment of misfortune. Ere he reached the top of the bank, from which he could look down on his own habitation, he was met by his nurse, a person then of great consequence in all families in Scotland, whether of the higher or middling classes. The connection between them and their foster children was considered a tie far too dearly intimate to be broken, and it usually happened, in the course of years, that the nurse became a resident in the family of her foster son, assisting in the domestic duties, and receiving all marks of attention and regard from the heads of the family. So soon as Hobby recognised the figure of Annapel, in her red cloak and black hood, he could not help exclaiming to himself, what ill luck can he brought the old nurse sae far frae hame, her that never stirs a gunshot for the doorstain for ordinar? Ho, it will just be to get cranberries or hortleberries or some such stuff out of the moss to make the pies and tarts for the feast on Monday. I cannot get the words of that cankered old crippled dealsbucky out of my head. The least thing makes me dread some ill news, O oh, Kilbuck man. Were there nae deer and goats in the country besides, but ye behove to gang and worry his creature by all other folks. By this time, an apple, with a brow like a tragic volume, had hobbled towards him and caught his horse by the bridle. The despair in her look was so evident as to deprive even him of the power of asking the cause. Oh, my bairn, she cried, gang na forward, gang na forward. It's a sight to kill onybody, let alone thee. "'In God's name, what's the matter?' asked the astonished horseman, endeavouring to extricate his bridle from the grasp of the old woman. "'For heaven's sake, let me go and see what's the matter.' "'Oh, that I should have lived to see the day. The steading's on a low, and the bonny stackyard lying in the red ashes, and the gear all driven away. But gang na forward. It would break your young heart, honey, to see what my old dean has seen this morning.' And who has dared to do this? Let go my bridle, Annapple. Where's my grandmother, my sisters? Where's Grace Armstrong? God, the words of the warlock are knelling in my ears. He sprang from his horse to rid himself of Annapple's interruption, and ascending the hill with great speed, soon came in view of the spectacle with which she had threatened him. It was indeed a heart-breaking sight. The habitation which he had left in its seclusion, beside the mountain stream, surrounded with every evidence of rustic plenty, was now a wasted and blackened ruin. From amongst the shattered and sable walls, the smoke continued to rise. The turf stack, the barnyard, the offices stocked with cattle, all the wealth of an upland cultivator of the period, of which poor Elliot possessed no common share, had been laid waste or carried off in a single night. He stood a moment motionless, and then exclaimed, I am ruined, ruined to the ground. But curse on the world's gear, had it not been the week before the bridal. But I am nae babe to sit down and greet about it. If I can but find Grace and my grandmother and my sister's wheel, I can go to the wars in Flanders, as my good sir did, under the Bellenden banner with old Buclou. At any rate, I will keep up a heart, or they will lose theirs altogether. Manfully strode Hobby down the hill resolved to suppress his own despair, 
and administer consolation which he did not feel. The neighbouring inhabitants of the dell, particularly those of his own name, had already assembled. The younger part were in arms and clamorous for revenge, although they knew not upon whom. The elder were taking measures for the relief of the distressed family. Annapole's cottage, which was situated down the brook at some distance from the scene of mischief, had been hastily adapted for the temporary accommodation of the old lady and her daughters, with such articles as had been contributed by the neighbours, for very little was saved from the wreck. "'Are we to stand here all day, sirs?' exclaimed one tall young man. "'And look at the burnt walls of our kinsman's house. Every wreath of the reek is a blast of shame upon us. Let us to horse and take the chase. Who has the nearest bloodhound?' "'It's young Ernscliffe,' answered another, "'and he's been on and away with six horse Langsyne "'to see if he can track them. "'Let us follow him, then, and raise the country, "'and Mac Mayor help as we ride, "'and then have at the Cumberland reavers. "'Take, burn, and slay. "'They that lie nearest us shall smart first. "'Wheesht! "'Odd your tongues, daf callants,' said an old man. "'You dinna ken what you speak about. "'What?' Would you raise war atween two pacificated countries? And what signifies deaving us with tales about our fathers, retorted the young man, if we're to sit and see our friends' houses burnt o'er their heads, and no put out hand to revenge them? Our fathers did not do that, I trow. I'm no saying onything against revenging Hobby's rang, poor chill, but we maun take the law wi' us in nae days, Simon, answered the more prudent elder. "'And besides,' said another old man, "'I didna believe there's yin now living "'that kens the lawful mode of following a fray across the border. "'Tam a Whitram kenned a' about it, "'but he died in the hard winter.' "'Aye,' said a third, "'he was at the great gathering "'when they chased as far as Thirlwall. "'It was the year after the fight of Philiphole. "'But,' exclaimed another of these discording counsellors, "'there's nae great skill needed.' Just put a lighted peat on the end of a spear, or hay-fork, or sick-like, and blow a horn, and cry the gathering word, and then it's lawful to follow gear into England, and recover it by the strong hand, or to take gear for some other Englishman, providing you lift nae mair than's been lifted for you. That's the old border law, made at Dundrennan, in the days of the Black Douglas. Deal you need doubt it. It's as clear as the sun. Come away then, lads, cried Simon. Get to your geldings, and we'll take old Cuddy the muckle tasker wi' us. He kens the value of the stock and plenishing that's been lost. Hobby's stalls and stakes shall be foo again or night, and if we canna big up the old house so soon, we'll slay an Englishin as low as Hugh Foot is, and that's fair play all the world o'er. This animating proposal was received with great applause by the younger part of the assemblage, when a whisper ran among them. "'There's Hobby himself, poor fellow. "'We'll be guided by him.' "'The principal sufferer, having now reached the bottom of the hill, "'pushed on through the crowd, "'unable, from the tumultuous state of his feelings, "'to do more than receive and return "'the grasps of the friendly hands "'by which his neighbours and kinsmen "'mutely expressed their sympathy in his misfortune. "'While he pressed Simon of Hackburn's hand, "'his anxiety at length found words.' Thank you, Simon. Thank you, neighbours. I ken what you would all say. But where are they? Where are... He stopped, as if afraid even to name the objects of his inquiry, and with a similar feeling, his kinsman, without reply, pointed to the hut, into which Hobby precipitated himself with the desperate air of one who is resolved to know the worst at once. A general and powerful expression of sympathy accompanied him. Ah, poor fellow! Poor Hobby, he'll learn the worst o't now. But I trust Ernscliff will get some spearings o' the poor lassie. Such were the exclamations of the group, who, having no acknowledged leader to direct their motions, passively awaited the return of the sufferer, and determined to be guided by his directions. The meeting between Hobby and his family was in the highest degree affecting. His sisters threw themselves upon him, and almost stifled him with their caresses as if to prevent his looking round to distinguish the absence of one yet more beloved. God help thee, my son, he can help when worldly trust is a broken reed. 
such was the welcome of the matron to her unfortunate grandson. He looked eagerly round, holding two of his sisters by the hand, while the third hung about his neck. "'I see you, I count you, my grandmother, Lilius, Jean, and Annat. But where is—' He hesitated, and then continued, as if with an effort. "'Where is Grace? Surely this is not a time to hide herself from me. There's nae time for daffin now.' "'Oh, brother,' and our poor Grace was the only answer his questions could procure, till his grandmother rose up and gently disengaged him from the weeping girls, led him to a seat, and with the affecting serenity which sincere piety, like oil sprinkled on the waves, can throw over the most acute feelings, she said, "'My bairn, when thy grandfather was killed in the wars,' and left me with six orphans around me, with scarce bread to eat, or a roof to cover us. I had strength, not of mine own, but I had strength given me, to say, The Lord's will be done. My son, our peaceful house was last night broken into by moss troopers, armed and masked. They've taken and destroyed all, and carried off our dear grace. Pray for strength to say, His will be done. Mother, mother, urge me not, I cannot. Not now I am a sinful man, and of a hardened race. Masked, armed, grace carried off. Give me my sword, and my father's knapsack. I will have vengeance, if I should go to the pit of darkness to seek it. Oh, my bairn, my bairn, be patient under the rod. Who knows when he may lift his hand off from us? Young Ernscliff, heaven bless him, has ta'en the chase, with Davy of Stenhouse, and the first comers. I cried to let house and plenishing burn, and follow the reavers to recover grace, and Dernscliff and his men were o'er the fell, within three hours after the deed. God bless him, he's a real Ernscliff. He's his father's true son, a leal friend. A true friend, indeed. God bless him, exclaimed Hobby. Let's on and away and take the chase after him. Oh, my child, before you run on danger, let me hear you but say, His will be done. Urge me not, mother, not now. He was rushing out when, looking back, he observed his grandmother make a mute attitude of affliction. He returned hastily, threw himself into her arms, and said, Yes, mother, I can say, His will be done, since it will comfort you. May he go forth, may he go forth with you, my dear bairn, and oh, may he give you cause to say on your return, his name be praised. Farewell, mother, farewell, my dear sisters, exclaimed Elliot, and rushed out of the house. End of chapter 7、Chapter 8 of The Black Dwarf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 8 Now horse and hattock, cried the laird, now horse and hattock, speedily. They that winna ride for Telfer's kai, let them never look in the face o' me. Border ballad. Horse, horse, and spear! exclaimed Hobby to his kinsman. Many a ready foot was in the stirrup, and while Elliot hastily collected arms and accoutrements, no easy matter in such a confusion, the glen resounded with the approbation of his younger friends. Ay, ay! exclaimed Simon of Hackburn. That's the gate to take it, Hobby. Let women sit and greet at hame. Men must do as they have been done by. It's the scripture says. Hold your tongue, sir," said one of the seniors sternly. "Did he abuse the word that gate? Ye dinna ken what ye speak about. He ye ony tidings? He ye ony spearns, Hobby? Oh, callants, dinna be ower hasty," said old Dick of the Dingle. "What signifies preaching to us e'en now?" said Simon. "If ye canna make help yoursel, dinna keep back them that can." "Wished, sir." Wad ye take vengeance, or ye ken wha has wronged ye? 
Do you think we dinna ken the road to England as weel as our fathers before us? All evil comes out of there away. It's an old saying, and a true, and we'll e'en away there, as if the devil was blown us south. We'll follow the track of Ernscliffe's horses o'er the waste, cried one Elliot. I'll prick them out through the blindest moor in the border, and there had been a fair held there the day before, said Hugh, the blacksmith of Ringleburn, for I I shoe his horse with my ain hand. Lay on the deer hounds, cried another. Where are they? Hoot, man, the sun's been lying up, and the dew is aft the grund. The scent will never lie. Hobby instantly whistled on his hounds, which were roving about the ruins of their old habitation, and filling the air with their doleful howls. Now, Kilbuck, said Hobby, try thy skill this day, and then, as if a light had suddenly broke on him, that ill-furred goblin spack something o' this. He may ken mair o't, either by villains on earth or devils below. I'll hae it frae him, if I should cut it out o' his misshapen bouk wi' my whinger. He then hastily gave directions to his comrades. Fourier, with Simon, hod right forward to Graham's Gap. If they're English, they'll be for being back that way. The rest dispersed by twasome and threesome through the waste and meet me at the trysting pool. Tell my brothers, when they come up, to follow and meet us there. Poor lads, they will hae hearts weel nigh as sair as mine, little think they what a sorrowful house they are bringing their venison to. I'll ride our Mucklestane moor myself. And if I were you, said Dick of the Dingle, I would speak to Canny Elshie. He can tell you whatever betides in this land, if he's say minded. He shall tell me, said Hobby who was busy putting his arms in order. What he kens of this night's job, or I shall right weel ken wherefore he does not. Ay, but speak him fair, my bonny man. Speak him fair, Hobby. The like o' him will no bear thrown. They converse sae muckle with they fractious ghasts and evil spirits that it clean spoils their temper. Let me alane to guide him, answered Hobby. There's that in my breast this day that would our maister all the warlocks on earth and all the devils in hell. And being now fully equipped, he threw himself on his horse, and spurred him at a rapid pace against the steep ascent. Elliot speedily surmounted the hill, rode down the other side at the same rate, crossed a wood, and traversed a long glen, ere he at length regained Mucklestane Moor. As he was obliged, in the course of his journey, to relax his speed in consideration of the labour which his horse might still have to undergo, he had time to consider maturely in what manner he should address the dwarf, in order to extract from him the knowledge which he supposed him to be in possession of, concerning the authors of his misfortunes. Hobby, though blunt, plain of speech, and hot of disposition, like most of his countrymen, was by no means deficient in the shrewdness which is also their characteristic. He reflected that from what he had observed on the memorable night when the dwarf was first seen, and from the conduct of that mysterious being ever since, he was likely to be rendered even more obstinate in his sullenness by threats and violence. I'll speak to him fair, he said, as old Dixon advised me. Though folk say he has a league with Satan, he canna be sick an incarnate devil as no to take some pity in a case like mine, and folk three heel whiles do good, charitable sort of things. I'll keep my heart down as weel as I can, and stroke him with a hair, and if the worst comes to the worst, it's but wringing the head o' him about at last. In this disposition of accommodation, he approached the hut of the solitary. The old man was not upon his seat of audience, nor could Hobby perceive him in his garden or enclosures. He's gotten into his very keep, said Hobby, maybe to be out of the gate, but I's put it down about his lugs, if I canna win at him otherwise. Having thus communed with himself, he raised his voice and invoked Elshie in a tone as supplicating as his conflicting feelings would permit. Elshie, my good friend. No reply. Elshie, canny father Elshie. The dwarf remained mute. Sorrow be in the crooked carcass of thee, said the borderer between his teeth, and then again attempting a soothing tone. Good father Elshie, a most miserable creature desires some counsel of your wisdom. The better, answered the shrill and discordant voice of the dwarf, 
through a very small window resembling an arrow slit, which he had constructed near the door of his dwelling, and through which he could see any one who approached it, without the possibility of their looking in upon him. "'The better!' said Hobby impatiently. "'What is the better, Elshie? Do you not hear me tell you I am the most miserable wretch living?' "'And do you not hear me tell you it is so much the better? And did I not tell you this morning, when you thought yourself so happy, what an evening was coming upon you?' "'That you did, Ian,' replied Hobby, "'and that gars me come to you for advice now. They that foresaw the trouble mon ken the cure.' "'I know no cure for earthly trouble,' returned the dwarf. "'Or if I did, why should I help others when none hath aided me? "'Have I not lost wealth that would have bought all thy barren hills a hundred times over? "'Rank to which thine is as that of a peasant. "'Society, where there was an interchange of all that was amiable and all that was intellectual. "'Have I not lost all this?' Am I not residing here, the veriest outcast on the face of nature, in the most hideous and most solitary of her retreats, myself more hideous than all that is around me? And why should other worms complain to me when they are trodden upon, since I am myself lying crushed and writhing under the chariot wheel? You may have lost all this, answered Hobby, in the bitterest of emotion. Land and friends, goods and gear, you may he lost them all, but ye ne'er can he say sair a heart as mine, for ye ne'er lost ne Grace Armstrong. And now my last hopes are gone, and I shall ne'er see her mair. This he said in the tone of deepest emotion, and there followed a long pause, for the mention of his bride's name had overcome the more angry and irritable feelings of poor Hobby. Ere he had again addressed a solitary, the bony hand and long fingers of the latter holding a large leathern bag, was thrust forth at the small window, and as it unclutched the burden and let it drop with a clang upon the ground, his harsh voice again addressed Elliot. There, there lies a salve for every human ill, so at least each human wretch readily thinks. Begone, return twice as healthy as thou wert before yesterday, and torment me no more with questions, complaints, or thanks. They are alike odious to me. It is all gowd, by heaven, said Elliot, having glanced at the contents, and then again addressing the hermit. Muckle obliged for your good will, and I would blithely gie ye a bond for some of the siller, or a wadsa o'er the lands are wide open. But I dinna ken, Elshie, to be free wi' you, I dinna like to use siller unless I kenned it was decently come by, and maybe it might turn into sclate stains and cheat some poor man. Ignorant idiot! retorted the dwarf. The trash is as genuine poison as ever was dug out of the bowels of the earth. Take it, use it, and may it thrive with you as it hath done with me. But I tell you, said Elliot, it wasn't about the gear that I was consulting you. It was a braw barnyard, doubtless, and thirty head of finer cattle there weren't it on this side of the catrail. But let the gear gang. If you could but gie me spearns of poor grace, I would be content to be your slave for life, in anything that didna touch my salvation. O oh, Elshie, speak, man, speak. Well, then, answered the dwarf, as if worn out by his importunity, since thou hast not enough of woes of thine own, but must needs seek to burden thyself with those of a partner, seek her whom thou hast lost in the West. In the West? That's a wide word. It is the last, said the dwarf which I design to utter. And he drew the shutters of his window, leaving Hobby to make the most of the hint he had given. The west, the west, thought Elliot. The country is pretty quiet down that way, unless it were Jock of the Toddholes, and he's our old now for the like of Ajobs. West, by my life, it must be West Burnflat. Elshie, just tell me one word. Am I right? Is it West Burnflat? And if I am wrong, say say. I wouldn't like to white an innocent neighbour with violence. No answer? It must be the Red Reaver. I didna think he would have ventured on me, neither. And Simone kin as there's he is. I am thinking he'll hae some better backing than his Cumberland friends. Farewell to ye, Elshie, and money thanks. I downer be fashed with a seller e'en now, 
for I mon a wa to meet my friends at the trysting place. Say, if ye care na to open the window, ye can fetch it in after I'm a wa. Still there was no reply. He's deaf, or he's daft, or he's baith, but I hae nae time to stay to claver wi' him. And off rode Hobbie Elliot towards the place of rendezvous which he had named to his friends. Four or five riders were already gathered at the trysting pool. They stood in close consultation together, while their horses were permitted to graze among the poplars which overhung the broad still pool. A more numerous party were seen coming from the southward. It proved to be Earnscliff and his party, who had followed the track of the cattle as far as the English border, but had halted on the information that a considerable force was drawn together under some of the Jacobite gentlemen in that district and there were tidings of insurrection in different parts of Scotland. This took away from the act which had been perpetrated, the appearance of private animosity, or love of plunder, and Earnscliff was now disposed to regard it as a symptom of civil war. The young gentleman greeted Hobby with the most sincere sympathy, and informed him of the news he had received. "'Then may I never stir for the bit,' said Elliot, "'if old Elslaw is not at the bottom of the hail villainy, Ye see, he's leagued with the Cumberland Catholics, and that agrees weel with what Elshie hinted about Westburn Flat, for Elslaw I protected him, and he will want to harry and disarm the country about his ain hand before he breaks out. Some now remembered that the party of ruffians had been heard to say they were acting for James the Eighth, and were charged to disarm all rebels. Others had heard Westburn Flat boast in drinking parties that Elslaw would soon be in arms for the Jacobite cause, and that he himself was to hold a command under him, and that they would be bad neighbours for young Earnscliff, and all that stood out for the established government. The result was a strong belief that Westburnflat had headed the party under Elslaw's orders, and the resolve to proceed instantly to the house of the former, and if possible to secure his person. They were by this time joined by so many of their dispersed friends, that their number amounted to upwards of twenty horsemen, well mounted and tolerably, though variously, armed. A brook, which issued from a narrow glen among the hills, entered at Westburn Flat upon the open marshy level, which, expanding about half a mile in every direction, gives name to the spot. In this place the character of the stream becomes changed, and from being a lively, brisk-running mountain torrent, it stagnates like a blue swollen snake in dull, deep windings, through the swampy level. On the side of the stream, and nearly about the centre of the plain, arose the tower of Westburn Flat, one of the few remaining strongholds formerly so numerous upon the borders. The ground upon which it stood was gently elevated above the marsh for a space of about a hundred yards, affording an esplanade of dry turf, which extended itself in the immediate neighbourhood of the tower but beyond which the surface presented to strangers was that of an impassable and dangerous bog. The owner of the tower and his inmates alone knew the winding and intricate paths, which, leading over ground that was comparatively sound, admitted visitors to his residence. But among the party which were assembled under Earnscliff's directions, there was more than one person qualified to act as a guide. For although the owner's character and habits of life were generally known, yet the laxity of feeling with respect to property prevented his being looked on with the abhorrence with which he must have been regarded in a more civilised country. He was considered among his more peaceable neighbours pretty much as a gambler, cockfighter, or horse jockey would be regarded at the present day, a person, of course, whose habits were to be condemned and his society in general avoided, yet who could not be considered as marked with the indelible infamy attached to his profession where laws have been habitually observed, and their indignation was awakened against him upon this occasion, not so much on account of the general nature of the transaction, which was just such as was to be expected from this marauder, as that the violence had been perpetrated upon a neighbour, against whom he had no cause of quarrel, against a friend of their own, above all against one of the name of Elliot, to which clan most of them belonged. It was not therefore wonderful that there should be several in the band pretty well acquainted with the locality of his habitation, and capable of giving such directions and guidance as soon placed the whole party on the open space of firm ground in front of the tower of Westburn Flat. End of chapter 8
Chapter Nine of The Black Dwarf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Nine. So spake the knight. The gent said, "Lend forth with thee the silly maid." And Mac Michael of thee and she, her glons and ee, or brow so brent, or cheek wi rose and lily blent, me lists not ficht wi thee. Romance of the Falcon. The tower before which the party now stood was a small square building of the most gloomy aspect. The walls were of great thickness, and the windows, or slits which served the purpose of windows, seemed rather calculated to afford the defenders the means of employing missile weapons than for admitting air or light to the apartments within. A small battlement projected over the walls on every side, and afforded farther advantage of defence by its niched parapet, within which arose a steep roof, flagged with grey stones. A single turret at one angle, defended by a door studded with huge iron nails, rose above the battlement, and gave access to the roof from within, by the spiral staircase which it enclosed. It seemed to the party that their motions were watched by someone concealed within this turret, and they were confirmed in their belief when, through a narrow loophole, a female hand was seen to wave a handkerchief, as if by way of signal to them. Hobby was almost out of his senses with joy and eagerness. "'It was Gracie's hand and arm,' he said. "'I can swear to it among a thousand. There is not the like of it on this side of the Loudons. We'll have her out, lads.' if we should carry off the Tower of Westburnflat stain by stain. Earnscliff, though he doubted the possibility of recognising a fair maiden's hand at such a distance from the eye of the lover, would say nothing to damp his friend's animated hopes, and it was resolved to summon the garrison. The shouts of the party, and the winding of one or two horns, at length brought to a loophole which flanked the entrance the haggard face of an old woman. "'That's the reaver's mother!' said one of the Elliots. She's ten times war than himself, and is waited for muckle of the ill he does about the country. Who are ye? What do you want here? were the queries of the respectable progenitor. We are seeking William Graham of Westburnflat, said Earnscliff. He's not him, returned the old dame. When did he leave home? pursued Earnscliff. I canna tell, said the portress. "'When will it return?' said Hobby Elliot. "'I dinna ken naething about it,' replied the inexorable guardian of the keep. "'Is there anybody within the tower with you?' again demanded Earnscliff. "'Naebody but mysel and Bodrons,' said the old woman. "'Then open the gate and admit us,' said Earnscliff. "'I am a justice of peace, and in search of the evidence of a felony. "'Deal be in their fingers that draws a bolt for you.' retorted the portress, for mine shall never do it. Think now ye shame o' yourselves to come here sick in a band o' ye wi' your swords and spears and steel caps to frighten a lone widow woman? Our information, said Earnscliff, is positive. We are seeking goods which have been forcibly carried off to a great amount. And a young woman that's been cruelly made prisoner, that's worth mair than all the gear twice told, said Hobby. And I warn you, continued Earnscliff, that your only way to prove your son's innocence is to give us quiet admittance to search the house. And what will ye do if I care to throw the keys, or draw the bolts, or open the grate, to sicker clam Jamfrey? said the old dame scoffingly. Force our way with the king's keys, and break the neck of every living soul we find in the house, if ye dinna gie it our forthwith, menaced the incensed hobby. Threatened folks live lang, said the hag, in the same tone of irony. There's the iron grate. Try your skill on it, lads. It has kept out as good men as you are now. So saying, she laughed and withdrew from the aperture through which she had held the parley. The besiegers now opened a serious consultation. The immense thickness of the walls and the small size of the windows might for a time have even resisted cannon shot. The entrance was secured first by a strong grated door, composed entirely of hammered iron, 
of such ponderous strength as seemed calculated to resist any force that could be brought against it. "'Pinches or four hammers will never pick a pont, said Hugh, the blacksmith of Ringleburn. "'You might as weel batter at it with pipe staples.' Within the doorway, and at the distance of nine feet, which was the solid thickness of the wall, there was a second door of oak, crossed, both breadth and lengthways, with clenched bars of iron, and studied full of broad-headed nails. Besides all these defences, they were by no means confident in the truth of the old dame's assertion that she alone composed the garrison. The more knowing of the party had observed hoof-marks in the track by which they approached the tower, which seemed to indicate that several persons had very lately passed in that direction. To all these difficulties was added their want of means for attacking the place. There was no hope of procuring ladders long enough to reach the battlements, and the windows, besides being very narrow, were secured with iron bars. Scaling was therefore out of the question. Mining was still more so for want of tools and gunpowder. Neither were the besiegers provided with food, means of shelter, or other conveniences, which might have enabled them to convert the siege into a blockade, and there would at any rate have been a risk of relief from some of the marauder's comrades. Hobby grinded and gnashed his teeth, as, walking round the fastness, he could devise no means of making a forcible entry. At length he suddenly exclaimed, "'And what for no do as our fathers did lang syne? Put hand to the work, lads. Let us cup up bushes and briars.' pile them before the door and set fire to them, and smoke that old devil's dam as if she were to be reested for bacon. All immediately closed with this proposal, and some went to work with swords and knives to cut down the alder and hawthorn bushes which grew by the side of the sluggish stream, many of which were sufficiently decayed and dried for their purpose, while others began to collect them in a large stack, properly disposed for burning, as close to the iron grate as they could be piled. Fire was speedily obtained from one of their guns, and Hobby was already advancing to the pile with a kindled brand, when the surly face of the robber and the muzzle of a musketoon were partially shown at a shot-hole which flanked the entrance. "'Mony thanks to you,' he said scoffingly, "'for collecting say muckle winter Ilden for us. But if ye step a foot nearer it with that lunt, it's be the dearest step ye ever made in your days. We'll soon see that.' said Hobby, advancing fearlessly with the torch. The marauder snapped his piece at him, which, fortunately for our honest friend, did not go off, while Ernscliff, firing at the same moment at the narrow aperture and slight mark afforded by the robber's face, grazed the side of his head with a bullet. He had apparently calculated upon his post affording him more security, for he no sooner felt the wound, though a very slight one, than he requested a parley, and demanded to know what they meant by attacking in this fashion a peaceable and honest man, and shedding his blood in that lawless manner. "'We want your prisoner,' said Ermscliff, "'to be delivered up to us in safety.' "'And what concern have you with her?' replied the marauder. "'That,' retorted Ermscliff, "'you, who are detaining her by force, have no right to inquire. "'Ah, weel, I think I can gie a guess,' said the robber. Well, sirs, I am laith to enter into deadly feud with you by spilling ony o' your blood, though Ernscliff has na stop to shed mine, and he can hit a mark to a groat's breath. So, to prevent mere scathe, I am willing to deliver up the prisoner, since nae less will please you. And Hobby's gear, cried Simon of Hackburn, do you think you're to be free to plunder the falds and byres of a gentle Elliot, as if they were an old wife's hen's cavey? "'As I live by bread,' replied Willie of Westburnflat, "'as I live by bread, I have not a single clue to them. "'They're all our the march lang syne. "'There's no a horn o' them about the tower. "'But I'll see what o' them can be gotten back, "'and I'll take this day twa days "'to meet Hobby at the Castleton with twa friends on Ilka side, "'and see to make an agreement about all the rang he can wait me wi.' "'Aye, aye,' said Elliot. That will do weel in yach. And then, aside to his kinsman, Moraine on the gear. Lord's sake, man, say naught about them. Let us but get pair grace out of that old helicat's clutches. Will ye give me your word, Ernscliff? said the marauder, who still lingered at the shot hole. Your faith and troth, with hand and glove, 
that I am free to come and free to go, with five minutes to open the grate and five minutes to steek it and to draw the bolts. Less when I do, for they want cretion sairly. Will you do this? You shall have full time, said Earnscliff. I plight my faith and troth, my hand and my glove. Wait there a moment, then, said Westburnflat, or hear ye. I would rather ye would fall back a pistol shot from the door. It's no that I mistrust your word, Earnscliff, but it's best to be sure. Oh, friend, thought Hobby to himself as he drew back, and I had you but on Turner's home. Note, there is a level meadow on the very margin of the two kingdoms, called Turner's home, just where the brook called Crisop joins the Liddell. It is said to have derived its name as being a place frequently assigned for tourneys during the ancient border times. End note. And naebody by but twa honest lads to see fair play. I would make you wish you had broken your leg ere you had touched beast or body that belonged to me. He has a white feather in his wing, this same Westburn flat, after all, said Simon of Hackburn, somewhat scandalised by his ready surrender. He'll ne'er fill his father's boots. In the meanwhile, the inner door of the tower was opened, and the mother of the freebooter appeared in the space betwixt that and the outer grate. Willie himself was next seen, leading forth a female, and the old woman, carefully bolting the grate behind them, remained on the post as a sort of sentinel. "'Ony in or twa ye come forward,' said the outlaw, "'and take her frae my hand, hale and sound.' Hobby advanced eagerly to meet his betrothed bride. Earnscliff followed more slowly to guard against treachery. Suddenly Hobby slackened his pace in the deepest mortification, while that of Earnscliff was hastened by impatient surprise. It was not Grace Armstrong, but Miss Isabella Vere, whose liberation had been effected by their appearance before the tower. "'Where is Grace? Where is Grace Armstrong?' exclaimed Hobby, in the extremity of wrath and indignation. "'Not in my hands,' answered Westburnflat. "'You may search the tower if you misdoubt me.' "'You false villain! You shall account for her or die on the spot!' said Elliot, presenting his gun. But his companions, who now came up, instantly disarmed him of his weapon, exclaiming all at once, "'Hand and glove! Faith and troth! Odd a care, Hobby, we maun keep our faith wi' Westburn flat, where he the greatest rogue ever rode!' Thus protected, the outlaw recovered his audacity, which had been somewhat daunted by the menacing gesture of Elliot. I have kept my word, sirs, he said, and I look to have nae rang among ye. If this is no the prisoner you sought, he said, addressing Earnscliff, you'll render her back to me again. I am answerable for her to those at Ochter. For God's sake, Mr. Earnscliff, protect me, said Miss Vere, clinging to her deliverer. Do not you abandon one whom the whole world seems to have abandoned? Fear nothing, whispered Earnscliff. I will protect you with my life. Then, turning to Westburnflat, Villain, he said, how dared you to insult this lady? For that matter, Earnscliff, answered the freebooter, I can answer to them that has better right to ask me than you have. But if you come with an armed force, and take her awa from them that her friends lodged her way, how will you answer that? But it's your ain affair. Nay single man can keep a tower against twenty. All the men of the Mearns down a do mair than they do. He lies most falsely, said Isabella. He carried me off by violence from my father. Maybe he only wanted you to think, say, Henny, replied the robber. But it's nae business o' mine. Let it be as it may. So ye winna resign her back to me? Back to you, fellow? Surely no, answered Earnscliff. I will protect Miss Vere, and escort her safely wherever she is pleased to be conveyed. Ay, ay, maybe you and Harry settled that already, said Willie of Westburnflat. And Grace, interrupted Hobby, shaking himself loose from the friends who had been preaching to him the sanctity of the safe conduct, upon the faith of which the freebooter had ventured from his tower. Where's Grace? And he rushed on the marauder, sword in hand. Westburnflat, thus pressed, after calling out, God's sake, Hobby, hear me a glyph, fairly turned his back and fled. His mother stood ready to open and shut the grate, but Hobby struck at the freebooter as he entered with so much force that the sword made a considerable cleft in the lintel of the vaulted door, 
which is still shown as a memorial of the superior strength of those who lived in the days of yore. Ere Hobby could repeat the blow, the door was shut and secured, and he was compelled to retreat to his companions, who were now preparing to break up the siege of Westburn Flat. They insisted upon his accompanying them in their return. "'Ye hae broken truce already,' said old Dick of the Dingle. "'And we take na the better care. "'You'll play mere gowk's tricks "'and make yourself the laughing-stock of the hale country, "'besides having your friends charged with slaughter under trust. "'Bide till the meeting at Castleton, as ye agreed, "'and if he disna make ye amends, "'then we'll hae it out of his heart's blood. "'But let us gang reasonably to work and keep our tryst, "'and I'd warrant we get back grace, and the kye and all. This cold-blooded reasoning went ill down with the unfortunate lover, but as he could only obtain the assistance of his neighbours and kinsmen on their own terms, he was compelled to acquiesce in their notions of good faith and regular procedure. Ernscliffe now requested the assistance of a few of the party to convey Miss Vere to her father's castle of Ellislaw, to which she was peremptory in desiring to be conducted. This was readily granted, and five or six young men agreed to attend him as an escort. Hobby was not of the number. Almost heartbroken by the events of the day and his final disappointment, he returned moodily home to take such measures as he could for the sustenance and protection of his family, and to arrange with his neighbours the farther steps which should be adopted for the recovery of Grace Armstrong. The rest of the party dispersed in different directions as soon as they had crossed the morass. The outlaw and his mother watched them from the tower until they entirely disappeared. End of chapter 9Recording by Gillian Hendry The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott Chapter 10 I left my lady's bower last night. It was clad in wreaths of snow. I'll see it when the sun is bright, and sweet the roses blow. Old Ballad Incensed at what he deemed the coldness of his friends, in a cause which interested him so nearly, Hobby had shaken himself free of their company and was now on his solitary road homeward. "'The fiend found her thee,' said he, as he spurred impatiently his over-fatigued and stumbling horse. "'Thou art like all the rest of them. He had not bred thee, and fed thee, and dressed thee with mine ain hand. And wouldst thou snap her now, and break my neck at my utmost need? But thou art e'en like the lave. The farthest off of them all is my cousin ten times removed, and day or night I would he serve them with my best blood.' and now I think they show mere regard to the common thief of Westburn Flat than to their ain kinsman. But I should see the lights now in Hewfoot. Ways me, he continued, recollecting himself. There will neither coal nor candlelight shine in the Hewfoot ony mare, and it were na for my mother and sisters and poor Grace I could find in my heart to put spurs to the beast and loup o'er the score into the water to make an end o' all. In this disconsolate mood he turned his horse's bridle towards the cottage in which his family had found refuge. As he approached the door he heard whispering and tittering amongst his sisters. "'The devils in the women,' said poor Hobby. "'They would nicker and laugh and giggle if their best friend was lying a corp. And yet I am glad they can keep up their hearts, say weel, poor silly things. But the dirdum falls on me, to be sure, and no on them.' While he thus meditated, he was engaged in fastening up his horse in a shed. "'Thou mun do without horse-sheet and sursinga now, lad,' he said, addressing the animal. "'You and me he had a down come alike. We had better he fawn i the deepest pulley taras. He was interrupted by the youngest of his sisters, who came running out, and speaking in a constrained voice, as if to stifle some emotion, called out to him, "'What are you doing there, Hobby? Fiddling about the nag!' "'and there's yon fi Cumberland been waiting here for ye this hour and mare. "'Haste ye in, man. I'll take off the saddle.' "'Yon fi Cumberland!' exclaimed Elliot, "'and putting the bridle of his horse into the hand of his sister, "'he rushed into the cottage. "'Where is he? Where is he?' 
he exclaimed, glancing eagerly around, and seeing only females. Did he bring news of Grace? It doubt abide an instant langer, said the elder sister, still with a suppressed laugh. Hoot fie, bairns, said the old lady, with something of a good-humoured reproof. You shouldn't have vex your billy hobby that way. Look round, my bairn, and see if there isna in here mair than you left this morning. Hobby looked eagerly round. There's you, and the three titties. There's four of us now, hobby lad, said the youngest, who at this moment entered. In an instant, Hobby had in his arms Grace Armstrong, who, with one of his sister's plaids around her, had passed unnoticed at his first entrance. "'How dared you do this?' said Hobby. "'It was not my fault,' said Grace, endeavouring to cover her face with her hands, to hide at once her blushes, and escape the storm of hearty kisses with which her bridegroom punished her simple stratagem. "'It was not my fault, Hobby. You should kiss Jeanie and the rest of them.' for they hae the white tot. And so I will, said Hobby, and embraced and kissed his sisters and grandmother a hundred times, while the whole party half laughed, half cried, in the extremity of their joy. I am the happiest man, said Hobby, throwing himself down on a seat, almost exhausted. I am the happiest man in the world. Then, O oh my dear bairn, said the good old dame, who lost no opportunity of teaching her lesson of religion, at those moments when the heart was best open to receive it. Then, O oh my son, give praise to him that brings smiles out of tears and joy out of grief, as he brought light out of darkness and the world out of Nathan. Was it not my word that if you could say his will be done, you might he cause to say his name be praised? It was, it was your word, Granny, and I do praise him for his mercy and for leaving me a good parent when my ain were gan said honest Hobby, taking her hand. That puts me in mind to think of him, both in happiness and distress. There was a solemn pause of one or two minutes employed in the exercise of mental devotion, which expressed in purity and sincerity the gratitude of the affectionate family to that providence who had unexpectedly restored to their embraces the friend whom they had lost. Hobby's first inquiries were concerning the adventures which Grace had undergone. They were told at length, but amounted in substance to this, that she was awaked by the noise which the ruffians made in breaking into the house, and by the resistance made by one or two of the servants, which was soon overpowered, that dressing herself hastily, she ran downstairs, and having seen in the scuffle Westburn Flat's wizard drop off, imprudently named him by his name, and besought him for mercy, that the ruffian instantly stopped her mouth, dragged her from the house, and placed her on horseback behind one of his associates. "'I'll break the accursed neck of him,' said Hobby, "'if there were no other Graham in the land but himself.' She proceeded to say that she was carried southward along with the party, and the spoil which they drove before them, until they had crossed the border. Suddenly a person, known to her as a kinsman of Westburn Flat, came riding very fast after the marauders, and told their leader that his cousin had learnt from a sure hand that no luck would come of it, unless the lass was restored to her friends. After some discussion, the chief of the party seemed to acquiesce. Grace was placed behind her new guardian, who pursued in silence, and with great speed, the least frequented path to the Hewfoot, and ere evening closed, set down the fatigued and terrified damsel within a quarter of a mile of the dwelling of her friends. Merry and sincere were the congratulations which passed on all sides. As these emotions subsided, less pleasing considerations began to intrude themselves. "'This is a miserable place for ye all,' said Hobby, looking round him. "'I can sleep weel in yach mysel out by beside the naig, as I hae done mony a lang night on the hills. But how ye are to put yourselves up, I canna see. And what's war, I canna mend it. And what's war than all, the morn may come, and the day after that, without your being a bit better off.' It was a cowardly cruel thing, said one of the sisters, looking round, to harry a poor family to the bare walls this gate. And leave us neither stirk nor stot, said the youngest brother, who now entered, nor sheep nor lamb, nor aught that eats grass and corn. If they had ony quarrel wi' us, said Harry the second brother, were we not ready to have fought it out, 
and that we should have been odd for hame too, yen and all upon the hill. Odd, and we had been at hame, Will Graham's stomach shouldn't he wanted its morning. But it's biding him, is it no, Hobby? Our neighbours had taen a day at the Castleton to gree wi' him at the sight o' men, said Hobby mournfully. They behoved to have it o' their ain gate, or there was nae help to be got at their hands. To gree wi' him? exclaimed both his brothers at once. After siccan an act o' stouth rife, as hasna been heard in the country since the old riding days. Very true, Billies, and my blood was e'en boiling at it, but the sight o' Grace Armstrong has settled it brawly. But the stocking, Hobby, said John Elliot, we're utterly ruined. Harry and I he been to gather what was on the outby land, and there's scarce a clout left. I ken na how we're to carry on. We maun all gang to the wars, I think. Westburn Flat has na the means, e'en if he had the will, to make up our loss. There's nae mens to be got out o' him, but what ye take out o' his banes. He has na a four-footed creature but the vicious blood thing he rides on, and that's sair trashed wi' his night work. We are ruined stoop and roop. Hobby cast a mournful glance on Grace Armstrong, who returned it with a downcast look and a gentle sigh. Dinna be cast down, bairns, said the grandmother. We hae good friends that winna forsake us in adversity. There's Sir Thomas Kittleoof, is my third cousin by the mother's side, and he has come by a hantle siller, and been made a knight baronet into the bargain, for being yenny the commissioners at the union. He would na gie a bodle to save us fae famishing, said Hobby, and if he did, the bread that I bought wait would stick in my throat when I thought it was part of the price of pair old Scotland's crown and independence. There's the Laird of Dunder, yen of the oldest families of Tiviotdale. He's in the tall booth, mother. He's in the heart of Midloudon, for a thousand merk he borrowed from Saunders Wileycoat, the writer. Poor man, exclaimed Mrs. Elliot. Can we no send him something, Hobby? Ye forget, Granny, ye forget we want help ourselves said Hobby, somewhat peevishly. Truth did I, Henny, replied the good-natured lady, just at the instant. It's so natural to think on yin's blood relations before themselves. But there's young Ernscliff. He has our little his ain, and sick in a name to keep up, it would be a shame, said Hobby, to burden him wi' our distress. And I'll tell you, Granny, it's needless to sit rhyming o'er the style o' your kith, kin, and allies, as if there was a charm in their braw names to do us good. The grandies ain't forgotten us, and those of rain degree, they just little enough to gang on with themselves, near a friend hae we that can or will help us to stop the farm again. Then, Hobby, we maun trust in him that can raise up friends and fortune out of the bare moor, as they say. Hobby sprung upon his feet. Ye are right, Granny, he exclaimed. Ye are right. I do ken a friend on the bare moor that baith can and will help us. The turns of this day he dung my head clean hurdy-gurdy. I left as muckle gowd lying in Mucklestain Moor this morning as would plenish the house and stock the hew foot twice hour, and I am certain sure Elshie wouldn't grudge us the use of it. Elshie? said his grandmother in astonishment. What Elshie do you mean? What Elshie should I mean but canny Elshie, the white o' Mucklestain, replied Hobby. God forfend my bairn. You should gang to fetch water out of broken cisterns, or, or seek for relief frae them that deal with the evil one. There was never luck in their gifts, nor grace in their paths, and the hale country kens that body Elshie's an unco man. Oh, if there was the law, and the douce quiet administration of justice, that makes a kingdom flourish in righteousness, the like o' them soon be suffered to live. The wizard and the witch are the abomination and the evil thing in the land. Troth, mother, answered Hobby, ye may say what ye like, but I am in the mind that witches and warlocks have nae half the power they had lang syne. At least, sure am I that A. Ildeviser, like old Elslaw, or A. Eldur, like that D. Blank D. villain, Westburn Flat, is a greater plague and abomination in a countryside than a hale curney with the worst witches that ever capered on a broomstick, or played cantrips on faster zine. It would have been lang, or else she had burnt down my house and barns, and I am determined to try if he will do aught to build them up again. He's weel kenned a skilful man, o'er all the country, 
as far as Bruff understand more. Bide a wee, my bairn. Mind his benefits have nae thriven wi abody. Jack Howden died o' the very same disorder Elshie pretended to cure him of, about the fall o' the leaf. And though he helped lamb's sides cow wheel out o' the moor hill, yet the loupin hill's been sairer amin his sheep than ony season before. And then I have heard he uses sick words abusing human nature that's like a fleeing in the face of providence. And you mind you said yourself, the first time you ever saw him, that he was mere like a bogle than a living thing. Hoot, mother, said Hobby, else she's no that bad a chill. He's a gruesome spectacle for a crooked disciple, to be sure, and a rough talker, but his bark is war than his bite. Say, if I had yin something to eat, for I haven't had a morsel o'er my throat this day, I would streak myself down for twa or three hours aside the beast, and be on in a wa to Mucklestain with the first grey morning. Oh, what for no the night, Hobby? said Harry, and I will ride wi ye. My nag is tired, said Hobby. Ye won't take mine then, said John. But I am a wee thing wearied mysel. You wearied, said Harry. Shame on ye. I've kenned ye keep the saddle four and twenty hours together, and there sick a word as weariness in your wame. The night's very dark, said Hobby, rising and looking through the casement of the cottage. And to speak truth, and shame the deal, though Elshie's a real honest fellow, yet some gait I would rather take daylight wi' me when I gang to visit him. This frank avowal put a stop to further argument, and Hobby, having thus compromised matters between the rashness of his brother's counsel and the timid cautions which he received from his grandmother, refreshed himself with such food as the cottage afforded, and after a cordial salutation all round, retired to the shed and stretched himself beside his trusted palfrey. His brothers shared between them some trusses of clean straw, disposed in the stall usually occupied by old Annapole's cow, and the females arranged themselves for repose as well as the accommodations of the cottage would permit. With the first dawn of morning, Hobby arose, and having rubbed down and saddled his horse, he set forth to Mucklestane Moor. He avoided the company of either of his brothers, from an idea that the dwarf was most propitious to those who visited him alone. The creature, said he to himself as he went along, is no neighbourly. A buddy at a time is fully mere than he weel can abide. I wonder if he's looked out of the crib with him to gather up the bag of siller. If he hasn't done that, it will have been a braw windfall for somebody, and I'll be finely flung. Come, Taras, said he to his horse, striking him at the same time with his spur. Make me a fit man. We maun be first on the field if we can. He was now on the heath, which began to be illuminated by the beams of the rising sun. The gentle declivity which he was descending presented him a distinct, though distant, view of the dwarf's dwelling. The door opened, and Hobby witnessed with his own eyes that phenomenon which he had frequently heard mentioned. Two human figures, if that of the dwarf could be termed such, issued from the solitary abode of the recluse, and stood as if in converse together in the open air. The taller form then stooped, as if taking something up which lay beside the door of the hut, then both moved forward a little way, and again halted, as in deep conference. All Hobby's superstitious terrors revived on witnessing the spectacle. That the dwarf would open his dwelling to a mortal guest was as improbable as that any one would choose voluntarily to be his nocturnal visitor and under full conviction that he beheld a wizard holding intercourse with his familiar spirit, Hobby pulled in at once his breath and his bridle, resolved not to incur the indignation of either by a hasty intrusion on their conference. They were probably aware of his approach, for he had not halted for a moment before the dwarf returned to his cottage, and the taller figure who had accompanied him glided round the enclosure of the garden, and seemed to disappear from the eyes of the admiring Hobby. So ever mortal the like o' that, said Elliot. But my case is desperate, say, and he were bales above himself, I's ventured down the brae on him. Yet, notwithstanding his assumed courage, he slackened his pace, when, nearly upon the very spot where he had last seen the tall figure, he discerned, as if lurking among the long heather, a small, black, rough-looking object, like a terrier dog. He has nae dog ever I heard of, said Hobby 
but mony a deal about his hand. Lord, forgive me for saying sick a word. It keeps its grund, be what it like. I'm judging it's a badger, but wha kens what shapes they bogies will take to fright a body. It will maybe start up like a lion or a crocodile when I come nearer. I zeen driven a stage at it, for if it change its shape while I'm our near, Taras will never stand it, and it will be our muckle to hae him and the deal to fight with baith at once. He therefore cautiously threw a stone at the object, which continued motionless. It's na living thing, after all, said Hobby, approaching, but the very bag of siller he flung out of the window yesterday. And that other queer lang creature has just brought it sae muckle further on the way to me. He then advanced and lifted the heavy fur pouch, which was quite full of gold. Mercy on us, said Hobby, whose heart fluttered between glee at the revival of his hopes and prospects in life, and suspicion of the purpose for which this assistance was afforded him. Mercy on us, it's an awful thing to touch what has been so lately in the claws of something no canny. I canna shake myself loose of the belief that there has been some jukery pokery of Satan's in all this but I am determined to conduct myself like an honest man and a good Christian, come what what will. He advanced accordingly to the cottage door, and having knocked repeatedly without receiving any answer, he at length elevated his voice and addressed the inmate of the hut. Elshie! Father Elshie! I ken you're within doors and walking, for I saw you at the door cheek as I come o'er the bent. Will you come out and speak just a glyph to yin that has mony thanks to gie you? It was all true you telled me about Westburn Flat, but he sent back Grace, safe and scathless. Say there's na ill happened yet, but what may be suffered or sustained. Would you but come out a glyph, man? Or but say you're listening? Ah, weel. Since you winna answer, I zeen proceed with my tale. You see, I hae been thinking it would be a sair thing on twa young folk, like Grace and me, to put off our marriage for mony years till I was abroad and came back again with some gear. And they say folk munna take booty in the wars as they did lang syne, and the Queen's pay is a small matter. There's nae gathering gear on that. And then my grand dame's auld, and my sisters would sit pingin' at the ingleside, for want of me to ding them about, and Ernscliff, or the neighbourhood, or maybe your ainsel, Elshie, might want some good turn that Hob Elliot could do you. And it's a pity that the old house of the Hewfoot should be wrecked altogether. Say, I was thinking, but deal, Hamie, that I should say so, continued he, checking himself. If I can bring myself to ask a favour of yin that wouldn't say muckle as wear a word on me, to tell me if he hears me speaking to them. Say what thou wilt, do what thou wilt, answered the dwarf from his cabin. But be gone, and leave me at peace. Weel, weel, replied Elliot. Since you are willing to hear me, as make my tale short, since you are so kind as to say you are content to lend me as muckle siller as will stock and plenish the hewfoot, I am content on my part to accept the courtesy with mony kind thanks, and troth I think it will be as safe in my hands as yours, if you leave it flung about in that gate for the first loon body to lift, for by the risky bad neighbours that can win through steek at doors and lock fast places, as I can tell to my cost. I say, since you hae same muckle consideration for me, as be blithe to accept your kindness, and my mother and me, she's a life renter, and I am fear the lands are wide open, would grant you a wadsit, or a heritable bond, for the siller, and to pay the annual rent half yearly, and Saunders Wiley coat to draw the bond, and you to be at nae charge with the writings. Cut short thy jargon, and be gone, said the dwarf. Thy loquacious, bull-headed honesty makes thee a more intolerable plague than the light-fingered courtier who would take a man's all without troubling him with either thanks, explanation, or apology. Hence, I say, thou art one of those tame slaves whose word is as good as their bond. Keep the money, principal and interest, until I demand it of thee. But, continued the pertinacious borderer, we are all lifelike and death-like, Elshie, and there really should be some black and white on this transaction. So just make me a minute, or missive, in only form you like, and I's write it fair hour, and subscribe it before famous witnesses. Only, Elshie, I would wuss you to put Nathan in't that may be prejudicial to my salvation, for I'll hae the minister to read it hour, 
and it would only be exposing yourself to nae purpose. And now I'm ganging a wall, for you'll be wearied in my cracks, and I'm wearied with cracking without an answer. And I's bring ye a bit of bride's cake ye they days, and maybe bring Grace to see you. You would like to see Grace, man, for as dour as ye are. Ail hord, I wish he may be weel, that was a sair grain. Or maybe he thought I was speaking of heavenly grace, and no of Grace Armstrong. Poor man, I am very doubtful of his condition, but I am sure he is as kind to me as if I were his son, and a queer-looking father I would he had, if that had been e'en say. Hobby now relieved his benefactor of his presence, and rode blithely home to display his treasure, and consult upon the means of repairing the damage which his fortune had sustained through the aggression of the Red Reaver of Westburnflat. End of chapter 10「Eleven of the Black Dwarf」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott Chapter Eleven Three ruffians seized me yestermorn. Alas, a maiden most forlorn. They choked my cries with wicked might, and bound me on a palfrey white. As sure as heaven shall pity me, I cannot tell what men they be. Christabel The course of our story must here revert a little, to deal the circumstances which had placed Miss Vere in the unpleasant situation from which she was unexpectedly, and indeed unintentionally liberated, by the appearance of Earnscliff and Elliot, with their friends and followers, before the tower of Westburnflat. On the morning preceding the night in which Hobie's house was plundered and burnt, Miss Vere was requested by her father to accompany him in a walk through a distant part of the romantic grounds which lay round his castle of Ellerslaw. To hear was to obey, in the true style of oriental despotism, but Isabella trembled in silence while she followed her father through rough paths, now winding by the side of the river, now ascending the cliffs which serve for its banks. A single servant, selected perhaps for his stupidity, was the only person who attended them. From her father's silence, Isabella little doubted that he had chosen this distant and sequestered scene to resume the argument which they had so frequently maintained upon the subject of Sir Frederick's addresses, and that he was meditating in what manner he should most effectually impress upon her the necessity of receiving him as her suitor. But her fears seemed for some time to be unfounded. The only sentences which her father from time to time addressed to her respected the beauties of the romantic landscapes through which they strolled, and which varied its features at every step. To these observations, although they seemed to come from a heart occupied by more gloomy as well as more important cares, Isabella endeavoured to answer in a manner as free and unconstrained as it was possible for her to assume, amid the involuntary apprehensions which crowded upon her imagination. Sustaining with mutual difficulty a desultory conversation, they at length gained the centre of a small wood, composed of large oaks, intermingled with birches, mountain ashes, hazel, holly, and a variety of underwood. The boughs of the tall trees met closely above, and the underwood filled up each interval between their trunks below. The spot on which they stood was rather more open, still, however, embowered under the natural arcade of tall trees and darkened on the sides for a space round by a great and lively growth of copsewood and bushes. "'And here, Isabella,' said Mr. Vere, as he pursued the conversation, so often resumed, so often dropped, "'here I would erect an altar to friendship.' "'To friendship, sir?' said Miss Vere. "'And why on this gloomy and sequestered spot, rather than elsewhere?' "'Oh, the propriety of the locale is easily vindicated,' replied her father with a sneer. You know, Miss Vere, for you, I am well aware, are a learned young lady, you know that the Romans were not satisfied with embodying, for the purpose of worship, each useful quality and moral virtue to which they could give a name. But they, moreover, worshipped the same under each variety of titles and attributes which could give a distinct shade, or individual character, to the virtue in question. Now, for example, the friendship to whom a temple should be here dedicated is not masculine friendship, which abhors and despises duplicity, art, and disguise, but female friendship, which consists in little else than a mutual disposition on the part of the friends, as they call themselves, 
to abet each other in obscure fraud and petty intrigue. "'You are severe, sir,' said Miss Vere. "'Only just,' said her father. "'A humbler copy I am from nature, with the advantage of contemplating two such excellent studies as Lucy Ilderton and yourself. "'If I have been unfortunate enough to offend, sir, I can conscientiously excuse Miss Eiderton from being either my consular or confidant.' "'Indeed! How came you, then?' said Mr. Vere. "'By the flippancy of speech and pertness of argument, "'by which you have disgusted Sir Frederick, "'and given me of late such deep offence. "'If my manner has been so unfortunate as to displease you, sir, "'it is impossible for me to apologize too deeply, or too sincerely. "'But I cannot confess the same contrition "'for having answered Sir Frederick flippantly when he pressed me rudely. "'Since he forgot I was a lady,' It was time to show him that I am at least a woman. Reserve, then, your pertness for those who press you on the topic, Isabella, said her father coldly. For my part, I am weary of the subject, and will never speak upon it again. God bless you, my dear father, said Isabella, seizing his reluctant hand. There is nothing you can impose on me, save the task of listening to this man's persecution, that I will call, or think, a hardship." "'You are very obliging, Miss Vere, when it happens to suit you to be dutiful,' said her unrelenting father, forcing himself at the same time from the affectionate grasp of her hand. "'But henceforth, child, I shall save myself the trouble of offering you unpleasant advice on any topic. You must look to yourself.' At this moment four ruffians rushed upon them. Mr. Vere and his servant drew their hangers, which it was of the fashion of the time to wear, and attempted to defend themselves and protect Isabella but while each of them was engaged by an antagonist, she was forced into the thicket by the two remaining villains, who placed her and themselves on horses which stood ready behind the copsewood. They mounted at the same time, and placing her between them, set off at a round gallop, holding the reins of her horse on each side. By many an obscure and winding path, over dale and down, through moss and moor, she was conveyed to the tower of Westburnflat, where she remained strictly watched, but not otherwise ill-treated under the guardianship of the old woman, to whose son that retreat belonged. No entreaties could prevail upon the hag to give Miss Vere any information on the object of her being carried forcibly off and confined in this secluded place. The arrival of Earnscliff with a strong party of horsemen before the tower alarmed the robber. As he had already directed Grace Armstrong to be restored to her friends, it did not occur to him that this unwelcome visit was on her account, and seeing at the head of the party, Earnscliff, whose attachment to Miss Vere was whispered in the county, he doubted not that her liberation was the sole object of the attack upon his fastness. The dread of personal consequences compelled him to deliver up his prisoner in the manner we have already related. At the moment the tramp of horses was heard which carried off the daughter of Ellenslaw, her father fell to the earth, and his servant, a stout young fellow, who was gaining ground on the ruffian with whom he had been engaged, left the combat to come to his master's assistance, little doubting that he had received a mortal wound. Both the villains immediately desisted from further combat, and retreated into the thicket, mounted their horses, and went off at full speed after their companions. Meanwhile, Dixon had the satisfaction to find Mr. Vere not only alive, but unwounded. He had overreached himself, and stumbled, it seemed, over the root of a tree, in making too eager a blow at his antagonist. The despair he felt at his daughter's disappearance was, in Dixon's phrase, such as would have melted the heart of a wane stain, and he was so much exhausted by his feelings, and the vain researches which he made to discover the track of the ravishers, that a considerable time elapsed ere he reached home, and communicated the alarm to his domestic. All his conduct and gestures were those of a desperate man. "'Speak not to me, Sir Frederick,' he said impatiently. "'You are no father. She was my child. An ungrateful one, I fear, but still my child. My only child.' Where is Miss Eiderton? She must know something of this. It corresponds with what I was informed of her schemes. Go, Dixon. Call Ratcliffe here. Let him come without a minute's delay. The person he had named at this moment entered the room. I say, Dixon, continued Mr. Vere in an altered tone, let Mr. Ratcliffe know I beg the favor of his company on particular business. Ah, my dear sir, he proceeded, as if noticing him for the first time, you are the very man whose advice can be of the utmost service to me in this cruel extremity. What has happened, Mr. Vere, to discompose you? said Mr. Ratcliffe, gravely. 
and while the laird of Eisenslaw details to him, with the most animated gestures of grief and indignation, the singular adventure of the morning, we shall take the opportunity to inform our readers of the relative circumstances in which these gentlemen stood to each other. In his early youth, Mr. Vere of Ellislaw had been remarkable for a career of dissipation, which, in advanced life, he had exchanged for the no less destructive career of dark and turbulent ambition. In both cases he had gratified the predominant passion without respect to the diminution of his private fortune, although, where such inducements were wanting, he was deemed close, avaricious, and grasping. His affairs being much embarrassed by his earlier extravagance, he went to England, where he was understood to have formed a very advantageous matrimonial connection. He was many years absent from his family estate. Suddenly and unexpectedly, he returned, a widower, bringing with him his daughter, then a girl of about ten years old. From this moment his expense seemed unbounded in the eyes of the simple inhabitants of his native mountains. It was supposed he must necessarily have plunged himself deeply in debt. Yet he continued to live in the same lavish expense, until some months before the commencement of our narrative, when the public opinion of his embarrassed circumstances was confirmed by the residence of Mr. Ratcliffe at Ellislaw Castle, who, by the tacit consent, though obviously to the great displeasure of the lord of the mansion, seemed, from the moment of his arrival, to assume and exercise a predominant and unaccountable influence in the management of his private affairs. Mr. Ratcliffe was a grave, steady, reserved man, in an advanced period of life. To those with whom he had occasion to speak upon business, he appeared uncommonly well versed in all its forms. With others he held little communication, but in any casual intercourse or conversation displayed the powers of an active and well-informed mind. For some time before taking up his final residence at the castle, he had been an occasional visitor there, and was at such times treated by Mr. Vere, contrary to his general practice towards those who were inferior to him in rank, with marked attention, and even deference. Yet his arrival always appeared to be an embarrassment to his host, and his departure a relief, so that, when he became a constant inmate of the family, it was impossible not to observe indications of the displeasure with which Mr. Vere regarded his presence. Indeed, their intercourse formed a singular mixture of confidence and constraint. Mr. Vere's most important affairs were regulated by Mr. Radcliffe, and though he was none of those indulgent men of fortune, who, too indolent to manage their own business, are glad to devolve it upon another, yet, in many instances, he was observed to give up his own judgment, and submit to the contrary opinions which Mr. Radcliffe did not hesitate distinctly to express. Nothing seemed to vex Mr. Vere more than when strangers indicated any observation of the state of tutelage under which he appeared to labor. When it was noticed by Sir Frederick, or any of his intimates, he sometimes repelled their remarks haughtily and indignantly, and sometimes endeavored to evade them, by saying, with a forced laugh, that Ratcliffe knew his own importance, but that he was the most honest and skillful fellow in the world, and that it would be impossible for him to manage his English affairs without his advice and assistance. Such was the person who entered the room at the moment Mr. Vere was summoning him to his presence, and who now heard with surprise, mingled with obvious incredulity, the hasty narrative of what had befallen Isabella. Her father concluded, addressing Sir Frederick and the other gentlemen who stood around in astonishment, "'And now, my friends, you see the most unhappy father in Scotland. Lend me your assistance, gentlemen. Give me your advice, Mr. Radcliffe. I am incapable of acting or thinking under the unexpected violence of such a blow. Let us take our horses, call our attendants, and scour the country in pursuit of the villains, said Sir Frederick. Is there no one whom you can suspect, said Ratcliffe, gravely, of having some motive for this strange crime? These are not the days of romance when ladies are carried off merely for their beauty. I fear, said Mr. Vere, I can too well account for this strange incident. Read this letter which Miss Lucy Eiderton thought fit to address from her house in Illeslaw to young Mr. Earnscliffe, whom, of all men, I have a hereditary right to call my enemy. You see, she writes to him as the confidant of a passion which he has the assurance to entertain for my daughter, tells him she serves his cause with her friend very ardently, but that he has a friend in the garrison who serves him yet more effectually. Look particularly at the penciled passages, Mr. Radcliffe, where this meddling girl recommends bold measures, with an assurance that his suit would be successful anywhere beyond the bounds of the barony of Ellislaw. "'And you argue, from this romantic letter of a very romantic young lady, Mr. Vere,' said Radcliffe, 
that young Ernscliffe has carried off your daughter, and committed a very great and criminal act of violence, on no better advice and assurance than that of Miss Lucy Eiderton? What else can I think? said Ellislaw. What else can you think? said Sir Frederick. Or who else could have any motive for committing such a crime? Were that the best mode of fixing the guilt, said Mr. Radcliffe calmly, there might easily be pointed out persons to whom such actions are more congenial, and who have also sufficient motives of instigation. Supposing it were judged advisable to remove Miss Vere to some place in which constraint might be exercised upon her inclinations to a degree which cannot at present be attempted under the roof of Ellislaw Castle. What says Sir Frederick Langley to that supposition? I say, returned Sir Frederick, that although Mr. Vere may choose to endure in Mr. Radcliffe freedoms totally inconsistent with his situation in life, I will not permit such license of innuendo, by word or look, to be extended to me with impunity. And I say, said young Marischal of Marischal Wells, who was also a guest at the castle, that you are all stark mad to be standing wrangling here, instead of going in pursuit of the ruffians. I have ordered off the domestics already in the track most likely to overtake them, said Mr. Vere. If you will favor me with your company, we will follow them and assist in the search. The effects of the party were totally unsuccessful, probably because Ellislaw directed the pursuit to proceed in the direction of Earnscliff Tower, under the supposition that the owner would prove to be the author of the violence, so that they followed a direction diametrically opposite to that in which the ruffians had actually proceeded. In the evening they returned, harassed and out of spirits. But other guests had, in the meantime, arrived at the castle, and after the recent loss sustained by the owner had been related, wondered at, and lamented, the recollection of it was, for the moment, drowned in the discussion of deep political intrigues, of which the crisis and explosion were momentarily looked for. Several of the gentlemen who took part in this divan were Catholics, and all of them staunch Jacobites, whose hopes were at present at the highest pitch, as an invasion, in favor of the pretender, was daily expected from France, which Scotland, between the defenseless state of its garrisons and fortified places, and the general disaffection of the inhabitants, was rather prepared to welcome than to resist. Ratcliffe, who neither sought to assist at their consultations on this subject, nor was invited to do so, had, in the meanwhile, retired to his own apartment. Miss Eiderton was sequestered from society in a sort of honorable confinement, until, said Mr. Vere, she should be safely conveyed home to her father's house an opportunity for which occurred on the following day. The domestics could not help thinking it remarkable how soon the loss of Miss Vere, and the strange manner in which it had happened, seemed to be forgotten by the other guests at the castle. They knew not that those the most interested in her fate were well acquainted with the cause of her being carried off, and the place of her retreat, and that the others, in the anxious and doubtful moments which preceded the breaking forth of a conspiracy, were little accessible to any feelings, but what arose immediately out of their own machinations. End of chapter 11 Recording by Todd Chapter 12 of The Black Dwarf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE BLACK DWARF by Sir Walter Scott CHAPTER Twelve. Some one way, some another. Do you know where we may apprehend her? The researches after Miss Vere were, for the sake of appearances perhaps, resumed on the succeeding day, with similar bad success, and the party were returning towards Ellislaw in the evening. It is singular, said Marachal to Ratcliffe, that four horsemen and a female prisoner should have passed through the country without leaving the slightest trace of their passage. One would think they had traversed the air, or sunk through the ground. Men may often, answered Ratcliffe, arrive at the knowledge of that which is, from discovering that which is not. We have now scoured every road, path, and track leading from the castle, in all the various points of the compass, saving only that intricate and difficult pass which leads southward down the Westburn, and through the morasses. And why have we not examined that? said Marichal. Oh, Mr. Vere can best answer that question, replied his companion dryly. Then I will ask it instantly, said Marichal, and addressing Mr. Vere. I am informed, sir, said he, there is a path we have not examined, leading by Westburn Flat. 
Oh, said Sir Frederick, laughing, we know the owner of Westburn Flat well, a wild lad that knows little difference between his neighbor's goods and his own, but, withal, very honest to his principles. He would disturb nothing belonging to Ellislaw. Besides, said Mr. Vere, smiling mysteriously, he had other toe on his distaff last night. Have you not heard young Elliot of the Hoofoot has had his house burnt and his cattle driven away? because he refused to give up his arms to some honest men that think of starting for the king? The company smiled upon each other, as at hearing of an exploit which favoured their own views. Yet nevertheless, resumed Marischal, I think we ought to ride in this direction also, otherwise we shall certainly be blamed for our negligence. No reasonable objection could be offered to this proposal, and the party turned their horses' heads toward Westburn Flat. They had not proceeded very far in that direction when the trampling of horses was heard, and a small body of riders were perceived advancing to meet them. "'Here comes Earnscliffe,' said Marischal. "'I know his bright bay with the star on his front.' "'And there is my daughter among them!' exclaimed Vere furiously. "'Who shall call my suspicions false or injurious now? Gentlemen, friends, lend me the assistance of your swords for the recovery of my child!' He unsheathed his weapon, and was imitated by Sir Frederick and several of the party, who prepared to charge those that were advancing towards them. But the greater part hesitated. "'They come to us in all peace and security,' said Marischal Wells. "'Let us first hear what account they give of this mysterious affair. If Miss Vere has sustained the slightest insult or injury from Earnscliffe, I will be first to revenge her. But let us hear what they say.' "'You do me wrong by your suspicions, Marischal,' continued Vere. You are the last I would have expected to hear express them. You injure yourself, Ellislaw, by your violence, though the cause may excuse it. He then advanced a little before the rest, and called out with a loud voice, Stand, Mr. Earnscliffe, or do you and Miss Vere advance alone to meet us? You are charged with having carried that lady off from her father's house, and we are here in arms to shed our best blood for her recovery, and for bringing to justice those who have injured her. "'And who would do that more willingly than I, Mr. Marischal? said Earnscliffe haughtily, "'than I, who had the satisfaction this morning to liberate her from the dungeon in which I found her confined, "'and who am now escorting her back to the castle of Ellislaw?' "'Is this so, Miss Vere? said Marischal. "'It is,' answered Isabel eagerly. "'It is so. For heaven's sake, sheathe your swords. "'I will swear by all that is sacred that I was carried off by ruffians.' whose persons and objects were alike unknown to me, and am now restored to freedom by means of this gentleman's gallant interference. By whom and wherefore could this have been done? pursued Marischal. Had you no knowledge of the place to which you were conveyed? Earnscliffe, where did you find this lady? But ere either question could be answered, Ellislaw advanced, and, returning his sword to the scabbard, cut short the conference. When I know, he said, Exactly how much I owe to Mr. Earnscliffe, he may rely on suitable acknowledgments. Meantime, taking the bridle of Miss Vere's horse, thus far I thank him for replacing my daughter in the power of her natural guardian. A sullen bend of the head was returned by Earnscliffe with equal haughtiness, and Ellislaw, turning back with his daughter upon the road to his own house, appeared engaged with her in a conference so earnest that the rest of the company judged it improper to intrude by approaching them too nearly. In the meantime, Earnscliffe, as he took leave of the other gentlemen belonging to Ellislaw's party, said aloud, Although I am unconscious of any circumstance in my conduct that can authorize such a suspicion, I cannot but observe that Mr. Vere seems to believe that I have had some hand in the atrocious violence which has been offered to his daughter. I request you, gentlemen, to take notice of my explicit denial of a charge so dishonorable, and that, although I can pardon the bewildering feelings of a father in such a moment, yet, if any other gentleman, he looked hard at Sir Frederick Langley, thinks my word and that of Miss Vere, with the evidence of my friends who accompany me, too slight for my exculpation, I will be happy, most happy, to repel the charge, as becomes a man who counts his honour dearer than his life. And I'll be his second, said Simon of Hackburn, and take up any twa of ye, gentle or simple, laird or lawn. It's a ain to Simon. Who is that rough-looking fellow? said Sir Frederick Langley. And what has he to do with the quarrels of gentlemen? I's be a lad for the high to it, said Simon. And I's a quarrel with anybody I like, except the king or the laird I live under. 
Come, said Marichal, let us have no brawls. Mr. Ernstcliffe, although we do not think alike in some things, I trust we may be opponents, even enemies, if fortune will have it so, without losing our respect for birth, fair play, and each other. I will leave you as innocent of this matter as I am myself, and I will pledge myself that my cousin Ellislaw, as soon as the perplexity attending these sudden events has left his judgment to its free exercise, shall handsomely acknowledge the very important service you have this day rendered him. To have served your cousin is a sufficient reward in itself. Good evening, gentlemen, continued Ernscliffe. I see most of your party are already on their way to Ellislaw. Then saluting Marichal with courtesy, and the rest of the party with indifference, Ernscliffe turned his horse and rode towards the hillfoot, to concert measures with Hobie Elliot for further researches after his bride, of whose restoration to her friends he was still ignorant. "'There he goes,' said Marichal. "'He is a fine, gallant young fellow, upon my soul, and yet I should like well to have a thrust with him on the green turf. I was reckoned at college nearly his equal with the foils, and I should like to try him at Sharp's.' "'In my opinion,' answered Sir Frederick Langley, "'we have done very ill in having suffered him, and those men who are with him to go off without taking away their arms, for the Whigs are very likely to draw to a head under such a sprightly young fellow as that. For shame, Sir Frederick, exclaimed Marichal. Do you think that Ellislaw could, in honour, consent to any violence being offered to Earnscliff, when he entered his bounds only to bring back his daughter? Or, if he were to be of your opinion, do you think that I, and the rest of these gentlemen, would disgrace ourselves by assisting in such a transaction? no no fair play in old scotland for ever when the sword is drawn i will be as ready to use it as any man but while it is in the sheath let us behave like gentlemen and neighbours soon after this colloquy they reached the castle when ellislaw who had been arrived a few minutes before met them in the courtyard how is miss vere and have you learned the cause of her being carried off asked marichal hastily she is retired to her apartment greatly fatigued and I cannot expect much light upon her adventure till her spirits are somewhat recruited, replied her father. She and I were not the less obliged to you, Marichal, and to my other friends, for their kind inquiries. But I must suppress the father's feelings for a while to give myself up to those of the patriot. You know this is the day fixed for our final decision. Time presses, our friends are arriving, and I have opened house not only for the gentry, but for the underspur leathers whom we must necessarily employ. We have, therefore, little time to prepare to meet them. Look over these lists, Marchie, an abbreviation by which Marischal Wells was known among his friends. Do you, Sir Frederick, read these letters from Lothian and the West? All is ripe for the sickle, and we have but to summon out the reapers. With all my heart, said Marischal, the more mischief, the better sport. Sir Frederick looked grave and disconcerted. Walk aside with me, good friend, said Ellislaw to the sombre baronet. I have something for your private ear, with which I know you will be gratified. They walked into the house, leaving Ratcliffe and Marichal standing together in the court. And so, said Ratcliffe, the gentlemen of your political persuasion think the downfall of this government so certain that they disdain even to throw a decent disguise over the machinations of their party? Faith, Mr. Ratcliffe, answered Marichal, the actions and sentiments that your friends may require to be veiled, but I am better pleased that ours can go barefaced. And is it possible, continued Ratcliffe, that you, who, notwithstanding your thoughtlessness and heat of temper, I beg pardon, Mr. Marichal, I am a plain man, that you, who, notwithstanding these constitutional defects, possess natural good sense and acquired information, should be infatuated enough to embroil yourself in such desperate proceedings? How does your head feel when you are engaged in these dangerous conferences? Not quite so secure on my shoulders, answered Marichal, as if I were talking of hunting and hawking. I am not of so indifferent a mould as my cousin Ellislaw, who speaks treason as if it were a child's nursery rhymes, and loses and recovers that sweet girl, his daughter, with a good deal less emotion on both occasions than would have affected me had I lost and recovered a greyhound puppy. My temper is not quite so inflexible, nor my hate against government so inveterate as to blind me to the full danger of the attempt. Then why involve yourself in it? said Radcliffe. Why, I love this poor exiled king with all my heart, and my father was an old Killacranky man, and I long to see some amends on the Unionist courtiers that have bought and sold old Scotland, whose crown has been so long independent. 
"'And for the sake of these shadows,' said his monitor, "'you are going to involve your country in war and yourself in trouble?' "'I involve? No. But trouble for trouble, I had rather it came to-morrow than a month hence. Come, I know it will, and as your country folks say, better soon than sin. It will never find me younger. And as for hanging, as Sir John Falstaff says, I can become a gallows as well as another. You know the end of the old ballad. Say dauntingly, say wantonly, say rantingly gayed he. He played a spring and danced around beneath the gallows tree. Mr. Marischal, I am sorry for you, said his grave adviser. I am obliged to you, Mr. Radcliffe, but I would not have you judge of our enterprise by my way of vindicating it. There are wiser heads than mine at the work. Wiser heads than yours may lie as low, said Radcliffe in a warning tone. Perhaps so, but no lighter heart shall, and to prevent it being made heavier by your remonstrances, I will bid you adieu, Mr. Radcliffe, till dinner time, when you shall see that my apprehensions have not spoiled my appetite. End of chapter 12 Recording by Todd Chapter 13 of The Black Dwarf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neela, Iowa City, Iowa. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 13 To face the garment of rebellion with some fine color that may please the eye of fickle changelings and poor discontents which gape and rub the elbow at the news of hurly-burly innovation. Henry the Fourth, Part Two. There had been great preparations made at Ellislaw Castle for the entertainment on this important day, when not only the gentlemen of note in the neighborhood, attached to the Jacobite interest, were expected to rendezvous, but also many subordinate malcontents, whom difficulty of circumstances, love of change, resentment against England, or any of the numerous causes which inflamed men's passions at the time, rendered apt to join in perilous enterprise. The men of rank and substance were not many in number, for almost all the large proprietors stood aloof, and most of the smaller gentry and yeomanry were of the Presbyterian persuasion, and therefore, however displeased with the Union, unwilling to engage in a Jacobite conspiracy. But there were some gentlemen of property who, either from an early principle, from religious motives, or sharing the ambitious views of Ellislaw, had given countenance to his scheme. And there were also some fiery young men, like Marshall, desirous of signalizing themselves by engaging in a dangerous enterprise by which they hoped to vindicate the independence of their country. The other members of the party were persons of inferior rank and desperate fortunes, who were now ready to rise in that part of the country, as they did afterwards in the year 1715, under Forster and Der Wantwater, when a troop commanded by a border gentleman, named Douglas, consisted almost entirely of freebooters, among whom the notorious Luck in a Bag, as he was called, held a distinguished command. We think it necessary to mention these particulars, applicable solely to the province in which our scene lies, because, unquestionably, the Jacobite party and the other parts of the kingdom consisted of much more formidable as well as much more respectable materials. One long table extended itself down the ample hall of Ellislaw Castle, which was still left much in the state in which it had been one hundred years before, stretching, that is, in gloomy length along the whole side of the castle, vaulted with ribbed arches of freestone, the groins of which sprung from projecting figures that, carved into all the wild forms which the fantastic imagination of a gothic architect could devise, 
grinned, frowned, and gnashed their tusks at the assembly below. Long, narrow windows lighted the banqueting room on both sides, filled up with stained glass, through which the sun emitted a dusky and discolored light. A banner which tradition averred to have been taken from the English at the Battle of Sark waved over the chair in which Elizabeth presided, as if to inflame the courage of the guests by reminding them of ancient victories over their neighbors. He himself, a portly figure, dressed on this occasion with uncommon care and with features which, though of a stern and sinister expression, might well be termed handsome, looked the old feudal baron extremely well. Sir Frederick Langley was placed on his right hand, and Mr. Marischal of Marischal Wells on his left. Some gentlemen of consideration, with their sons, brothers, and nephews, were seated at the upper end of the table, and among these Mr. Ratcliffe had his place. Beneath the salt cellar, a massive piece of plate, which occupied the midst of the table, sate the sine nomine turba, men whose vanity was gratified by holding even this subordinate space at the social board, while the distinction observed in ranking them was a salve to the pride of their superiors. That the lower house was not very select must be admitted, since Willie of Westburnflat was one of the party. The unabashed audacity of this fellow in daring to present himself in the house of a gentleman, to whom he had just offered so flagrant an insult, can only be accounted for by supposing him conscious that his share in carrying off Miss Vere was a secret safe in her possession and that of her father. Before this numerous and miscellaneous party was placed a dinner, consisting not indeed of the delicacies of the season, as the newspapers express it, but of viands ample, solid, and sumptuous, under which the very board groaned. But the mirth was not in proportion to the good cheer. The lower end of the table were, for some time, chilled by constraint and respect on finding themselves members of so august an assembly, and those who were placed around it had those feelings of awe which P.P., clerk of the parish, describes himself oppressed when he first uplifted the psalm in presence of those persons of high worship, the wise Mr. Justice Freeman, the good Lady Jones, and the great Sir Thomas Truby. This ceremonious frost, however, soon gave way before the incentives to merriment, which were liberally supplied and as liberally consumed by the guests of the lower description. They became talkative, loud, and even clamorous in their mirth. But it was not in the power of wine or brandy to elevate the spirits of those who held the higher places at the banquet. They experienced the chilling revulsion of spirits which often takes place where men are called upon to take a desperate resolution after having placed themselves in circumstances where it is alike difficult to advance or to recede. The precipice looked deeper and more dangerous as they approached the brink, and each waited with an inward emotion of awe, expecting which of his confederates would set the example by plunging himself down. This inward sensation of fear and reluctance acted differently according to the various habits and characters of the company. One looked grave, another looked silly, a third gazed with apprehension on the empty seats at the higher end of the table, designed for members of the conspiracy whose prudence had prevailed over their political zeal and who had absented themselves from their consultations at this critical period. And some seemed to be reckoning up in their minds the comparative rank and prospects of those who were present and absent. Sir Frederick Langley was reserved, moody, and discontented. 
Ellislaw himself made such forced efforts to raise the spirits of the company as plainly marked the flagging of his own. Ratcliffe watched the scene with the composure of a vigilant but uninterested spectator. Marischal alone, true to the thoughtless vivacity of his character, ate and drank, laughed and jested, and seemed even to find amusement in the embarrassment of the company. "'What has damped our noble courage this morning?' he exclaimed. "'We seem to be met at a funeral, where the chief mourners must not speak above their breath, while the mutes and the sollies, looking to the lower end of the table, are carousing below. Ellisla, when will you lift?' To lift, meaning to lift the coffin, is the common expression for commencing a funeral. Where sleeps your spirit, man? And what has quelled the high hope of the knight of Langley Dale? You speak like a madman, said Ellislaw. Do you not see how many are absent? And what of that, said Marischal? Did you not know before that one half of the world are better talkers than doers? For my part, I am much encouraged by seeing at least two-thirds of our friends true to the rendezvous, though I suspect one half of these came to secure the dinner in case of the worst. There is no news from the coast, which can amount to certainty of the king's arrival, said another of the company, and that tone of subdued and tremulous whisper, which implies a failure of resolution. Not a line from the Earl of D, nor a single gentleman from the southern side of the border, said a third. Who is he that wishes for more men from England, exclaimed Marischal, in a theatrical tone of affected heroism? My cousin Ellislaw? No, my fair cousin, if we are doomed to die. For God's sake, said Ellislaw, spare us your folly at present, Marischal. Well, then, said his kinsman, I'll bestow my wisdom upon you instead, such as it is. If we have gone forward like fools, do not let us go back like cowards. We have done enough to draw upon us both the suspicion and vengeance of the government. Do not let us give up before we have done something to deserve it. What? Will no one speak? Then I'll leap the ditch first. And, starting up, he filled a beer glass to the brim with claret, and waving his hand, commanded all to follow his example, and to rise up from their seats. All obeyed the more qualified guests, as if passively, the others with enthusiasm. Then, my friends, I give you the pledge of the day, the independence of Scotland, and the health of our lawful sovereign, King James the Eighth, now landed in Lothian, and, as I trust and believe, in full possession of his ancient capital. He quaffed off the wine and threw the glass over his head. It should never, he said, be profaned by a meaner toast. All followed his example, and amid the crash of glasses and the shouts of the company, pledged themselves to stand or fall with the principles and political interest which their toast expressed. "'You have leapt the ditch with a witness,' said Ellislaw, apart to Marischal. "'But I believe it is all for the best. At all events, we cannot now retreat from our undertaking. One man alone, looking at Ratcliffe, has refused the pledge, but of that by and by.' Then, rising up, he addressed the company in a style of inflammatory invective against the government and its measures, but especially the Union, a treaty by means of which he affirmed Scotland had been at once cheated of her independence, her commerce, and her honor, and laid as a fettered slave at the foot of the rival, against whom, through such a length of ages, through so many dangers, and by so much blood, she had honorably defended her rights. 
This was touching a theme which found a responsive chord in the bosom of every man present. Our commerce is destroyed, hollowed old John Rucastle, a Jedburgh smuggler, from the lower end of the table. Our agriculture is ruined, said the laird of Broken Girth Flow, a territory which, since the days of Adam, had bore nothing but ling and whortleberries. Our religion is cut up, root and branch, said the pimple-nosed pastor of the Episcopal Meeting House at Kirkwhistle. We shall shortly neither dare shoot a deer nor kiss a wench without a certificate from the Presbytery and Kirk Treasurer, said Marischal Wells, or make a brand or a boem in a frosty morning without license from a commissioner of excise, said the smuggler, or ride over the fell in a moonless night, said Westburn Flat, without asking leave of young Ernscliff or some inglified justice of the peace. They were good days on the border when there was neither peace nor justice heard of. Let us remember our wrongs at Darien and Glencoe, continued Ellislaw, and take arms for the protection of our rights, our fortunes, our lives, and our families. Think upon genuine Episcopal ordination, without which there can be no lawful clergy, said the divine. Think of the piracies committed on our East Indian trade by Green and the English thieves, said William Willison, half owner and sole skipper of a brig that made four voyages annually between Cockpool and Whitehaven. Remember your liberties, rejoined Marischal, who seemed to take a mischievous delight in precipitating the movements of the enthusiasm which he had excited. Like a roguish boy, who, having lifted the sluice of a mill dam, enjoys the clatter of the wheels which he has put in motion, without thinking of the mischief he may have occasioned. Remember your liberties, he exclaimed. Confound cess, press, and presbytery, and the memory of old Willie that first brought them upon us. Damn the gauger, echoed old John Rucastle. I'll cleave him with my own hand. And confound the country keeper and the constable, re-echoed Whispernflat. I'll wheeze a brace of balls through them before morning. We are agreed then, said Ellislaw, when the shouts had somewhat subsided, to bear this state of things no longer. We are agreed to a man, answered his guests. Not literally so, said Mr. Ratcliffe, for though I cannot hope to assuage the violent symptoms which seem so suddenly to have seized upon the company, yet I beg to observe that so far as the opinion of a single member goes, I do not entirely coincide in the list of grievances which has been announced, and that I do utterly protest against the frantic measures which you seem disposed to adopt for removing them. I can easily suppose much of what has been spoken may have arisen out of the heat of the moment, or have been said perhaps in jest. But there are some jests of a nature very apt to transpire, and you ought to remember, gentlemen, that stone walls have ears. Stone walls may have ears, returned Ellislaw, eyeing him with a look of triumphant malignity. But domestic spies, Mr. Ratcliffe, will soon find themselves without any, if any such dares to continue his abode in a family where his coming was an unauthorized intrusion, where his conduct has been that of a presumptuous meddler, and from which his exit shall be that of a baffled knave if he does not know how to take a hint. Mr. Vere, returned Ratcliffe, with a calm contempt, I am fully aware as soon as my presence becomes useless to you, which it must through the rash step you are about to adopt, it will immediately become unsafe to myself, as it has always been hateful to you. But I have one protection, and it is a strong one, for you would not willingly hear me detail before gentlemen and men of honor the singular circumstances in which our connection took its rise. As for the rest... I rejoice at its conclusion, and as I think that Mr. Marischal, 
and some other gentlemen will guarantee the safety of my ears and of my throat, for which last I have more reason to be apprehensive, during the course of the night I shall not leave your castle till tomorrow morning. Be it so, sir, replied Mr. Vere. You are entirely safe from my resentment because you are beneath it and not because I am afraid of your disclosing my family secrets, although, for your own sake, I warn you to beware how you do so. Your agency and intermediation can be of little consequence to one who will win or lose all, as lawful right or unjust usurpation shall succeed in the struggle that is about to ensue. Farewell, sir." Ratcliffe arose and cast upon him a look which Vere seemed to sustain with difficulty, and bowing to those around him, left the room. This conversation made an impression on many of the company, which Ellislaw hastened to dispel by entering upon the business of the day. Their hasty deliberations went to organize an immediate insurrection. Ellislaw, Marischal, and Sir Frederick Langley were chosen leaders, with powers to direct their farther measures. A place of rendezvous was appointed, at which all agreed to meet early on the ensuing day, with such followers and friends to the cause as each could collect around him. Several of the guests retired to make the necessary preparations, and Ellislaw made a formal apology to the others, who with Westburn Flat and the old smuggler continued to ply the bottom staunchly, for, leaving the head of the table, as he must necessarily hold a separate and sober conference with the coadjutors whom they had associated with him in the command, the apology was the more readily accepted, as he prayed them at the same time to continue to amuse themselves with such refreshments as the cellars of the castle afforded. Shouts of applause followed their retreat, and the names of Vere, Langley, and above all of Marischal were thundered forth in chorus and bathed with copious bumpers repeatedly during the remainder of the evening. When the principal conspirators had retired into a separate apartment, they gazed on each other for a minute with a sort of embarrassment, which, and Sir Frederick's dark features amounted to an expression of discontented sullenness. Marischal was the first to break the pause, saying with a loud burst of laughter, "'Well, we are fairly embarked now, gentlemen. Vogue la galère!' "'We may thank you for the plunge,' said Ellislaw. "'Yes, but I don't know how far you will thank me,' answered Marischal." when I show you this letter which I have received just before we sat down. My servant told me it was delivered by a man he had never seen before, who went off at a gallop after charging him to put it into my own hand. Ellislaw impatiently opened the letter and read aloud, Edinburgh, honored sir, having obligations to your family, which shall be nameless, and learning that you are one of the company of adventurers doing business for the house of James and Company, late merchants in London, now in Dunkirk, I think it right to send you this early and private information that the vessels you expected have been driven off the coast without having been able to break bulk or to land any part of their cargo and that the West Country partners have resolved to withdraw their name from the firm, as it must prove a losing concern. Having good hope you will avail yourself of this early information to do what is needful for your own security, I rest your humble servant, Niall Nameless. For Ralph Marischal of Marischal Wells, these with care and speed. Sir Frederick's jaw dropped, and his countenance blackened as the letter was read, and Ellislaw exclaimed, Why, this affects the very mainspring of our enterprise. If the French fleet, with the king on board, has been chased off by the English, as this damned scrawl seems to intimate, where are we? Just where we were this morning, I think, said Marischal, still laughing. 
Pardon me, at a truce to your ill-timed mirth, Mr. Marischal. This morning we were not committed publicly, as we now stand committed by your own mad act. When you had a letter in your pocket apprising you that our undertaking was desperate. Ay, ay, I expected you would say so. But in the first place, my friend, Niall Nameless, and his letter may all be a flam. And, moreover, I would have you know that I am tired of a party that does nothing but form bold resolutions overnight and sleep them away with their wine before morning. The government are now unprovided of men and ammunition. In a few weeks they will have enough of both. The country is now in a flame against them. In a few weeks, betwixt the effects of self-interest, of fear, and of lukewarm indifference, which are already so visible, this first fervor will be as cold as Christmas. So, as I was determined to go the vole, I have taken care you shall dip as deep as I. It signifies nothing plunging. You are fairly in the bog and must struggle through it. You are mistaken with respect to one of us, Mr. Marischal, said Sir Frederick Langley, and applying himself to the bell, he desired the person who entered to order his servants and horses instantly. You must not leave us, Sir Frederick, said Ellislaw, if we have our musters to go over. I will go tonight, Mr. Vere, said Sir Frederick, and write to you my intentions in this matter when I am at home. Aye, said Marischal, and send them by a troop of horse from Carlisle to make us prisoners. Look ye, Sir Frederick, I, for one, will neither be deserted nor betrayed, and if you leave Ellislaw Castle tonight, it shall be by passing over my dead body. For shame, Marischal, said Mr. Vere. How can you so hastily misinterpret our friend's intentions? I am sure Sir Frederick can only be jesting with us. For, were he not too honorable to dream of deserting the cause, he cannot but remember the full proofs we have of his accession to it, and his eager activity in advancing it. He cannot but be conscious, besides, that the first information will be readily received by the government, and that if the question be, which first lodge intelligence of the affair, we can easily save a few hours on him. You should say you, and not we, when you talk of priorities and such a race of treachery. For my part, I won't enter my horse for such a plate, said Marischal, and added betwixt his teeth, a pretty pair of fellows to trust a man's neck with. I am not to be intimidated from doing what I think proper, said Sir Frederick Langley, and my first step shall be to leave Ellislaw. I have no reason to keep faith with one, looking at Vere, who has kept none with me. In what respect, said Ellislaw, silencing with a motion of his hand his impetuous kinsman, how have I disappointed you, Sir Frederick? In the nearest and most tender point, you have trifled with me concerning our proposed alliance, which you well knew was the gauge of our political undertaking. This carrying off and this bringing back of Miss Vere, the cold reception I have met with from her, and the excuses with which you cover it, I believe to be mere evasions, that you yourself retain possession of the estates which are hers by right, and make me, in the meanwhile, a tool in your desperate enterprise by holding out hopes and expectations which you are resolved never to realize. Sir Frederick, I protest, by all that is sacred, I will listen to no protestations. I have been cheated with them too long, answered Sir Frederick. If you leave us, said Ellislaw, you cannot but know both your ruin and ours is certain. All depends on our adhering together. Leave me to take care of myself, returned the knight. But were what you say true, I would rather perish than be fooled any farther. Can nothing, no surety, convince you of my sincerity, said Ellislaw, anxiously. This morning I should have repelled your unjust suspicions as an insult, but situated as we now are. 
you feel yourself compelled to be sincere, retorted Sir Frederick. If you would have me think so, there is but one way to convince me of it. Let your daughter bestow her hand on me this evening. So soon? Impossible, answered Vere. Think of her late alarm, of our present undertaking. I will listen to nothing but to her consent, plighted at the altar. You have a chapel in the castle. Dr. Hobbler is present among the company. This proof of your good faith tonight, and we are again joined in heart and hand. If you refuse me when it is so much for your advantage to consent, how shall I trust you tomorrow, when I shall stand committed in your undertaking, and unable to retract? Am I to understand that, if you can be made my son-in-law tonight, our friendship is renewed, said Ellisla? Most infallibly and most inviolably, replied Sir Frederick. Then, said Vere, though what you ask is premature, indelicate and unjust towards my character, yet, Sir Frederick, give me your hand. My daughter shall be your wife. This night? This very night, replied Ellislaw, before the clock strikes twelve. With her own consent, I trust, said Marischal, for I promise you both, gentlemen, I will not stand tamely by and see any violence put on the will of my pretty kinswoman. Another pest in this hot-headed fellow, muttered Ellislaw, and then aloud. With her own consent? For what do you take me, Marischal? that you should suppose your interference necessary to protect my daughter against her father. Depend upon it, she has no repugnance to Sir Frederick Langley. Or rather, to be called Lady Langley. Faith, like enough, there are many women might be of her mind. And I beg your pardon, but these sudden demands and concessions alarmed me a little on her account. It is only the suddenness of the proposal that embarrasses me, said Ellislaw. But perhaps if she is found intractable, Sir Frederick will consider. I will consider nothing, Mr. Vere. Your daughter's hand tonight, or I depart, were it at midnight, there is my ultimatum. I embrace it, said Ellislaw, and I will leave you to talk upon our military preparations, while I go to prepare my daughter for so sudden a change of condition. So saying, he left the company. End of chapter 13「fourteen of the Black Dwarf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 14. He brings Earl Osmond to receive my vows. Oh, dreadful change! For Tancred, haughty Osmond. Tancred and Sigismunda. Mr. Vera, whom long practice of dissimulation had enabled to model his very gait, and footsteps to aid the purposes of deception walked along the stone passage and up the first flight of steps towards miss vera's apartment with the alert firm and steady pace of one who is bound indeed upon important business but who entertains no doubt he can terminate his affairs satisfactorily but when out of hearing of the gentleman whom he had left his step became so slow and irresolute as to correspond with his doubts and his fears at length he paused in an antechamber to collect his ideas and form his plan of argument before approaching his daughter in what more hopeless and inextricable dilemma was ever an unfortunate man involved such was the tenor of his reflections if we now fall to pieces by disunion there can be little doubt that the government will take my life as the prime agitator of the insurrection or grant i could stoop to save myself by a hasty submission am i not even in that case utterly ruined 
i have broken irreconcilably with ratcliffe and can have nothing to expect from that quarter but insult and persecution i must wander forth an impoverished and dishonoured man without even the means of sustaining life far less wealth sufficient to counterbalance the infamy which my countrymen both those whom i desert and those whom i join will attach to the name of the political renegade it is not to be thought of and yet what choice remains between this lot and the ignominious scaffold nothing can save me but reconciliation with these men and to accomplish this i have promised to langley that isabella shall marry him ere midnight and to marischal that she shall do so without compulsion i have but one remedy betwixt me and ruin her consent to take a suitor whom she dislikes upon such short notice as would disgust her even were he a favoured lover but i must trust to the romantic generosity of her disposition and let me paint the necessity of her obedience ever so strongly i cannot overcharge its reality having finished this sad chain of reflections upon his perilous condition he entered his daughter's apartment with every nerve bent up to the support of the argument which he was about to sustain though a deceitful and ambitious man he was not so devoid of natural affection but that he was shocked at the part he was about to act in practising on the feelings of a dutiful and affectionate child but the recollections that if he succeeded his daughter would only be trepanned into an advantageous match and that if he failed he himself was a lost man were quite sufficient to drown all scruples he found miss vera seated by the window of her dressing-room her head reclining on her hand and either sunk in slumber or so deeply engaged in meditation that she did not hear the noise he made at his entrance he approached with his features composed to a deep expression of sorrow and sympathy and sitting down beside her solicited her attention by quietly taking her hand a motion which he did not fail to accompany with a deep sigh my father said isabella with a sort of start which expressed at least as much fear as joy or affection yes isabella said vera your unhappy father who comes now as a penitent to crave forgiveness of his daughter for an injury done to her in the excess of his affection and then to take leave of her for ever sir offence to me take leave for ever what does all this mean asked miss vera yes isabella i am serious but first let me ask you have you no suspicion that i may have been privy to the strange chance which befell you yesterday morning you sir answered isabella stammering between a consciousness that he had guessed her thoughts justly and the shame as well as fear which forbade her to acknowledge a suspicion so degrading and so unnatural yes he continued your hesitation confesses that you entertained such an opinion and i have now the painful task of acknowledging that your suspicions have done me no injustice but listen to my motives in an evil hour i countenanced the addresses of sir frederick langley conceiving it impossible that you could have any permanent objections to a match where the advantages were in most respects on your side in a worse i entered with him into measures calculated to restore our banished monarch and the independence of my country he has taken advantage of my unguarded confidence and now has my life at his disposal your life sir said isabella faintly yes isabella continued her father the life of him who gave life to you so soon as i foresaw the excesses into which his headlong passion for to do him justice i believe his unreasonable conduct arises from excess of attachment to you was likely to hurry him i endeavoured by finding a plausible pretext for your absence for some weeks 
to extricate myself from the dilemma in which I am placed. For this purpose I wished, in case your objections to the match continued insurmountable, to have sent you privately for a few months to the convent of your maternal aunt at Paris. By a series of mistakes, you have been brought from the place of secrecy and security which I had destined for your temporary abode. Fate has baffled my last chance of escape, and I have only to give you my blessing, and send you from the castle with Mr. Ratcliffe, who now leaves it. My own fate will soon be decided. "'Good heaven, sir! Can this be possible?' exclaimed Isabella. "'Oh, why was I freed from the restraint in which you placed me? Or why did you not impart your pleasure to me?' "'Think an instant, Isabella. Would you have had me prejudice, in your opinion, the friend I was most desirous of serving, by communicating to you the injurious eagerness with which he pursued his object? Could I do so honorably, having promised to assist his suit? But it is all over. I and Marischal have made up our minds to die like men. It only remains to send you from hence, under a safe escort." great powers and is there no remedy said the terrified young woman none my child answered vera gently unless one which you would not advise your father to adopt to be the first to betray his friends oh no no she answered abhorrently yet hastily as if to reject the temptation which the alternative presented to her but is there no other hope through flight through mediation through supplication i will bend my knee to sir frederick it would be a fruitless degradation he is determined on his course and i am equally resolved to stand the hazard of my fate on one condition only he will turn aside from his purpose and that condition my lips shall never utter to you name it i conjure you my dear father exclaimed isabella what can he ask that we ought not to grant to prevent the hideous catastrophe with which you are threatened that isabella said vera solemnly you shall never know until your father's head has rolled on the bloody scaffold then indeed you will learn there was one sacrifice by which he might have been saved and why not speak it now said isabella do you fear i would flinch from the sacrifice of fortune for your preservation or would you bequeath me the bitter legacy of life-long remorse so oft as i shall think that you perished while there remained one mode of preventing the dreadful misfortune that overhangs you then my child said vera since you press me to name what i would a thousand times rather leave in silence i must inform you that he will accept for ransom nothing but your hand in marriage and that conferred before midnight this very evening this evening sir said the young lady struck with horror at the proposal and to such a man a man a monster who could wish to win the daughter by threatening the life of the father it is impossible you say right my child answered her father it is indeed impossible nor have i either the right or the wish to exact such a sacrifice it is the course of nature that the old should die and be forgot and the young should live and be happy my father die and his child can save him but no no my dear father pardon me it is impossible you only wish to guide me to your wishes. I know your object is what you think my happiness, and this dreadful tale is only told to influence my conduct and subdue my scruples. My daughter, replied Ellisla, in a tone where offended authority seemed to struggle with parental affection, my child suspects me of inventing a false tale to work upon her feelings. Even this I must bear, and even from this unworthy suspicion I must descend to vindicate myself. You know the stainless honor of your cousin Marischal. Mark what I shall write to him, and judge from his answer 
if the danger in which we stand is not real, and whether I have not used every means to avert it. He sat down and wrote a few lines hastily, and handed them to Isabella, who, after repeated and painful efforts, cleared her eyes and head sufficiently to discern their purport. "'Dear cousin,' said the billet, "'I find my daughter, as I expected, in despair at the untimely and premature urgency of Sir Frederick Langley. She cannot even comprehend the peril in which we stand, or how much we are in his power. Use your influence with him, for heaven's sake, to modify proposals, to the acceptance of which I cannot and will not urge my child against all her own feelings, as well as those of delicacy and propriety, and oblige your loving cousin, R. V. In the agitation of the moment, when her swimming eyes and dizzy brain could hardly comprehend the sense of what she looked upon, it is not surprising that Miss Vera should have omitted to remark that this letter seemed to rest her scruples rather upon the form and time of the proposed union than on a rooted dislike to the suitor proposed to her. Mr. Vera rang the bell and gave the letter to a servant to be delivered to Mr. Marischal, and, rising from his chair, continued to traverse the apartment in silence and in great agitation until the answer was returned. He glanced it over and wrung the hand of his daughter as he gave it to her. The tenor was as follows. My dear kinsman, I have already urged the knight on the point you mention, and I find him as fixed as Cheviot. I am truly sorry my fair cousin should be pressed to give up any of her maidenly rights. Sir Frederick consents, however, to leave the castle with me the instant the ceremony is performed and we will raise our followers and begin the fray. Thus there is great hope the bridegroom may be knocked on the head before he and the bride can meet again. So Belle has a fair chance to be Lady Langley, a tres bon marche. For the rest I can only say that if she can make up her mind to the alliance at all, it is no time for mere maiden ceremony. My pretty cousin must needs consent to marry in haste or we shall all repent at leisure, or rather have very little leisure to repent, which is all at present from him who rests your affectionate kinsman, R. M. P. S. Tell Isabella that I would rather cut the knight's throat after all, and end the dilemma that way, than see her constrained to marry him against her will. When Isabella had read this letter, it dropped from her hand, and she would, at the same time, have fallen from her chair, had she not been supported by her father. "'Oh, God, my child will die!' exclaimed Vera. The feelings of nature overcoming, even in his breast, the sentiments of selfish policy. "'Look up, Isabella, look up, my child. Come what will, you shall not be the sacrifice. I will fall myself with the consciousness I leave you happy. My child may weep on my grave.' but she shall not, not in this instance, reproach my memory. He called a servant. Go, bid Ratcliffe come hither directly. During this interval Miss Vera became deadly pale, clenched her hands, pressing the palms strongly together, closed her eyes, and drew her lips with strong compression, as if the severe constraint which she put upon her internal feelings extended even to her muscular organization. Then, raising her head and drawing in her breath strongly ere she spoke, she said with firmness, Father, I consent to the marriage. You shall not, you shall not, my child, my dear child, you shall not embrace certain misery to free me from uncertain danger. So exclaimed Ellislaw, and strange and inconsistent beings that we are he expressed the real though momentary feelings of his heart. Father, repeated Isabella, I will consent to this marriage. No, my child, no, not now at least. We will humble ourselves to obtain delay from him. And yet, Isabella, could you overcome a dislike which has no real foundation? Think, in other respects, what a match, wealth, rank, 
importance father reiterated isabella i have consented it seemed as if she had lost the power of saying anything else or even of varying the phrase which with such effort she had compelled herself to utter heaven bless thee my child heaven bless thee and it will bless thee with riches with pleasure with power miss vera faintly entreated to be left by herself for the rest of the evening but will you not receive sir frederick said her father anxiously i will meet him she replied i will meet him when i must and where i must but spare me now be it so my dearest you shall know no restraint that i can save you from do not think too hardly of sir frederick for this it is an excess of passion isabella waved her hand impatiently forgive me my child i go heaven bless thee at eleven if you call me not before at eleven i come to seek you when he had left isabella she dropped upon her knees heaven aid me to support the resolution i have taken heaven only can oh poor ernscliff who shall comfort him and with what contempt will he pronounce her name who listened to him to-day and gave herself to another at night but let him despise me better so than that he should know the truth let him despise me if it will but lessen his grief i should feel comfort in the loss of his esteem she wept bitterly attempting in vain from time to time to commence the prayer for which she had sunk on her knees but unable to calm her spirit sufficiently for the exercise of devotion as she remained in this agony of mind the door of her apartment was slowly opened End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the black dwarf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the black dwarf by sir walter scott chapter fifteen the darksome cave they enter where they found the woeful man low sitting on the ground musing full sadly in his sullen mind fairy queen the intruder on miss vera's sorrows was ratcliffe ellislaw had in the agitation of his mind forgotten to countermand the order he had given to call him thither so that he opened the door with the words you sent for me mr vera then looking around miss vera alone on the ground and in tears leave me leave me mr ratcliffe said the unhappy young lady i must not leave you said ratcliffe i have been repeatedly requesting admittance to take my leave of you and have been refused until your father himself sent for me blame me not if i am bold and intrusive i have a duty to discharge which makes me so i cannot listen to you i cannot speak to you mr ratcliffe take my best wishes and for god's sake leave me tell me only said ratcliffe is it true that this monstrous match is to go forward and this very night i heard the servants proclaim it as i was on the great staircase i heard the directions given to clear out the chapel spare me mr ratcliffe replied the luckless bride and from the state in which you see me judge of the cruelty of these questions married to sir frederick langley and this night it must not cannot shall not be it must be mr ratcliffe or my father is ruined ah i understand answered ratcliffe and you have sacrificed yourself to save him who but let the virtue of the child atone for the faults of the father it is no time to rake them up what can be done time presses i know but one remedy with four and twenty hours i might find many miss vera you must implore the protection of the only human being who has it in his power to control the course of events which threatens to hurry you before it and what human being answered miss vera has such power start not when i name him 
said Ratcliffe, coming near her, and speaking in a low but distinct voice. It is he who is called Elshender the Recluse of Mucklestain Moor. You are mad, Mr. Ratcliffe, or you mean to insult my misery by such an ill-timed jest. I am as much in my senses, young lady, answered her adviser, as you are, and I am no idle jester, far less with misery, least of all with your misery. I swear to you that this being, who is other far than what he seems, actually possesses the means of redeeming you from this hateful union. And of ensuring my father's safety? Yes, even that, said Ratcliffe. If you plead his cause with him, yet how to obtain admittance to the recluse? Fear not that, said Miss Vera, suddenly recollecting the incident of the rose. I remember he desired me to call upon him for aid in my extremity, and gave me this flower as a token. Ere it faded away entirely, I would need, he said, his assistance. Is it possible his words can have been aught but the ravings of insanity? Doubt it not, fear it not. But above all, said Ratcliffe, let us lose no time. Are you at liberty and unwatched? I believe so, said Isabella, but what would you have me to do? Leave the castle instantly, said Ratcliffe, and throw yourself at the feet of this extraordinary man, who in circumstances that seem to argue the extremity of the most contemptible poverty, possesses yet an almost absolute influence over your fate. Guests and servants are deep in their carouse, the leaders sitting in conclave on their treasonable schemes. My horse stands ready in the stable. I will saddle one for you and meet you at the little garden gate. Oh, let no doubt of my prudence or fidelity prevent your taking the only step in your power to escape the dreadful fate which must attend the wife of Sir Frederick Langley. Mr. Ratcliffe, said Miss Vera, you have always been esteemed a man of honor and probity, and a drowning wretch will always catch at the feeblest twig. I will trust you. I will follow your advice. I will meet you at the garden gate. She bolted the outer door of her apartment as soon as Mr. Ratcliffe left her, and descended to the garden by a separate stair of communication which opened to her dressing-room. On the way she felt inclined to retract the consent she had so hastily given to a plan so hopeless and extravagant. But as she passed in her descent a private door which entered into the chapel from the back stair, she heard the voice of the female servants as they were employed in the task of cleaning it. Married! And to so bad a man! Oh, how, sirs! Only thing rather than that! They are right, they are right, said Miss Vera, anything rather than that. She hurried to the garden. Mr. Ratcliffe was true to his appointment. The horses stood saddled at the garden gate, and in a few minutes they were advancing rapidly towards the hut of the solitary. While the ground was favorable, the speed of their journey was such as to prevent much communication. But when a steep ascent compelled them to slacken their pace, a new cause of apprehension occurred to Miss Vera's mind. Mr. Ratcliffe, she said, pulling up her horse's bridle, let us prosecute no further a journey, which nothing but the extreme agitation of my mind can vindicate my having undertaken. I am well aware that this man passes among the vulgar as being possessed of supernatural powers, and carrying on an intercourse with beings of another world, but I would have you aware that I am neither to be imposed on by such follies, nor, were I to believe in their existence, durst I, with my feelings of religion, apply to this being in my distress. I should have thought, Miss Vera, replied Ratcliffe, my character and habits of thinking were so well known to you that you might have held me exculpated from crediting in such absurdity. But in what other mode, said Isabella, can a being so miserable himself in appearance possess the power of assisting me? Miss Vera, said Ratcliffe, after a momentary pause, I am bound by a solemn oath of secrecy. You must, without farther explanation, be satisfied with my pledged assurance that he does possess the power, 
if you can inspire him with the will, and that I doubt not you will be able to do so. Mr. Ratcliffe, said Miss Vera, you may yourself be mistaken. You ask an unlimited degree of confidence from me. Recollect, Miss Vera, he replied, that when in your humanity you asked me to interfere with your father in favor of Haswell and his ruined family, when you requested me to prevail on him to do a thing most abhorrent to his nature, to forgive an injury and remit a penalty, I stipulated that you should ask me no questions concerning the sources of my influence. You found no reason to distrust me then. Do not distrust me now. But the extraordinary mode of life of this man, said Miss Vera, his seclusion, his figure, the deepness of his misanthropy, which he is said to express in his language. Mr. Ratcliffe, what can I think of him if he really possesses the powers you ascribe to him? This man, young lady, was bred a Catholic, a sect which affords a thousand instances of those who have retired from power and influence to voluntary privations more strict even than his. But he avows no religious motive, replied Miss Vera. No, replied Ratcliffe, disgust with the world has operated his retreat from it without assuming the veil of superstition. Thus far I may tell you, he was born to great wealth, which his parents designed should become greater by his union with a kinswoman, whom for that purpose they bred up in their own house. You have seen his figure. Judge what the young lady must have thought of the lot to which she was destined. Yet habituated to his appearance, she showed no reluctance, and the friends of, of the person whom I speak of, doubted not that the excess of his attachment the various acquisitions of his mind, his many and amiable qualities, had overcome the natural horror which his destined bride must have entertained at an exterior so dreadfully inauspicious. And did they judge truly? said Isabella. You shall hear. He, at least, was fully aware of his own deficiency. The sense of it haunted him like a phantom. I am, was his own expression to me, I mean to a man whom he trusted, I am, in spite of what you say, a poor, miserable outcast, fitter to have been smothered in the cradle than to have been brought up to scare the world in which I crawl. The person whom he addressed in vain endeavored to impress him with the indifference to external form which is the natural result of philosophy, or entreat him to recall the superiority of mental talents to the more attractive attributes that are merely personal. I hear you, he would reply, but you speak the voice of cold-blooded stoicism, or at least of friendly partiality. But look at every book which we have read, those accepted of that abstract philosophy which feels no responsive voice in our natural feelings. Is not personal form, such as at least can be tolerated without horror and disgust, always represented as essential to our ideas of a friend, far more a lover, is not such a misshapen monster as I am, excluded by the very fiat of nature from her fairest enjoyments? What but my wealth prevents all, perhaps even Letitia or you, from shunning me as something foreign to your nature, and more odious, by bearing that distorted resemblance to humanity which we observe in the animal tribes that are more hateful to man because they seem his caricature. You repeat the sentiments of a madman, said Miss Vera. No, replied her conductor, unless a morbid and excessive sensibility on such a subject can be termed insanity. Yet I will not deny that this governing feeling and apprehension carried the person who entertained it, to lengths which indicated a deranged imagination. He appeared to think that it was necessary for him, by exuberant and not always well-chosen instances of liberality and even profusion, to unite himself to the human race, from which he conceived himself naturally dissevered. The benefits which he bestowed, from a disposition naturally philanthropical in an uncommon degree, were exaggerated by the influence of the goading reflection, 
that more was necessary from him than from others lavishing his treasures as if to bribe mankind to receive him into their class it is scarcely necessary to say that the bounty which flowed from a source so capricious was often abused and his confidence frequently betrayed these disappointments which occur to all more or less and most to such as confer benefits without just discrimination his diseased fancy set down to the hatred and contempt excited by his personal deformity but i fatigue you miss vera no by no means i i could not prevent my attention from wandering an instant pray proceed he became at length continued ratcliffe the most ingenious self-tormentor of whom i have ever heard the scoff of the rabble and the sneer of the yet more brutal vulgar of his own rank was to him agony and breaking on the wheel he regarded the laugh of the common people whom he passed on the street and the suppressed titter or yet more offensive terror of the young girls to whom he was introduced in company as proofs of the true sense which the world entertained of him as a prodigy unfit to be received among them on the usual terms of society and as vindicating the wisdom of his purpose in withdrawing himself from among them on the faith and sincerity of two persons alone he seemed to rely implicitly on that of his betrothed bride and of a friend eminently gifted in personal accomplishments who seemed and indeed probably was sincerely attached to him he ought to have been so at least for he was literally loaded with benefits by him whom you are now about to see the parents of the subject of my story died within a short space of each other their death postponed the marriage for which the day had been fixed the lady did not seem greatly to mourn this delay perhaps that was not to have been expected but she intimated no change of intention when after a decent interval a second day was named for their union the friend of whom i spoke was then a constant resident at the hall in an evil hour at the earnest request and entreaty of this friend they joined a general party where men of different political opinions were mingled and where they drank deep a quarrel ensued the friend of the recluse drew his sword with others and was thrown down and disarmed by a more powerful antagonist they fell in the struggle at the feet of the recluse who maimed and truncated as his form appears possesses nevertheless great strength as well as violent passions he caught up a sword pierced the heart of his friend's antagonist was tried and his life with difficulty redeemed from justice at the expense of a year's close imprisonment the punishment of manslaughter the incident affected him most deeply the more that the deceased was a man of excellent character and had sustained gross insult and injury ere he drew his sword i think from that moment i observed i beg pardon the fits of morbid sensibility which had tormented this unfortunate gentleman were rendered henceforth more acute by remorse which he of all men was least capable of having incurred or of sustaining when it became his unhappy lot his paroxysms of agony could not be concealed from the lady to whom he was betrothed and it must be confessed they were of an alarming and fearful nature he comforted himself that at the expiry of his imprisonment he could form with his wife and friend a society encircled by which he might dispense with more extensive communication with the world he was deceived before that term elapsed his friend and his betrothed bride were man and wife the effects of a shock so dreadful on an ardent temperament a disposition already soured by bitter remorse and loosened by the indulgence of a gloomy imagination from the rest of mankind i cannot describe to you it was as if the last cable at which the vessel rode had suddenly parted and left her abandoned to all the wild fury of the tempest he was placed under medical restraint as a temporary measure this might have been justifiable but his hard-hearted friend who in consequence of his marriage was now his nearest ally 
prolonged his confinement in order to enjoy the management of his immense estates there was one who owed his all to the sufferer an humble friend but grateful and faithful by unceasing exertion and repeated invocation of justice he at length succeeded in obtaining his patron's freedom and reinstatement in the management of his own property to whom was soon added that of his intended bride who having died without male issue her estates reverted to him as heir of entail but freedom and wealth were unable to restore the equipoise of his mind to the former his grief made him indifferent the latter only served him as far as it afforded him the means of indulging his strange and wayward fancy he had renounced the catholic religion but perhaps some of its doctrines continued to influence a mind over which remorse and misanthropy now assumed in appearance an unbounded authority his life has since been that alternatively of a pilgrim and a hermit suffering the most severe privations not indeed in ascetic devotion but in abhorrence of mankind yet no man's words and actions have been at such a wide difference nor has any hypocritical wretch ever been more ingenious in assigning good motives for his vile actions than this unfortunate in reconciling to his abstract principles of misanthropy a conduct which flows from his natural generosity and kindness of feeling still mr ratcliffe still you describe the inconsistencies of a madman by no means replied ratcliffe that the imagination of this gentleman is disordered i will not pretend to dispute i have already told you that it has sometimes broken out into paroxysms approaching to real mental alienation but it is of his common state of mind that i speak it is irregular but not deranged the shades are as gradual as those that divide the light of noonday from midnight the courtier who ruins his fortune for the attainment of a title which can do him no good or power of which he can make no suitable or creditable use the miser who hoards his useless wealth and the prodigal who squanders it are all marked with a certain shade of insanity to criminals who are guilty of enormities when the temptation to a sober mind bears no proportion to the horror of the act or the probability of detection and punishment the same observation applies and every violent passion as well as anger may be termed a short madness this may be all good philosophy mr ratcliffe answered miss vera but excuse me if it by no means emboldens me to visit at this late hour a person whose extravagance of imagination you yourself can only palliate rather than said ratcliffe receive my solemn assurances that you do not incur the slightest danger but what i have been hitherto afraid to mention for fear of alarming you is that now when we are within sight of his retreat for i can discover it through the twilight i must go no farther with you you must proceed alone alone i dare not you must continued ratcliffe i will remain here and wait for you you will not then stir from this place said miss vera yet the distance is so great you could not hear me were i to cry for assistance fear nothing said her guide or observe at least the utmost caution in stifling every expression of timidity remember that his predominant and most harassing apprehension arises from a consciousness of the hideousness of his appearance your path lies straight beside yon half-fallen willow keep the left side of it the marsh lies on the right farewell for a time remember the evil you are threatened with and let it overcome at once your fears and scruples mr ratcliffe said isabella farewell if you have deceived one so unfortunate as myself you have for ever forfeited the fair character for probity and honour to which i have trusted on my life on my soul continued ratcliffe raising his voice as the distance between them increased you are safe perfectly safe 
End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of The Black Dwarf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 16. Twas time and griefs that framed him thus. Time, with his fairer hand, offering the fortunes of his former days, the former man may make him. Bring us to him, and chance it as it may. Old Play The sounds of Ratcliffe's voice had died on Isabella's ear, but as she frequently looked back it was some encouragement to her to discern his form now darkening in the gloom. Ere, however, she went much farther, she lost the object in the increasing shade. The last glimmer of the twilight placed her before the hut of the solitary. She twice extended her hand to the door, and twice she withdrew it and when she did at length make the effort, the knock did not equal in violence the throb of her own bosom. Her next effort was louder. Her third was reiterated, for the fear of not obtaining the protection from which Ratcliffe promised so much, began to overpower the terrors of his presence from whom she was to request it. At length, as she still received no answer, she repeatedly called upon the dwarf by his assumed name and requested him to answer and open to her. What miserable being is reduced, said the appalling voice of the solitary, to seek refuge here? Go hence. When the heath fowl need shelter, they seek it not in the nest of the night raven. I come to you, father, said Isabella, in my hour of adversity, even as you yourself commanded when you promised your heart and your door should be open to my distress. But I fear, ha, said the solitary, then thou art Isabella Vere. Give me a token that thou art she. I have brought you back the rose which you gave me. It has not had time to fade ere the hard fate you foretold has come upon me. And if thou hast thus redeemed thy pledge, said the dwarf, I will not forfeit mine. The heart and the door that are shut against every other earthly being shall be open to thee and to thy sorrows. She heard him move in his hut and presently afterwards strike a light. One by one bolt and bar were then withdrawn the heart of Isabella throbbing higher as these obstacles to their meeting were successively removed. The door opened and the solitary stood before her, his uncouth form and features illuminated by the iron lamp which he held in his hand. Enter, daughter of affliction, he said, enter the house of misery. She entered and observed with a precaution which increased her trepidation that the recluse's first act after setting the lamp upon the table was to replace the numerous bolts which secured the door of his hut. She shrunk as she heard the noise which accompanied this ominous operation, yet remembered Ratcliffe's caution and endeavored to suppress all appearance of apprehension. The light of the lamp was weak and uncertain, but the solitary, without taking immediate notice of Isabella otherwise than by motioning her to sit down on a small settle beside the fireplace, made haste to kindle some dry furs, which presently cast a blaze through the cottage wooden shelves which bore a few books, some bundles of dried herbs, and one or two wooden cups and platters were on one side of the fire. On the other were placed some ordinary tools of field labor, mingled with those used by mechanics. Where the bed should have been, there was a wooden frame, strode with withered moss and rushes, the couch of the ascetic. The whole space of the cottage did not exceed ten feet by six within the walls and its only furniture besides what we have mentioned was a table and two stools formed of rough deals. Within these narrow precincts Isabella now found herself enclosed with a being whose history had nothing to reassure her, and the fearful confirmation of whose hideous countenance inspired an almost superstitious terror. He occupied the seat opposite to her, and dropping his huge and shaggy eyebrows over his piercing black eyes, gazed at her in silence as if agitated by a variety of contending feelings. On the other side sat Isabella, pale as death, her long hair uncurled by the evening damps and falling over her shoulders and breast, as the wet streamers droop from the mast when the storm has passed away and left the vessel stranded on the beach. The dwarf first broke the silence with the sudden, abrupt, and alarming question, Woman? What evil fate has brought thee hither? My father's danger in your own command, she replied faintly but firmly. 
"'And you hope for aid from me?' "'If you can bestow it,' she replied, still in the same tone of mild submission. "'And how should I possess that power?' continued the dwarf, with a bitter sneer. "'Is mine the form of a redresser of wrongs? "'Is this the castle in which one powerful enough to be sued to by a fair suppliant "'is likely to hold his residence? "'I but mock thee, girl, when I said I would relieve thee.' Then must I depart and face my fate as best I may. No, said the dwarf, rising and interposing between her and the door, and motioning to her sternly to resume her seat. No, you leave me not in this way. We must have farther conference. Why should one being desire aid of another? Why should not each be sufficient to itself? Look round you. I, the most despised and most decrepit on nature's common, have required sympathy and help from no one. These stones are of my own piling. These utensils I framed with my own hands. And with this, and he laid his hand with a fierce smile on the long dagger which he always wore beneath his garment, and unsheathed it so far that the blade glimmered clear in the firelight. With this, he pursued, as he thrust the weapon back into the scabbard, I can, if necessary, defend the vital spark enclosed in this poor trunk against the fairest and strongest that shall threaten me with injury. It was with difficulty Isabella refrained from screaming out aloud, but she did refrain. This, continued the recluse, is the life of nature, solitary, self-sufficing, and independent. The wolf calls not the wolf to aid him in forming his den, and the vulture invites not another to assist her in striking down her prey. And when they are unable to procure themselves support, said Isabella, judiciously thinking that he would be most accessible to argument couched in his own metaphorical style, what then is to befall them? Let them starve, die, and be forgotten. It is the common lot of humanity. It is the lot of the wild tribes of nature, said Isabella, but chiefly of those who are destined to support themselves by rapine, which brooks no partner. But it is not the law of nature in general. Even the lower orders have confederacies for mutual defense. But mankind, the race would perish did they cease to aid each other. From the time that the mother binds the child's head, till the moment that some kind assistant wipes the death damp from the brow of the dying, we cannot exist without mutual help. All therefore that need aid have right to ask it of their fellow mortals. No one who has the power of granting can refuse it without guilt. And in this simple hope, poor maiden, said the solitary, thou hast come into the desert, to seek one whose wish it were that the league thou hast spoken of were broken for ever, and that in very truth the whole race should perish. Wert thou not frightened? Misery, said Isabella firmly, is superior to fear. Hast thou not heard it said in thy mortal world that I have leagued myself with other powers, deformed to the eye and malevolent to the human race as myself? Hast thou not heard this, and dost thou seek my cell at midnight? The being I worship supports me against such idle fears, said Isabella, but the increasing agitation of her bosom belied the affected courage which her words expressed. Ho, ho, said the dwarf, thou vauntest thyself a philosopher. Yet shouldst thou not have thought of the danger of entrusting thyself, young and beautiful, in the power of one so spited against humanity? as to place his chief pleasure in defacing, destroying, and degrading her fairest works? Isabella, much alarmed, continued to answer with firmness, Whatever injuries you may have sustained in the world, you are incapable of revenging them on one who never wronged you, nor willfully any other. Ay, but maiden, he continued, his dark eyes flashing with an expression of malignity which communicated itself to his wild and distorted features, Revenge is the hungry wolf, which asks only to tear flesh and lap blood. Think you the lamb's plea of innocence would be listened to by him? Man, said Isabella, rising and expressing herself with much dignity, I fear not the horrible ideas with which you would impress me. I cast them from me with disdain. Be you mortal or fiend, you would not offer injury to one who sought you as a suppliant in her utmost need. You would not. You durst not. Thou sayest truly, maiden, rejoined the solitary, I dare not, I would not. Be gone to thy dwelling, fear nothing with which they threaten thee. Thou hast asked my protection, thou shalt find it effectual. But, father, 
This very night I have consented to wed the man that I abhor, where I must put the seal to my father's ruin. This night? At what hour? Ere midnight. And twilight, said the dwarf, has already passed away. But fear nothing, there is ample time to protect thee. And my father, continued Isabella in a suppliant tone, thy father, replied the dwarf, has been and is my most bitter enemy. But fear not, thy virtue shall save him. And now be gone, were I to keep thee longer by me, I might again fall into the stupid dreams concerning human worth from which I have been so fearfully awakened. But fear nothing, at the very foot of the altar I will redeem thee. Adieu, time presses and I must act. He led her to the door of the hut which he opened for her departure. She remounted her horse which had been feeding in the outer enclosure and pressed him forward by the light of the moon which was now rising to the spot where she had left Ratcliffe. Have you succeeded? was his first eager question. I have obtained promises from him to whom you sent me, but how can he possibly accomplish them? Thank God, said Ratcliffe, doubt not his power to fulfill his promise. At this moment a shrill whistle was heard to resound along the heath. Hark, said Ratcliffe, he calls me. Miss Vere, return home and leave unbolted the postern door of the garden. To that which opens on the back stairs I have a private key. A second whistle was heard, yet more shrill and prolonged than the first. I come, I come, said Ratcliffe, and setting spurs to his horse rode over the heath in the direction of the recluse's hut. Miss Vere returned to the castle, the metal of the animal on which she rode and her own anxiety of mind combining to accelerate her journey. She obeyed Ratcliffe's directions though without well apprehending their purpose, and leaving her horse at large in a paddock near the garden, hurried to her own apartment, which she reached without observation. She now unbolted her door and rang her bell for lights. Her father appeared along with the servant who answered her summons. He had been twice, he said, listening at her door during the two hours that had elapsed since he left her, and not hearing her speak had become apprehensive that she was taken ill. And now, my dear father, she said, permit me to claim the promise you so kindly gave. Let the last moments of freedom which I am to enjoy be mine without interruption, and protract to the last moment the respite which is allowed me. I will, said her father, nor shall you be again interrupted. But this disordered dress, this disheveled hair, do not let me find you thus when I call on you again. The sacrifice to be beneficial must be voluntary. Must it be so, she replied. Then fear not, my father, the victim shall be adorned. End of chapter 16. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 17 of The Black Dwarf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 17. This looks not like a nuptial. Much ado about nothing. The chapel in the castle of Ellislaw, destined to be the scene of this ill-omened union, was a building of much older date than the castle itself, though that claimed considerable antiquity. Before the wars between England and Scotland had become so common and of such long duration that the buildings along both sides of the border were chiefly dedicated to warlike purposes, there had been a small settlement of monks at Ellislaw, a dependency, it is believed, by antiquaries, on the rich abbey of Jedburgh. Their possessions had long passed away under the changes introduced by war and mutual ravage. A feudal castle had arisen on the ruin of their cells, and their chapel was included in its precincts. The edifice, in its round arches and massive pillars, the simplicity of which referred their date to what has been called the Saxon architecture, presented at all times a dark and sombre appearance, and had been frequently used as the cemetery of the family of the feudal lords, as well as formerly of the monastic brethren. But it looked doubly gloomy by the effect of the few and smoky torches which were used to enlighten it on the present occasion, and which, spreading a glare of yellow light in their immediate vicinity, were surrounded beyond by a red and purple halo reflected from their own smoke and beyond that again by a zone of darkness which magnified the extent of the chapel, while it rendered it impossible for the eye to ascertain its limits. Some injudicious ornaments adopted in haste for the occasion rather added to the dreariness of the scene. 
old fragments of tapestry torn from the walls of other apartments had been hastily and partially disposed around those of the chapel and mingled inconsistently with scutcheons and funeral emblems of the dead which they elsewhere exhibited on each side of the stone altar was a monument the appearance of which formed an equally strange contrast on the one was the figure in stone of some grim hermit or monk who had died in the odor of sanctity he was represented as recumbent in his cowl and scapulaire with his face turned towards as in the act of devotion and his hands folded from which his string of beads was dependent on the other side was a tomb in the italian taste composed of the most beautiful statuary marble and accounted a model of modern art it was erected to the memory of isabella's mother the late mrs vera of ellislaw who was represented as in a dying posture while a weeping cherub with eyes averted seeming in the act of extinguishing a dying lamp as emblematic of her speedy dissolution it was indeed a masterpiece of art but misplaced in the rude vault to which it had been consigned many were surprised and even scandalized that ellislaw not remarkable for attention to his lady while alive should erect after her death such a costly mausoleum in affected sorrow others cleared him from the imputation of hypocrisy and averred that the monument had been constructed under the direction and at the sole expense of mr ratcliffe before these monuments the wedding guests were assembled they were few in number for many had left the castle to prepare for the ensuing political explosion and ellislaw was in the circumstances of the case far from being desirous to extend invitations farther than to those near relations whose presence the custom of the country rendered indispensable next to the altar stood sir frederick langley dark moody and thoughtful even beyond his wont and near him marischal who was to play the part of bridesman as it was called the thoughtless humour of this young gentleman on which he never deigned to place the least restraint added to the cloud which overhung the brow of the bridegroom the bride is not yet come out of her chamber he whispered to sir frederick i trust that we must not have recourse to the violent expedients of the romans which i read of at college it would be hard upon my pretty cousin to be run away with twice in two days though i know none better worth such a violent compliment sir frederick attempted to turn a deaf ear to this discourse humming a tune and looking another way but Marischal proceeded in the same wild manner. This delay is hard upon Dr. Hobbler, who was disturbed to accelerate preparations for this joyful event when he had successfully extracted the cork of his third bottle. I hope you will keep him free of the censure of his superiors, for I take it this is beyond canonical hours, but here come Ellislaw and my pretty cousin, prettier than ever, I think, were it not she seemed so faint and so deadly pale. Hark ye, Sir Knight, if she says not yes with right good will it shall be no wedding for all that has come and gone yet no wedding sir returned sir frederick in a loud whisper the tone of which indicated that his angry feelings were suppressed with difficulty no no marriage replied marischal there's my hand and glove on't sir frederick langley took his hand and as he wrung it hard said in a lower whisper marischal you shall answer this and then flung his hand from him that i will readily do said marischal for never word escaped my lips that my hand was not ready to guarantee so speak up my pretty cousin and tell me if it be your free will and unbiased resolution to accept of this gallant knight for your lord and husband for if you have the tenth part of a scruple upon the subject fall back fall edge he shall not have you are you mad mr marischal said ellislaw who having been this young man's guardian during his minority often employed a tone of authority to him do you suppose i would drag my daughter to the foot of the altar were it not her own choice tut ellislaw retorted the young gentleman never tell me of the contrary her eyes are full of tears and her cheeks are whiter than her white dress i must insist in the name of common humanity that the ceremony be adjourned till to-morrow she shall tell you herself thou incorrigible intermeddler in what concerns thee not that it is her wish that the ceremony should go on is it not isabella my dear it is said isabella half fainting since there is no help either in god or man the first word alone was distinctly audible marischal shrugged up his shoulders and stepped back ellislaw led or rather supported his daughter to the altar 
Sir Frederick moved forward and placed himself by her side. The clergyman opened his prayer book and looked to Mr. Vere for the signal to commence the service. Proceed, said the latter. But a voice, as if issuing from the tomb of his deceased wife, called in such loud and harsh accents as awakened every echo in the vaulted chapel. Forbear! All were mute and motionless, till a distant rustle in the clash of swords, or something resembling it, was heard from the remote apartments. It ceased almost instantly. What new device is this? said Sir Frederick fiercely, eyeing Ellislaw and Marischal with a glance of malignant suspicion. It can be but the frolic of some intemperate guest, said Ellislaw, though greatly confounded. We must make large allowances for the excess of this evening's festivity. Proceed with the service. Before the clergyman could obey, the same prohibition which they had before heard was repeated from the same spot. The female attendants screamed and fled from the chapel. The gentlemen laid their hands on their swords. Ere the first moment of surprise had passed by, the dwarf stepped from behind the monument and placed himself full in front of Mr. Vere. The effect of so strange and hideous an apparition in such a place and in such circumstances appalled all present, but seemed to annihilate the laird of Ellislaw, who, dropping his daughter's arm, staggered against the nearest pillar, and clasping it with his hands as if for support, laid his brow against the column. Who is this fellow, said Sir Frederick, and what does he mean by this intrusion? It is one who comes to tell you, said the dwarf, with the peculiar acrimony which usually marked his manner, that in marrying that young lady you wed neither the heiress of Ellislaw, nor of Molly Hall, nor of Pulverden, nor of one furrow of land, unless she marries with my consent. And to thee that consent shall never be given. Down! Down on thy knees, and thank heaven that thou art prevented from wedding qualities with which thou hast no concern. Portionless truth, virtue, and innocence, thou base ingrate, he continued, addressing himself to Ellislaw. What is thy wretched subterfuge now? Thou who wouldst sell thy daughter to relieve thee from danger is in famine thou wouldst have slain and devoured her to preserve thine own vile life. I. Hide thy face with thy hands. Well mayest thou blush to look on him whose body thou didst consign to chains, his hand to guilt, and his soul to misery. Saved once more by the virtue of her who calls thee father, go hence, and may the pardon and benefits I confer on thee prove literal coals of fire, till thy brain is seared and scorched like mine. Ellislaw left the chapel with a gesture of mute despair. Follow him, Hubert Radcliffe, said the dwarf, and inform him of his destiny. He will rejoice, for to breathe air and to handle gold is to him happiness. I understand nothing of all this, said Sir Frederick Langley, but we are here a body of gentlemen in arms and authority for King James. And whether you really, sir, be that Sir Edward Molly, who has been so long supposed dead in confinement, or whether you be an impostor assuming his name and title, we will use the freedom of detaining you till your appearance here at this moment is better accounted for. We will have no spies among us. Seize on him, my friends. But the domestic shrunk back in doubt and alarm. Sir Frederick himself stepped forwards toward the recluse as if to lay hands on his person, when his progress was suddenly stopped by the glittering point of a partisan, which the sturdy hand of Hobby Elliot presented against his bosom. I'll gar daylight shine through ye if ye offer to steer him, said the stout borderer. Stand back, or I'll strike ye through. Naybody shall lay a finger on Elshie. He's a canny neighborly man, aye, ready to make a friend help. And though ye may think him a lameter, yet grippy for grippy, friend, I'll wad a weather he'll make the blood spin fray under your nails. He's a tooth carl, Elshie. He grips like a smith's vice. What has brought you here, Elliot? said Marischal, who called on you for interference. Troth, Marischal Wells, answered Hobby, I am just come here with twenty or thirty Maras in my ain name and the king's, or queen's, ca they her, and canny Elshie's into the bargain to keep the peace and pay back some ill usage Ellislaw has gained me. A bonny breakfast the loons gave me the other morning, and him at the bottom on't, and tro ye I was not ready to supper him up, you need not lay your hands on your swords, gentlemen. The house is ours with little din, for the doors were open, and there had been o'er muckle punch among your folk. We took their swords and pistols as easy as ye wad shield peacods. 
Marischal rushed out and immediately re-entered the chapel. By heaven, it is true, Sir Frederick. The house is filled with armed men, and our drunken beasts are all disarmed. Draw, and let us fight our way. Ben Arash, Ben Arash, exclaimed Hobby. Hear me a bit, hear me a bit. We mean ye nay harm, but as ye are in arms for King James, as ye call him, and the prelates, we thought it right to keep up the old neighborhood war and stand up for t'other ain in the kirk, but we'll no hurt a hair of your heads if ye like to gang hame quietly. And it will be your best way, for their sure news came from London that him they call Bang or Bing or what is't has banged the French ships and the new king aft the coast. However, say ye had best bide content we old nonce for want of a better queen. Ratcliffe, who at this moment entered, confirmed these accounts so unfavorably to the Jacobite interest. Sir Frederick almost instantly, and without taking leave of any one, left the castle with such of his attendants as were able to follow him. "'And what will you do, Mr. Marischal? said Radcliffe. "'Why, Faith,' answered he, smiling, "'I hardly know. My spirit is too great and my fortune too small for me to follow the example of the doughty bridegroom. It is not in my nature, and it is hardly worth my while.' Well, then, disperse your men and remain quiet, and this will be overlooked, as there has been no overt act. Hoot I, said Elliot. Just let bygains be bygains and a friends again. Deal ain I bear malice at but Westburnflat, and I had gien him baith a het skin and a caldane. I had not charged three blows of the broadsword wi' him before he lapped the window into the castle moat, and swattered through it like a wild duck. He's a clever fellow indeed. Mon kilt away with thy bonny lass in the morning, and another at night, lest wadna serve him. But if he disna kilt himself out of the country, I's kilt him with a toe, for the Castleton meeting's clean blawn o'er. His friends will no countenance him. During the general confusion, Isabella had thrown herself at the feet of her kinsman, Sir Edward Molly, for so we must now call the solitary, to express at once her gratitude and to beseech forgiveness for her father. The eyes of all began to be fixed on them as soon as their own agitation and the bustle of the attendants had somewhat abated. Miss Vere kneeled beside the tomb of her mother, to whose statue her features exhibited a marked resemblance. She held the hand of the dwarf, which she kissed repeatedly and bathed with tears. He stood, fixed and motionless, excepting that his eyes glanced alternately on the marble figure and the living suppliant. At length the large drops which gathered on his eyelashes compelled him to draw his hand across them. I thought, he said, that tears and I had done, but we shed them at our birth, and their spring dries not until we are in our graves. But no melting of the heart shall dissolve my resolution. I part here at once and forever with all of which the memory, looking to the tomb, or the presence, he pressed Isabella's hand, is dear to me. Speak not to me. Attempt not to thwart my determination. It will avail nothing. You will hear of and see this lump of deformity no more. To you I shall be dead ere I am actually in my grave, and you will think of me as of a friend disencumbered from the toils and crimes of existence. He kissed Isabella on the forehead, impressed another kiss on the brow of the statue by which she knelt, and left the chapel, followed by Ratcliffe. Isabella, almost exhausted by the emotions of the day, was carried to her apartment by her women. Most of the other guests dispersed after having separately endeavored to impress on all who would listen to them their disapprobation of the plots formed against the government, or their regret for having engaged in them. Hobby Elliot assumed the command of the castle for the night and mounted a regular guard. He boasted not a little of the alacrity with which his friends and he had obeyed a hasty summons received from Elshie through the faithful Ratcliffe. And it was a lucky chance, he said, that on the very day they had gotten notice that Westburnflat did not intend to keep his tryst at Castleton, but to hold them at defiance, so that a considerable party had assembled at the Hughfoot with the intention of paying a visit to the robber's tower on the ensuing morning and their course was easily directed to Ellislaw Castle. End of chapter 17 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 18 of The Black Dwarf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott Chapter 18 Last scene of all to close this strange, eventful history. As you like it. On the next morning Mr. Ratcliffe presented Miss Vere with a letter from her father, of which the following is the tenor. My dearest child, the malice of a persecuting government will compel me for my own safety to retreat abroad and to remain for some time in foreign parts. I do not ask you to accompany or follow me. You will attend to my interest in your own more effectually by remaining where you are. It is unnecessary to enter into a minute detail concerning the causes of the strange events which yesterday took place. I think I have reason to complain of the usage I have received from Sir Edward Mauley, who is your nearest kinsman by the mother's side. But as he has declared you his heir, and is to put you in immediate possession of a large part of his fortune, I account it a full atonement. I am aware he has never forgiven the preference which your mother gave to my addresses, instead of complying with the terms of a sort of family compact which absurdly and tyrannically destined her to wed her deformed relative. The shock was even sufficient to unsettle his wits, which indeed were never over well arranged, and I had, as the husband of his nearest kinswoman and heir, the delicate task of taking care of his person and property, until he was reinstated in the management of the latter by those who, no doubt, thought they were doing him justice although if some parts of his subsequent conduct be examined, it will appear that he ought, for his own sake, to have been left under the influence of a mild and salutary restraint. In one particular, however, he showed a sense of the ties of blood, as well as of his own frailty. For while he sequestered himself closely from the world, under various names and disguises, and insisted on spreading a report of his own death, in which to gratify him I willingly acquiesced, he left at my disposal the rents of a great proportion of his estates, and especially all those which, having belonged to your mother, reverted to him as a male fief. In this he may have thought that he was acting with extreme generosity, while, in the opinion of all impartial men, he will only be considered as having fulfilled a natural obligation, seeing that, in justice if not in strict law, you must be considered as the heir of your mother, and I as your legal administrator. Instead, therefore, of considering myself as loaded with obligations to Sir Edward on this account, I think I had reason to complain that these remittances were only doled out to me at the pleasure of Mr. Ratcliffe, who, moreover, exacted from me mortgages over my paternal estate of Ellislaw for any sums which I required as an extra advance, and thus may be said to have insinuated himself into the absolute management and control of my property. Or, if all this seeming friendship was employed by Sir Edward for the purpose of obtaining a complete command of my affairs, and acquiring the power of ruining me at his pleasure, I feel myself, I must repeat, still less bound by the alleged obligation. About the autumn of last year, as I understand, either his own crazed imagination or the accomplishment of some such scheme as I have hinted, brought him down to this country. His alleged motive, it seems, was a desire of seeing a monument which he had directed to be raised in the chapel over the tomb of your mother. Mr. Ratcliffe, who at this time had done me the honor to make my house his own, had the complacence to introduce him secretly into the chapel. The consequence, as he informs me, was a frenzy of several hours, during which he fled into the neighboring moors in one of the wildest spots of which he chose, when he was somewhat recovered, to fix his mansion, and set up for a sort of country empiric, a character which, even in his best days, he was fond of assuming. It is remarkable that instead of informing me of these circumstances that I might have had the relative of my late wife taken care of as his calamitous condition required, Mr. Ratcliffe seems to have had such culpable indulgence for his irregular plans as to promise and even swear secrecy concerning them. He visited Sir Edward often and assisted in the fantastic task he had taken upon him of constructing a hermitage. Nothing they appear to have dreaded more than a discovery of their intercourse. The ground was open in every direction around, and a small subterranean cave, probably sepulchral, which their researches had detected near the great granite pillar, served to conceal Ratcliffe when any one approached his master. I think you will be of opinion, my love, that this secrecy must have some strong motive. 
It is also remarkable that while I thought my unhappy friend was residing among the monks of La Trappe, he should have been actually living for many months in this bizarre disguise within five miles of my house, and obtaining regular information of my most private movements either by Ratcliffe or through Westburn Flat or others, whom he had the means to bribe to any extent. He makes it a crime against me that I endeavored to establish your marriage with Sir Frederick. I acted for the best. But if Sir Edward Molly thought otherwise, why did he not step manfully forward, express his own purpose of becoming a party to the settlements, and take that interest which he is entitled to claim in you as heir to his great property? Even now, though, your rash and eccentric relation is somewhat tardy in announcing his purpose, I am far from opposing my authority against his wishes, although the person he desires you to regard as your future husband be young Earnscliffe the very last whom I should have thought likely to be acceptable to him, considering a certain fatal event. But I give my free and hearty consent, providing the settlements are drawn in such an irrevocable form, as may secure my child from suffering by that state of dependence, and that sudden and causeless revocation of allowances, of which I have so much reason to complain. Of Sir Frederick Langley, I augur, you will hear no more. He is not likely to claim the hand of a dowerless maiden. I therefore commit you, my dear Isabella, to the wisdom of providence and to your own prudence, begging you to lose no time in securing those advantages which the fickleness of your kinsman has withdrawn from me to shower upon you. Mr. Radcliffe mentions Sir Edward's intention to settle a considerable sum upon me yearly for my maintenance in foreign parts, but this my heart is too proud to accept from him. I told him I had a dear child who, while in affluence herself, would never suffer me to be in poverty. I thought it right to intimate this to him pretty roundly, that whatever increase be settled upon you it may be calculated so as to cover this necessary and natural encumbrance. I shall willingly settle upon you the castle and manor of Ellislaw to show my parental affection, and disinterested zeal for promoting your settlement in life. The annual interest of debts charged on the estate somewhat exceeds the income, even after a reasonable rent has been put upon the mansion and mains. But as all the debts are in the person of Mr. Ratcliffe, as your kinsman's trustee, he will not be a troublesome creditor. And here I must make you aware that though I have to complain of Mr. Ratcliffe's conduct to me personally, I nevertheless believe him a just and upright man with whom you may safely consult on your affairs, not to mention that to cherish his good opinion will be the best way to retain that of your kinsman. Remember me to Marchi. I hope he will not be troubled on account of late matters. I will write more fully from the continent. Meanwhile, I rest, your loving father, Richard Vere. The above letter throws the only additional light which we have been able to procure upon the earlier part of our story. It was Hobby's opinion, and maybe that of most of our readers, that the recluse of Mucklestane Moor had but a kind of gleaming or twilight understanding, and that he had neither very clear views as to what he himself wanted, nor was apt to pursue his ends by the clearest and most direct means so that to seek the clue of his conduct was likened by Hobby to looking for a straight path through a common, over which there are a hundred devious tracks but not one distinct line of road. When Isabella had perused the letter, her first inquiry was after her father. He had left the castle, she was informed, early in the morning after a long interview with Mr. Ratcliffe, and was already far on his way to the next port, where he might expect to find shipping for the continent. Where was Sir Edward Mauley? No one had seen the dwarf since the eventful scene of the preceding evening. Odd, if anything had befallen poor Elsie, said Hobby Elliot. I would rather I were harried o'er again. He immediately rode to his dwelling, and the remaining she-goat came bleeding to meet him, for her milking time was long past. The solitary was nowhere to be seen. His door, contrary to want, was open, his fire extinguished and the whole hut was left in the state which it exhibited on Isabella's visit to him. It was pretty clear that the means of conveyance which had brought the dwarf to Ellislaw on the preceding evening had removed him from it to some other place of abode. Hobby returned disconsolate to the castle. I am doubting we have lost Canny Elshie for good, and a— uh, You have indeed, said Ratcliffe, producing a paper which he put into Hobby's hands. But read that, and you will perceive you have been no loser by having known him. It was a short deed of gift, by which Sir Edward Molly, otherwise called Elshinder the Recluse, endowed Halbert, or Hobby Elliot, 
and Grace Armstrong in full property with a considerable sum borrowed by Elliot from him. Hobby's joy was mingled with feelings which brought tears down his rough cheeks. It's a queer thing, he said, but I cannot joy in the gear unless I ken the poor body was happy that gave it to me. Next to enjoying happiness ourselves, said Ratcliffe, is the consciousness of having bestowed it on others. Had all my master's benefits been conferred like the present, what a different return would they have produced? But the indiscriminate profusion that would glut avarice or supply prodigality neither does good nor is rewarded by gratitude. It is sowing the wind to reap the whirlwind. And that would be a light harsh, said Hobby. But with my young lady's leave, I would fain take down Elsie's skeps of bees and set them in Grace's bit flower yard at the Hewfoot. They shall ne'er be smeeket by ony o whose. And the poor goat, she would be neglected about a great town like this, and she could feed bonnily on our lily lee by the burnside, and the hounds would kin her in a day's time and never fash her, and Grace would milk her ilka mornin' wi' her ain hand, for Elsie's sake. For though he was thrawn and cankered in his converse, he like it dumb creature's weal. Hobby's requests were readily granted, not without some wonder at the natural delicacy of feeling which pointed out to him this mode of displaying his gratitude. He was delighted when Ratcliffe informed him that his benefactor should not remain ignorant of the care which he took of his favorite. And mine be sure and tell him that Granny and the Tiddies, and Abuna, Grace, and meself are weal and thriving, and that it's a his doing that cannot but please him, mine would think. And Elliot at the family at Hewfoot were and continued to be as fortunate and happy as his undaunted honesty, tenderness, and gallantry so well merited. All bar between the marriage of Earnscliff and Isabella was now removed, and the settlements which Ratcliffe produced on the part of Sir Edward Molly might have satisfied the cupidity of Ellislaw himself. But Miss Vere and Radcliffe thought it unnecessary to mention to Earnscliffe that one great motive of Sir Edward in thus loading the young pair with benefits was to expiate his having, many years before, shed the blood of his father in a hasty brawl. If it be true, as Ratcliffe asserted, that the dwarf's extreme misanthropy seemed to relax somewhat under the consciousness of having diffused happiness among so many, the recollection of this circumstance might probably be one of his chief motives for refusing obstinately ever to witness their state of contentment. Marischal hunted, shot, and drank claret. Tired of the country, went abroad, served three campaigns, came home, and married Lucy Ilderton. Years fled over the heads of Earnscliff and his wife, and found and left them contented and happy. The scheming ambition of Sir Frederick Langley engaged him in the unfortunate insurrection of 1715. He was made prisoner at Preston in Lancashire with the Earl of Derwentwater and others. His defense and the dying speech which he made at his execution may be found in the state trials. Mr. Vere, supplied by his daughter with an ample income, continued to reside abroad, engaged deeply in the affair of Law's Bank during the regency of the Duke of Orléans, and was at one time supposed to be immensely rich. But on the bursting of that famous bubble, he was so much chagrined at being again reduced to a moderate annuity, although he saw thousands of his companions in misfortune absolutely starving, that vexation of mind brought on a paralytic stroke, of which he died after lingering under its effects a few weeks. Willie of Westburn Flat fled from the wrath of Hobby Elliot as his betters did from the pursuit of the law. His patriotism urged him to serve his country abroad, while his reluctance to leave his native soil pressed him rather to remain in the beloved island and collect purses, watches, and rings on the high roads at home. Fortunately for him the first impulse prevailed, and he joined the army under Marlborough obtained a commission to which he was recommended by his services in collecting cattle for the commissariat, returned home after many years with some money, how come by heaven only knows, demolished the peel house at Westburn Flat and built in its stead a high narrow onstead of three stories, with a chimney at each end, drank brandy with the neighbors whom in his younger days he had plundered, died in his bed and is recorded upon his tombstone at Kirkwhistle, still extant, as having played all the parts of a brave soldier, a discreet neighbor, and a sincere Christian. Mr. Ratcliffe resided usually with the family at Ellislaw, but regularly every spring and autumn he absented himself for about a month. 
On the direction and purpose of his periodical journey he remained steadily silent, but it was well understood that he was then in attendance on his unfortunate patron. At length on his return from one of these visits his grave countenance and deep mourning dress announced to the Ellislaw family that their benefactor was no more. Sir Edward's death made no addition to their fortune, for he had divested himself of his property during his lifetime, and chiefly in their favor. Ratcliffe, his sole confidant, died at a good old age, but without ever naming the place to which his master had finally retired, or the manner of his death, or the place of his burial. It was supposed that on all these particulars his patron had enjoined him strict secrecy. The sudden disappearance of Elshie from his extraordinary hermitage corroborated the reports which the common people had spread concerning him. Many believed that having ventured to enter a consecrated building contrary to his paction with the evil one, he had been bodily carried off while on his return to his cottage. But most are of opinion that he only disappeared for a season, and continues to be seen from time to time among the hills and retaining according to custom a more vivid recollection of his wild and desperate language than of the benevolent tendency of most of his actions he is usually identified with the malignant demon called the man of the moor whose feats were quoted by mrs elliot to her grandsons and accordingly is generally represented as bewitching the sheep causing the ewes to keb that is to cast their lambs or seen loosening the impending wreath of snow to precipitate its weight on such as take shelter during the storm beneath the bank of a torrent or under the shelter of a deep glen in short the evils most dreaded and deprecated by the inhabitants of that pastoral country are ascribed to the agency of the black dwarf end of chapter eighteen recording by philip gould end of the black dwarf by sir walter scott